Hello and welcome everybody to the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals. I'm your host, Doe, and with me to start off this amazing day two, six match day, are none other than Nagura Tettles and Zyronic. We made it through day one. It seemed very short, but today will not be that way. We got upper bracket, we got lower bracket matches, teams are getting eliminated. It's going to be an exciting day, isn't it, Nagura? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the first game already is going to be exciting, and yeah, lots of elimination games. And to be honest, coming into this global final, all of the teams are just really, really good, right? So uh, mm. I don't know who's going to get elim eliminated, and I do think there's going to be some upsets for sure, especially uh, after we've seen yesterday, some teams yeah. really performed uh, better than what we expected. For example, Baldi uh, unexpectedly going to the lower bracket, and Monka performing so well, uh, even performing better than Perplex, which we thought were also our favorites to win the whole tournament. Yeah, it seems wide open right now, uh, doesn't it, uh, Zyronic? Yeah, I mean, we've seen great performances across the board. Both of our upper bracket matches should be absolute bangers. This Echo Perplex matchup is something that we haven't mm -hmm. seen in a very, very long time. Both of these teams were at the top of our ladder almost every single week back in BFA when the teams would play week in and week out. So that's going to be a great one to see, especially for Perplex, since they went out so early last time around we had a Global Finals. Notice Despair, like Nagura mentioned, just barely able to make it past Baldi in a great series against Monka, who looks amazing too. So both of these upper bracket matches are looking out to be insane matches today. Yeah, we've got our lower bracket matches as well uh, with Sloth versus Long Ming, Baldi versus Wilmegalol. Those are also elimination matches, of course, because it's the lower bracket. Uh, Tettles, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Who's making it out between Baldi and Wilmegalol? I feel like that one's a little bit tough to oh. call. Oh, goodness. That 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 is a matchup <laughs> that... So, well, Megalol came through our last stand tournament. So, so it's like the expectation for them is that they're going to probably be like the worst team in across this weekend. But with how they looked versus Monka yesterday, like they, they looked a lot more consistent than they did in cup play. So I don't necessarily even know what to think about well, Megalol. I, I would probably hmm. say that it's Baldi favored, but I do think that there is an intense amount of upside oh. for well, Megalol. If I was well, having to go. put numbers on it, I think that this actually feels pretty fair. 60-40 uh, in favor yep. of Baldi. That seems about right. Yeah. Does ironic sound like you had something to add? Yeah, I think this is exactly where I'd put it. I'd say it's a little above slight favor to Baldi. They definitely looked a little stronger yesterday. And it's not to say, well, Mega Lull looked bad. They just didn't look like they were a team that was competing at the very top of their range. Now, they definitely could step it up a little bit. They've got plenty of veteran players on their team. But I do think Baldi's a little bit favored. It always seems like when Megalol, uh, you know, and the thing is, props to them, because they made it through the last stand tournament, and that was like mm -hmm. a gauntlet, right? That was very difficult to make it through. I feel like they're the team that has the highest highs, but also the lowest lows in the uh, in in this bracket, as far as our, the, the sort of like inconsistency, I guess, is the thing. Where they can play extremely well, they can have very good, clean maps, but then they can also have things go wrong a little bit uh, once in a while, and when things go wrong, they go very wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, yeah. our other... Oh, go ahead. Their times in their strategies versus Monka yesterday looked uh, like they were going to be relatively competitive. They did end up having just like one issue in like Aspires of Ascension, but overall, like like you were saying, I, I think that Wilmegalol's just strategies coming into this weekend looked very refined, and they looked a lot more consistent than I expected them to be coming into the weekend. 
Yeah. And then Sloth versus Long Ming is our other uh, elimination match. Long Ming uh, looking a little bit outclassed versus Perplexed. Unfortunately for them, uh, I think it's not going to get any easier against Sloth, who looked pretty good against Echo, honestly, in that first match of yesterday. So they might be headed for an early exit, but you never know. Let's check out the uh, pickups for that wow. as well. Sloth, uh, considerably higher, and I, I think that this seems about appropriate. Would you agree? I would have put it higher for Sloth, to be honest. Sloth is a team that's looked great. Oh. They've been able to put together great runs, but... Maybe I'm undervaluing Longming. I mean, they looked a lot better yesterday than they did in the actual Asia bracket that we watched on stream a couple, about a month ago. Yeah. So, I, you know what? This isn't too far off, I guess. I, I personally would probably put it like 75 sloth, but, you know, All right. this, is, this is not bad. Only 10%. But uh, let's take a look at uh, some of our brackets overall, so, or at least some percentages oh. with it. So, there are still 20.5% of the brackets that were made are almost perfect. So what that means is that they got the match results right, but they didn't necessarily get like a 2-1 correct over a 2-0, that kind of thing, you know? So they picked the right team to win, but they didn't uh, pick the right uh, individual game result. And then we've got our perfect brackets, and so these are the absolutely flawless brackets. Uh, I am not among this. 2.87%, <laughs> not a whole lot of players out there. I don't think any of us have a perfect bracket yet, do we? No, no, no. Close, but that's about it. Uh, I was I was one game off. I I, uh, I think the Monka versus did you say, did you say two is, I think I yeah. said two one or something. Oh, uh, why why do they got to do oh, me yeah. like that? Echo, please. <laughs> why is Cyro third and I'm fourth? Oh, um, <laughs> that's a good. Yeah, that's a bias. Good uh, I don't know. Alphabetical field, order. Uh, <laughs> home field advantage, maybe. Probably. It's not even an alphabet thing because N. There, is first. Maybe there's a tiebreaker. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> it's actually so frustrating. I think I'd be 12 points if uh, if Baldi had taken that series 2-1. Man. Yeah, I think oh, the, wow. the Baldi series threw off most of the people, right? Yeah. That's why only 20% yeah. uh, have a perfect... Uh, I assume so, right? Because all of the other results are pretty... Nor or standard, or people assumed mm -hmm. that they would win. Well, I mean, this is what uh, Zyronic was just talking about, oh, yeah, right? Where go. it's like, uh, yeah, there I think a lot of us had uh, had Baldi winning that one, but no Donuts and Despair coming back after losing the first map and winning two in a row, including that very surprising uh, HOA. Like, that was a, that was a shocking oh. map, but uh, they took advantage yeah. of it. You know, the Halls of Atonement, in the end, uh, it was the uh, cigar fight for um, oh, Baldi wow. that went poorly and Donuts and Despair <laughs> taking advantage huh. of it. All right, uh, so, I mean, I don't... yeah, sure. This is, it is what it is. Keep in mind, though, that these pickups are happening on Echo's website, so that's going yeah. to probably affect things a little bit, you know? So, I, would definitely uh, I, I will say, say that. Yeah, I would definitely say, realistically, it's not as one-sided, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, it's apparently Echo-sided, but... Apparently there was a tweet from now that... Uh, that may be occurring in this series, so maybe, maybe the believers... And have it at 98 percent or uh a little maybe they were in the know uh-huh hmm. sometimes All right. a new tech uh, might not actually be more efficient or work out right like sometimes sure. people come up with new strategies and True. then it looks really cool but it might not actually be faster so we'll see you i feel like theater of pain is the dungeon we've been seeing the most kind of uh crazy shenanigans on it seems like the dungeon that has the most opportunity for that kind of thing you know yeah. yeah, I mean, we were all kind of surprised. Well, not necessarily surprised, but a little disappointed that none of the teams adapted that Theater of Pain route that Sloth innovated during the during the mm -hmm. season. If there ever was a team that was going to take that strategy and like make it their own and maybe even make it a little better, it would be Echo. So if we do get to see them play Theater of Pain, that, that is pretty exciting. Well, we didn't get to see any Theater of Pain yesterday because it just wasn't in the map list, but I got some good news for you today. It is going to be uh, the first map in our first series. Well, we, you know, right. we might talk about that a bit more in depth later, but we will see some Theater of Pain, so don't don't worry about it. Forbidden Tat would be good. Yeah, there you go. In All fact, right. uh, oh, they're the bands, so. too. I definitely yeah, exactly. That. Can't ban the first one, so we will be going to that uh, Bursting Storming Theater of Pain on Fortified, plus 22, so not the highest key level, but top can still get crazy uh echo bans out gambit which is interesting because we saw them absolutely crush that yesterday against sloth and then perplex will ban the other side all right yeah we saw think... four teams play gambit yesterday and echo had the fastest run out of all of them so it is interesting they're banning gambit hmm. that is that is uh that's something that i was interested in is like why why do they specifically pick gambit I think that that Necrotic Wake is probably the dungeon that 
is the most scary, at least for me, with it being on a 25, with it also being fortified and inspiring. Like, that, that seems for like sure. a dungeon that is super volatile, where you could probably just, like, coin flip that dungeon and just have a catastrophic wipe where Gambit... Sure, it is Sanguine, and there, there can be issues of, like, Sanguine healing that uh, maybe you don't want to take... Like, you don't want to wager that. I, I feel like I would have personally banned the Wake, but... There, there's the reason that Echo is the favorite coming into this weekend. I mean, they are the back-to-back-to-back-to-back MDI champions. <laughs> they have uh, been pretty good for a long time, and uh, so it's going to be a mountainous effort. Is that a real a mountainous effort? It's going to be a mountain to climb for anyone to uh, to take them on. Uh, you know, they what they haven't they haven't lost since 2019. Is that right? Do I have that right? <laughs> yeah, I think I do. Yeah, that checks out. Yeah, well, so there you go. Echo's a pretty pretty good team. Pretty good team. Uh, we'll see what Perplex can do. I think the, what we're looking for today is a little bit more clean runs from them, less deaths, but it looks like we're underway. Echo versus Perplex. Let's see what we got here on Theater of Pain. All right, so there we go. They are both uh, looking like they're pulling all of the trash into that first boss room. It is only at 24, at 22, which is a lower a key level for the MDI key levels that we have in the global finals. And it looks like both of the teams also do commit that bloodlust. When we look at the comps, nothing really special. Just running that standard comp with the Dastro Warlock, Windwalker, and Hunter. And uh, yeah, let's see who finishes off this boss quicker. Because, uh, yeah, it's really just about the damage you can execute this quicker, considering that they did the exact same pull. And we kind of hinted at this a little bit before they started the dungeon here, but Echo's been spreading whispers around about some tech that they've figured out in this dungeon here. The, the really, All we really know about this tech is that we're pretty sure it happens in the Coltharok wing, but we don't exactly know what it is. So, I mean, we really got to be focusing... Wait, hold on. I'm looking at, at Fragments' character. Is that... Hold on. That's a panda. That definitely does look Why like a panda. a panda. You can also see it on the racials at the top as well on the group frame. You can see the, the racial abilities. You can see Salia, Clix, and Jinji are all dwarfs, while Perplex has five dwarfs. Echo only has three. And now and Fragments, they are playing Pandaren. Huh. Well, we're going to the Coltharok wing first here. Not to mention, by the way, I could kill the first boss about 11 seconds faster, which is already yes. pretty nice. But let's get into this first section of the Coltharok wing, not splitting up these Shackled Souls at all. Every single Shackled Soul pulled in. Are they also going to pull in that mini boss as well? Yes, the Portal Guardian is with them as well. Going to get some AoE Blitz down here. Going to focus on the damage during the Soul Storm here. There's going to be a lot of damage going out, especially on Jinji, since he has that Shadow Damage taken increased curse on him right now. They have no way of removing that, so they just got to heal through it. Of course, Hunter doesn't have great personals, so we're going to be focused on Visalia, but not too big of a deal. Notably, going for the Woe Drifter buff here, so they're going to have a lot of extra movement speed here. Let's see what they're planning on doing with that. Yeah, Perplex actually finished off the Woe Drifter on the first boss pool and skipped all the Shackled Souls with that because it killed the boss so quickly they still had the buff. But yeah, Echo using that Woe Drifter now to get to that second platform. Looks like uh, what? Clicks, Clicks is going? jumping off. Uh... And... There we go. <laughs> Clicks actually dropped He's alive. He's alive. Low. He's alive. <laughs> what? Did manage to survive, though, as they completely just skipped all the way ahead to this third platform. And this must be the reason why they're playing those Pandaren, okay. right? Having that uh, fall damage reduction and just barely managed to surviving here without having to use those portals. Because you can see, look at Perplex. They have to use those gateways, those portals, and it takes quite a while for them to move to this platform. So Echo just uh, saving a lot of time by just jumping off with that Woe Drifter buff and that fall damage reduction. Okay, so we actually were, were, we were trying to figure out what they were planning on doing here yesterday, and we couldn't figure out exactly what it was because when we tried to jump off that ledge, you would get silenced by the ghosts in this area and you just wouldn't be able to make it. We forgot about the Woe Drifter buff. With the Woe Drifter buff, you can just yeah. make that jump. So wow, Echo figuring out a little extra tech to get past some of those spots on the bridge where you're only killing one or two mobs at a time. That's always been the slowest part of this dungeon is those sections of this gauntlet where, okay, you're on this platform, you have to kill these two mobs because you can't click the portal when you're in combat. And they've just found a way to make it that much easier here. And look how far much further ahead progressed they are. Not to mention, they also get to pull those two mobs down because they'll snap down because you're an aggro with them, right? So they've found a way to combine pulls on these platforms. And I mean, if any team can find a way to pull that tech off, 
in the next like hour and a half for any further theater of pain runs, they're gonna get themselves a huge advantage on the teams. Look at the look at the time difference here. Yes, they have the same trash percentage, but Echo's already on the boss. Trash count can be found in other places in this dungeon. Yeah. This is definitely something that's gonna save them so much time. I don't think uh, you can do this dungeon as quickly as Echo does, because as you mentioned, these platforms are just so slow to go through one by one. So skipping some of those platforms with this incredible tech using the World Drifter plus the fall damage reduction is crazy. And the, the, the reason why they only needed the two Pandarans is because the other three classes have abilities on the, for themselves to reduce fall damage, right? You have uh, clicks on one side who has uh, a lot of defensives and also uh, has to blink in case he needs it. And then we do have the Hunter with the Disengage and Saelia with the um, Levitate to reduce the fall damage. But um, now and Fragnant playing the Pandaren to get that reduced fall damage really, really working out for them. Probably also running that um, uh, enchant, that um, boot enchant to reduce... Yeah, yeah soul threats, exactly. And yeah, I mean, that is just really, really nicely done by Echo. Innovating strategies this late into the expansion as well, after we had so many seasons already in these dungeons. Uh, it's just really, really nice to see it. Also, not to mention, while we've been sitting here talking about this the entire time, they've had a Voidwalker off on the side tanking a Woe Drifter for almost the entire Coltharok boss fight here. They're almost certainly just saving this Drifter buff for a lot of movement speed after this boss. Could they potentially be using this Woe Drifter to, I don't know, go through the entire Duelist wing, maybe? Like we saw... Mocha do back back like in week three of this series. I'm interested to see what they're planning on doing here. They did let a burst cast go off, which is a little scary, but remember, like you said earlier, this is our lower key level, 22 fortified, so didn't actually do too much damage to the group, maybe half HP to everyone. Zelia was easily able to top themselves off, and look, they've got themselves this one minute movement speed and stealth buff for the for the next minute. They can go skip pretty much to the end of any single one of these any one of these sections. So they're going to uh Okay, they're going to the Gore Shop Wing, so let's see what they plan on pulling here. It looks like they're skipping past everything as Fragrance is opening uh, or using that banner to get the versatility buff. I do think I do want to highlight one thing that perplexed it, though. Because they killed the Woe Drifter on the very first boss pool, they managed to skip past all of these Shackled Souls. And now, as they're fighting Cold Tarok, they are pulling that Relic Pack that Echo had already killed to get the Woe Drifter to skip the platform. And now they get that Woe Drifter to do maybe the same thing as Echo does, just a little mm -hmm. bit later. And if you look Let's at the percentage, Echo, they do have 7% more trash, though. So, yeah, Echo just doing an insane pull on their side. Dude, Echo pulled every single trash mob in the lower part of this dungeon into the boss here. There's no Bloodlust here. This is just pure cooldowns, pure DPS, and raw healing from Zelia to keep everyone alive. Look at the damage meters. Every single DPS player up over 130k DPS. Dropping a little bit now once everything starts to die, but easily bursting every single one of those trash mobs down, except for this putrid butcher that's still full HP. Took a little while to get into the group. That's totally fine. It gives them extra cleave target to just funnel some single target on the boss. And again, Echo taking a difficult pull and making it look easy. Now Perplex going for that same pull, I'd imagine, in a couple seconds here. Yeah, Perplex, keep in mind, they do have a little bit more percentage because they had to deal with more platforms in that uh, Kulturak wing. So it's possible they might just pull less onto this boss to make it a bit easier, which also might result in them killing the boss slightly quicker than Echo because they have to deal with less trash. But they definitely do uh, did pull something on top as well. You can see there's quite a few trash mobs. Doesn't look like they pulled much less at all. So they're going to have a difficult time dealing with that as well. Uh, but yeah, Gorchum just dropping incredibly low for Echo. They have so much funnel, so much single target damage while dealing with all of the trash that they pulled on top of it as well. Here we go. Big AoE pull for Perplex. We're just catching the tail end of it. Also, all of their DPS players, well over 100k DPS. Also very easily dealing with most of this trash. Not quite as clean as Echo. They have a little bit of those uh, shield casts going off on the horrors. So they're staying alive a little longer than you would like. But honestly, that's not too bad because they get a little more funnel damage out of it. You just have to focus on the tank damage intake here. And it looks like they're doing a great job of that. So they're catching up, I would say, just a little bit based off of pure boss DPS. But Echo is still firmly in the driver's seat. Still have to consider the trash percentage, right? If you look at the trash, Echo does have to pull something uh, in addition because Perplex already has dealt with something uh, in the other wing. So we'll see what Echo does and how they get the percentage. There's another huge pull coming in by Echo. There's just back-to-back -back insane pulls. Crazy to look at as they come up 
uh, out of Gorge Shop, they are pulling this whole area together, and they finished up another Woe Drifter here, presumably to skip into the Xav wing, possibly skipping a lot of trash there as well, going straight to the boss. We'll see what exactly they're doing, as they just barely managed to interrupt one of those casts at the very, very end, very close. Don't want to have any of those casts go through, because it does reduce all of the damage that you're doing, and it's a disease, so definitely don't want to have that. Yeah, doing a really good job, sadly, also spamming that un the Shekel uh, Undead to help interrupting, really, so that's really nice to see him. The crazy thing about that is they dealt with that Gorchop wing so quickly that the five minute versatility buff that they got at the start of the wing still has more than half of its duration left over by the time that they enter the duelist wing. Let's see what the plan is here. Now has control undead of the captain, so they don't have to worry about the trash mobs taking reduced AoE damage, and it looks like, yes, they're going for that Monka pull. Sorry, that Sloth pull, rather, where they pull every single trash mob in the Duelist wing, including two of the mini-bosses, up to this top platform here. They're going to be line of sighting around the corner, quickly trying to deal with these relics, so that little bit of AoE damage that they take from their cast goes away. And once that they have everything stacked up, they'll... Presumably pop the bubble, but that's not available for 10 more seconds. I'm sure that'll come they'll, they'll use that the second it comes <gasps> up. But Dragons. Fragments has gone down at the start of the pull. They'll have to get a blood, they'll have to get a res off instantly. It does come out quickly. This is a scary moment though, because that's a lot of their burst AoE damage. Did he use his cooldowns yet? He did not. So that's a, that's one takeaway. They do have that left. Did he have to use that bloodless? It just goes off. He was scared for his life. They're down at 10% HP, but looks like they have stabilized. Zalia has gotten everybody topped off, and they're able to get everything together and start flitzing the AoE down. The Infernals are raining down. The bombs are coming out from the Hunter, and it looks like they have stabilized and gotten this pulled down. The only thing left that they have to deal with is Wreck the Hardened, and it looks scary. This is so dangerous because they have so many bursting out. stacks, and they had already used dangerous. their Dwarf Rachels because all of these Arbalists were coming in, and they apply these bleed effects to everybody and both Jinji and wow. Sally had to use their dwarf racial to get rid of that bleed effect Flicks. and then they didn't have the AoE dispel the, for the for the burst thing coming out so that everyone dropped incredibly low oh. somehow they managed to survive though absolutely crazy as they now got the arena and people are already back onto the platform and look how much damage Xav is taking as well they're just melting that boss but keep an eye on perplex they're actually so close behind echo and they have zero deaths on the board as well they do execute that same pull as well you can see there's so much mm -hmm. trash onto the boss as well both teams just running insane strategies in that theater of pain so so good and of course once the duel goes down of course, they pull aggro on the mini boss left in that first room, so that they do have the they do have that mini boss up there with them on top of the boss. They're going to be cleaving that down for the rest of the percentage they need. Now, where is Echo going to get the rest of their percent from here? Because this mini boss is not going to give them the 50% they need. I'm curious if there's any extra tech that they have left over, because perplexed should be done, right? When they when they get the rest of this trash done, not quite sure actually. They both. Still I think the they pulled a little bit less on. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if they pulled um, hmm. the same amount of trash to the boss as Echo did, because now they're at the oh, they same still need trash okay. percentage. Um, are they, they going to snap Harugia onto the last boss? They... Very possible, what? yeah. They're... Okay. Whatever. We did see <sighs> Sloth do that as well, but it was more of an accident, right? Like, they did, they accidentally pulled the mini boss, and then they... They're pulling, they're pulling yeah, there both of the mini bosses. Double mini boss, actually. <laughs> Wow, okay, so there's two mini bosses they're pulling up or snapping up to the last boss room. They don't have Bloodlust available, and they might. Yeah, there we go, Mordratha is engaged. So now they have a boss plus two mini bosses they have to deal with. Keep in mind, it is fortified, so those mini bosses do a lot of damage with the bleed effect as well, but there's no way to line offside that cast. And all of the other things you have to worry about, this is just crazy. Look at the whirlwind coming out as well. And Clicks just popping everything with the PI on him as well, trying to get those mini bosses down as fast as they can. But yeah, this is just <laughs> crazy wow. to look at. Man, I mean, this is what we expect from the global finals, right? Teams taking every single ounce of the best strategies available to them and making them their own and making them even better. This is something Echo's been good at throughout the years. This is why there are four-time back-to-back champions. And once they have Harusha down, they're done with their trash count. They're at 100%. Look All they Perplexa, have to do is get the last thing. 40%. they're doing the same thing. Perplex also doing the same thing. Yes, they have both mini what? bosses onto Mordretha. Perplex is actually doing a very similar strategy to Echo. The only thing that Perplex didn't do is that platform skip with the fall damage, right? So Perplex yep. is having an insane strategy as well. 
this is so close. I mean, it's a 10 seconds differential in favor of Perplex because of those two deaths that Echo encountered. And That's this is actually incredibly much. close. It's possible that Perplex might actually be faster because of the 10 deaths. I mean, look at how fast the boss is melting for them. That 30% of the boss on 22 Fortified, plus they have I don't to finish know. off the mini bosses. I, I don't think it's going to be quite enough here. I mean, Echo has kind of run out of juice here. This last 10% is going to be excruciatingly slow, but it's not really speeding up for Perplex. The Bloodlust has run out here. Echo, with the boss going down, 10 seconds left on the board, there's absolutely no way Perplex can do 10% of the bosses. All of that in 10 seconds. This is going to be is a so map close, one victory though, right? for Echo. Wow. <laughs> Such a great series. This is going to be an insane series. Wow, I, I can't believe it. Like, uh, we knew Echo was going to be fast, but, uh, you know, we didn't expect Perplex to kind of come in with a, a similar level of speed. It, it is just the platform skip and then maybe yeah. a couple little other efficiencies to go along with it that ended up making the difference. So, great first dungeon, but, you know, Echo doing Echo things, right? I think that this is probably the fastest Theater of Pain route that you can, uh, like, come up with realistically for Echo. Whereas whenever you were looking at Perplex, they were doing very similar stuff, but I mean, we're going to see it in the highlight package. A lot of it came down to that Cold Rock Wing, the, that tech that now was teasing. That that yielded a lot of great results for Echo in, in just how much time it ended up saving for them. Yeah, so I mean, was it, you know, we, we heard rumors, you know, we had, a, we had a little bit of insight coming into this that uh, Echo had something planned, but uh, was it, uh, how, how close to what you expected uh, was it at the end of the day, Nagura? I, I think we, at the end, figured that that's what they're going to do with the platform skip. We just didn't uh, think about the woe buff making it a bit easier because we were right. kind of practicing this, or Makes actually was uh, logging on trying to do the same thing, but she didn't quite manage because uh, there's a thing that maybe not a lot of people know Ooh. is that when you jump off a cold rock platform, there's that's actually cool. hands that grab you and silence you, which makes it really hard to skip to another platform. Yeah, well, here's some uh, new stats that we thought we'd throw at you. This is uh, courtesy of Warcraft Logs and shows sort of the, the damage and healing over time throughout the different uh, parts of the dungeon. Get to see the spikes, the troughs. Interesting uh, data to parse, but uh, Zyronic, what, what do we learn from this? I mean, the cool thing is you can see that Perplex was literally like neck and neck at the start of the dungeon, and you can see there's that tiny little spot around three minutes where Echo just kind of pulls a tiny bit ahead because of that platform skip. And after that point, <laughs> Perplex is just consistently 20 30 seconds behind for the rest of the dungeon here honestly if there was no platform skip this comes down to just a dps race on the final boss that's the thing that echo's known for is coming up with that tiny little bit of tech at, at the last second that teams just don't quite aren't quite prepared for and just making use of it and winning dungeons because of it yeah i guess the question now is we uh, look ahead to sanguine depths is uh, does echo have something else in mind i mean we talked about this a little bit earlier right where theater of pain and here's that skip, uh, you know, is easier to do these kind of funky things on. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't think that Sanguine Depths has the same level because, like, looking at this, they were able to save a decent amount of time just jumping all the way down to this platform. Clicks almost died. He, he was at 1% HP for a very long time, where whenever you're looking at Perplexed, they're doing a pretty standard route here. Like, they get this pack grouped up. This is actually an incredibly scary pull, by the way. It's uh, very difficult to talk about. But the biggest time save here is these portals that the players have to go through. And so Perplexed ended up spending somewhere in the range of, like, 30 to 45 seconds just in total, like, um, just clicking on each of these portals and where, like, Echo is not clicking on as many. They're clicking on half as many portals, jumping there. And then, like, Perplexed, even on this one, this is, like, a relatively short skip. This is like 15 seconds um, that they ended up spending just in uh, travel time across the platform where Echo was able to alleviate some somewhere in the range of like uh, 20 to 30 seconds going between platform 2 to platform 3. Then from there on out, Echo was doing just Echo things. This is an absolutely nuts pull. Pulling this gas bag uh, with all this trash on top of Gorchop and in just some of the other strategy adaptations that we saw, at least from like Sloth during Cup C, it kind of made sense, and I think that this is probably a perfect theater of pain route. Even more perfect than uh, than last time. Now, Zyronic, you're the one who made the YouTube video. The perfect theater pain route. <laughs> is, is this route more perfect? Uh, probably. The perfect -er. <laughs> That's okay. I would say it's. I'd say it's only slightly better. I think the platform skip is what makes it just. It's it's, it's the cherry on top. I'd right. say without the platform skip, it's just on par. But it's. Ever so slightly better. 
Hey, I mean, uh, you, they say you can't improve on perfection, but apparently Echo can do that. What what other team could do that than uh, than Echo? So the early lead for them. But we're looking ahead to Sanguine Depths now. Um, you you don't quite have the same potential, I think, on on that map like you do on this one to find these kinds of skips because uh, those sort of things don't exist. You can see uh, Gambit was banned by Echo, so that does send us to the 22 Sanguine Depths. Um, Perplex had a very clean run. They had zero deaths on Theater of Pain. So if they play this one as quickly, as cleanly, this could end up being a really quick map or really a close map. I actually think that Perplex, with this route that they were playing, would have won against every other team other than Echo, I think, because it was so good. Like They were actually so incredibly fast considering that they didn't do the skip. They did basically the same thing as Echo, except that one platform skip. So I think that was incredibly impressive. The one thing, though, is that Sanguine Depths is a dungeon that Echo is kind of known for to perform really well in. Because it's a really highly um, execution dungeon where you have to keep this lantern buff rolling throughout most of the dungeon. If you make any sort of mistake and you lose this buff, it's going to cost you a lot of time. And I right. think Echo is just really known to be able to execute stuff like that really, really well. And it's also a strategic thing, like where do you get the lantern buff? How do you extend it? What exactly do you use it for? And I think um, Echo might have an edge there as well. I would agree with everything you just said, except for that one time that they forgot about a little bat. True, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, true, yeah, true. God's bleed. <laughs> It wasn't but even the bet they forgot, they just didn't aggro the whole room, yeah, right? They missed, yeah, they yeah, missed yeah. one or two mobs in a room, but everyone remembers them trying to find a bat for the last 2% of count they need. <laughs> yeah. we, we've all been there. We've all been searching for that bat in the hallway at the end of uh, Sanguine Depths. Well, but you can see, you can kind of see Echo's ban strategy coming together, right? If they have the special tech for Theater Pain, they're confident they win that one. Just ban out Gambit because you know Sanguine Depths is another good map for you as well because of what Nagura said with that execution. So they really did kind of set themselves up uh, in their minds, at least, to try to go for the 2-0 here over uh, Perplexed. And you do have to play Sanguine Depths pretty straight up, but uh, like you said, it does come down to execution. And no one has been better than Echo at that for like three years now. So best best of luck, Perplexed. There is some crazy stuff that you could do in the Tar Vault area in Sanguine Depths that we've seen from a lot of different teams. There's like a decent mm -hmm. bit of uh, routing disparity that like... Uh, we saw it in the last stand tournament, I think it was from Omegalol, how they were pulling just that tar vault area where they were grouping up like uh, the full left side into the lantern going tar vault and then grabbing the full right side into the other lantern and then taking that 10 stack into Beryllia. And in that uh, routing that they were doing there seemed the most efficient that we'd seen this whole entire season and, and the whole entire expansion. And it's one of those things that I kind of expect both teams to be looking to route like this, especially since it is uh, on a 22 level. It is raging explosive, so you have to be kind of worried about the explosives whenever you're pulling that big. But I think that these two teams should have that level of execution. But I, I could see a world where it can go massively wrong for either team. And one team could potentially fully wipe while they're trying to get that Tarvald area grouped up. Yeah, I mean, explosive I do think... does... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to say that I think Sanguine Depths is one of those dungeons where... Um, the most efficient route, I don't think any team has even figured it out yet, just because the dungeon is so difficult to execute, but most of the time teams try to play it somewhat safe. Uh, so we might actually see some interesting new strats here, because the key level is somewhat low, and the affixes are not that hard. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's something we haven't really talked a lot about, but I guess we haven't really had a chance to talk about it, is that this dungeon did receive quite some hefty boss nerfs, especially to some of the boss, like, uh, at the third, the second and third bosses specifically got nerfed a lot, and they also fixed the third boss to where, like, the abilities scaled on the proper difficulty, like, some of the abilities were hitting harder on Fortified when they were supposed to on Tyrannical, but we'll see how that plays into it. This is a Fortified dungeon, so we, the, the name of the game, especially with the Warlock slash AoE comp that they have here, should be pulling as much trash as possible on top of bosses when you have that 10-stack lantern buff, so let's see what they're going to do. Echo is already first to the punch here. They've pulled two brutes. They're going to be pulling every single one of these famished ticks or gluttonous ticks on top of the first boss here. And this is likely we're going to see the first bloodlust of the dungeon. Let's keep an eye on those damage meters. See just how high these classes can peak. I'm going to guess we're going to see somewhere in the realm of like 400 KDPS here. 
Looks like Gingy had some procs here already at the start, so that is good for Echo as they gathered up everything. And I think they even pulled that brute that he usually skipped at the very start. I'm not sure. It looked like now pulled it as he was running past. Perplex doing a similar thing on their side just a little bit later because it took them um, a few seconds longer to finish up that first pull. Both of the teams, of course, having that 10 stack lantern buff, so the damage is going to be a bit higher because of that. And look at Clicks just doing an insane amount of DPS coming in here. And yeah, both teams finishing off this uh, trash pull pretty easily as the last brute is still alive for Perplexed. Echo already dealt with all of the trash. So interestingly, we're seeing a little bit of a difference in terms of cooldown usage here. You can see for Echo, Fragments actually had used his Shuin plus a couple of his other cooldowns on the very first trash pull of the dungeon. That's why they were so much faster at the start, whereas the Shine saved his cooldowns for when they got to Crixus here. That's why it took them so much longer to get there. But they were able to much more cleanly deal with the trash, but it didn't really give them that much boss damage, so they're still behind by a solid 15 seconds or so here. Echo is going to have that cooldown available for this next pull that they're doing, and check it out, this is that Season 1 tech that we have from way back in the day where you gather up every single one of these mobs right in the very corner of this room with that lantern activated. You are technically in range of the lantern here, so every single one of the mobs here, when it dies, is going to give you stacks, but you have to be very careful here because in this corner, if the mobs move anywhere away from the corner, they're not going to be giving you any of those stacks. There's a lot of damage coming out here as well. So many casts that you need to interrupt. You're heavily, heavily relying on the AoE stuns from your Warlock and Monk to save you here. And it looks like Echo's done a great job of it. Let's see what Perplexed are doing. Not quite the same pull. They're pulling the mobs outside of the room here. Yeah, they did pull the same amount of mobs, if not even more. It looks like they went over the bridge and pulled that oppressor pack there as well. Uh, so they actually pulled a lot of trash. Um, onto this lantern, just doing it outside of the room, using that uh, edge there to line upside the chain cast as well. And it looks like they're dealing with the trash slightly quicker than Echo even, as oh, now it now does have the Purgatory on that the and actually goes down as the Enrage Sentinel is just causing so much trouble for now with that frontal bleed. Uh, did use the Dwarf Rachel, but it was just not enough for him to survive. So Zelia has to cast the Resurrection, and now Perplexed is in the lead. Even has slightly more trash percentage on the board as well. So yeah, Perplexed did finish off Woe 2, being able to skip past a lot of this trash. Echo also having that Woe, and it persists through death. So after now got uh, revived, he's going to be able to use that stealth as well. It costs to go really fast here to refresh this Lantern buff. They only have 9 stacks of it as well, so if they miss this rebuff... That's a, tr that's a problem. They've got the Quill Feather right on top of the Lantern. They need to get that open and kill that Quill Feather instantly here. Or they're not going to get a refresh. That buff has maybe five seconds left on it. Kill the Quill Feather right now to refresh. At the last refresh. second, they get the 10 stack refresh. But remember, they have no safety net now. Actually, they do have a Battle Res, but that is still scary. Still no Purgatory under tank. That's not a great situation to be in. Lots of damage coming out from Fragments. No Curse to spell in the group, so they're going to have to just deal with the damage there. Looks like Zalia's got him just fine, but Perplexed so far ahead here, already have dealt with this trash pull. Echo playing it safe here, though, making sure they even banish off that doubt just to make sure they can get the last second refresh. Yeah, that raging affix causing problems for both of the teams. You can see that Sentinel and Perplexed side also being enraged. Uh, no Soothe available from uh, the Hunter, presumably oh, uh, other so targets that they want to Soothe. But Tarvald is being engaged already by Echo, as they have the 10 stack buff from the Lantern still. And it looks like they just pulled a lot of trash on top of Tarvald as well. So let's see if they can execute it. While Perplexed, though, did open up another Lantern, and they did refresh their buff just now. With the Woe buff, they are still moving on, just speeding through the dungeon. Presumably also engaging Tarvald on their side with a bunch of trash as well. I mean, this is so smart. Did you see they just got a, a full refresh of their 10 stack just now? They broke the banish at the last second the lantern was available, finished off the doubt behind them, and they got a refresh of their 10 stack. I mean, that's that's insane tech. I don't think we've seen other teams even go for here. So Echo getting a little bit more out of that lantern buff than we're seeing from other teams, and they'll be able to very easily carry that into their next trash pull and not really have to rush for the refresh here. Now, they are doing a little bit different trash pull styles, right? Echo going for the boss pull second, and they're going to go to the, the, the rest of the trash afterwards, whereas Perplexed hasn't pulled that second boss just yet. But I think the route that Echo's going for has historically been slightly faster, and the most important difference in this route is that Echo is going to be able to carry that 10-stack electric buff into the third boss, whereas for Perplexed, that's going to be very, very difficult to do. Perplexed... 
just had the lantern opened like at the last millisecond before the sentinel died they also have a banish right there on the vestige oh. of that exactly the yeah. same thing as echo was just doing and their stack was about to run out the sentinel was about to die they really delayed it so so much that was so good by perplex and they might actually be able to refresh that 10 stack going into the third boss room as well mm -hmm. now they're dealing with tarvald they finish off the ur as well and they still have that vestige banished in the back so before the, the lantern is about to run out, Wolf Disco can unbanish that and they can refresh their stack. So keep an eye on Perplex to see if they are able to do that. Echo now has no more lantern buff left on their side. Mm -hmm. I still think they have a whole lantern left to activate they though, do. right? Well, this is where they're using it right now. This is where they get their next lantern. This is the make or break pull of the dungeon for them. They're going for this massive trash pull with essentially no cooldowns, no bloodlust, no lantern stacks. They just have to live and buff, get those stacks up. Once they start stacking up a little bit, they'll be they'll be a little bit safer. But part of the danger of this poll is you have Head Custodian Javelin in there, the guy who does the Yasuo Q frontals. And look how dangerous it is. Now dropping to 10% near. Still no Purgatory available, but able to Death Strike himself back up to full HP in no danger whatsoever, it seems. He was just uh, playing a little prank on everybody. And they have that Woe Drifter buff as well. So they got the last second, 10 second buff refresh. Perplex doesn't have theirs. They have no buff going into the third boss here, Perplex so even though... Perplex doesn't have it, but they have 10% more trash. <laughs> they have 10% so more trash, but does that So this is going to be really matter? close. I mean, this boss is going to get destroyed I think by so. Echo. It's going to get destroyed for sure, yeah. by Echo. Yeah, I think, I think the I think boss fight is going to be so much harder for Perplex, because they don't have any buffs, right? So this boss is going to take a lot longer for Perplex, and it's going to be a lot harder to execute. Echo has that buff, basically the whole duration of the buff going into this uh, boss fight as well. And you can see they even have the Woe Drifter buff at the start here as well, which is going to make it so much easier to survive the first AoE. And uh, yeah, I mean, look at that. No one dropping incredibly low. They also have an Ur buff as well now to just heal everyone back up from that AoE. Perplex, if you look at the boss's HP, definitely dealing with this boss a little bit slower because of that difference. I mean... The original trash pack for Echo just died so quickly, and you can see Perplex is still dealing with theirs. Perplex actually even delayed their trash pool until after players gathered their orbs, so that they wouldn't have to start worrying about all of their trash, you know, interrupts and mechanics going on while they were dodging the circles from the boss. So, just you have to play more inefficiently when you have the lantern stacks available to them. And look at the the, the gap that's being opened up by Echo here: twenty percent boss damage opened up. Now, like you mentioned earlier, yes, Perplex does have more trash count. But what does that net you in this final boss room? I guess you can skip the last trash packs and just go straight to the boss, but you're bloodlusting there anyways, the, the 10 stack of the lantern buff, so I don't really know how much that gains you. We're yeah. going to have to see. But look at the difference in trash now. It's only 3%. So that means True. Echo actually pulled something from oh, upstairs yeah. to downstairs because they had that 10 stack. So not only did they pull all of the trash in this room, they also pulled trash from upstairs down, which made them catch up quite a bit on trash. So now they only need 3%, which is not a lot at all. So because they played the lantern differently, they it allowed them to basically pull a lot more onto this boss, which really closed that gap in the trash difference. And now you can see how much quicker they're already in this area as well. Having that Woe Drifter buff still from the Woe Relic that they decided to kill on the boss and managed to skip all of the trash up until this area not even 10 minutes into the dungeon and they're already on that last <laughs> hallway. I mean, this is just I was crazy. about to say the same thing. We're nine and a half minutes and General Paul has been engaged on a 22 fortified key in Sanguine Depths. Oh, man. I mean, it's crazy it's to like think. It's like we can't even it, breathe in between the things that we have to talk about here while casting no these matches. <laughs> yeah. There's no time to think. They've had a lantern buff for probably 60% of this dungeon. That's crazy yeah. to think of. And they're about to get another one here, too, as they get through the first phase of General Call on the side of Echo as Perplex engages the final boss here. The extra 3% trash count isn't going to be a big deal, and it looks like Echo has even gripped in one of those bats. The bat is back! And they, yeah. they were able to get it in. That's where the trash count is going to come from, it seems, Nagura. Yeah, that's it, and that is going to be incredibly efficient because they have to finish off General Cal anyway to move on in this gauntlet, so getting the bats in is not a time loss at all. So really working out for Echo here, that's a trash percentage that they were behind, it's not causing any issue. There we go, another bat being uh, gripped down by now there. As for Plex also is moving on in the area though, it looks like they're already in the too. lantern area as well. Didn't uh, open up that lantern yet though, uh, so we'll see if Echo does use the lantern buff to do a huge pull onto the boss. I assume they will. Their bloodlust is still in a 10 second cooldown. As soon as that is ready, they are going to be able to just engage all of that trash with the boss. 
Now, notably, usually what we see teams do is get a 10 stack buff during the third phase of General Call. But is Echo just going to have one person stay behind? I think we saw Fragments way in the back trying to battle with those just bears. Just got a refresh, one yeah. a bear just to get a refresh. Yep, everyone just got the 10 stack refresh. So that was the plan here. They're going to have to get through this last phase of General Call, and then they'll have about a minute of that 10 stack buff to deal with the last boss plus whatever trash they need. Echo has also pulled a second bat on top of their boss here, so... Let's see if they're able to make full use of that buff, that buff on the final boss here. A bit of a scary moment. Smash coming out from the Erdus Mantler at the same time they need to stack inside the Lantern buff for the Gloom Squall, but they're able to get through it just fine. All they have to do now is get through maybe a couple percentage points of this boss's HP, but every single second that you're wasting here is time off of that 10 stack buff that you're saving for the final boss. And Perplexed, we already know, they're going for that strat I was talking about. They're getting a full 10 stack buff during this third phase of General Call. They're going to have all 1 minute and 15 seconds of that buff here when they get to the last 20% of the boss. So it goes ahead for the time being, but we know that Perplex will be able to catch up. It's just a matter of if there's enough time left in the dungeon for them to. Yeah, it looks like they also finished up a Woe Drifter to be a bit quicker, but Echo already engaging that last boss with all of that trash that they still need, the 10% that is left on the enemy forces. And there we go, Echo also using the Bloodless as well. This is really difficult though, because there's <gasps> so the much damage, damage coming in onto the tank, and also a lot of damage it's coming in dead. onto the group. Ur also being killed off, so that means they're gonna get a little bit of a breathing room here with all of they're the all healing being all done, and all of the trash just got deleted with the 10 stack buff. But as you mentioned, the 10 stack buff is gone now. As soon as the trash was dead, it's gone. But the boss is already on 56%, so they only have 6% left to go through here. I mean, uh, this boss is gonna be dead before Perplex gets to the boss. I mean, obviously, Perplex is about to time out, the cooldowns are all gone. But I don't think any of that matters. All Echo has to do is do the last two percentage of the boss here, and they're going to be taking a very, very insane 2-0 win over Perplex here. And Perplex looked amazing. This is the best we've seen them play in years, but it's just not enough to take even a game off of Echo. Wow. Oh. It is unbelievable just how good Echo is. I mean, because... Like you were saying the entire time, like Perplexed is putting together a fantastic run. I mean, this is an incredible key that they're doing right now, but it's just Echo has every little drop of efficiency that you could possibly squeeze out of a, out of a run. They'll find it, you know? And uh, what do you do? What do you do against a team like that, Tettles? I mean, they're built different. I, I, I thought that for a little bit there, I thought that Perplex was going to uh, end up winning the series, and we'll see it in a second. Just one mistake were perplexed and ended up costing them basically the whole entire run. But Echo looked in peak form, and it's one of those things that if you make one mistake, Echo is going to punish you, and you're going to end up losing off of it. You have to basically play perfect. You can't make any mistakes in your runs. I mean, Echo is in peak form across this whole entire weekend so far. I didn't quite see titles because I was so mesmerized by Echo. Did Perplex miss the refresh during Torvald? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, oh, that's what yep. happened, yep. yeah. It, it was an... It, it was an issue of just like a, sh a shine went out and touch of death to the mob, and we'll we'll see in a second. They left it like trapped, and a shine went out and touch of death, but I think the lantern expired or something, and they just didn't get a refresh. Oh. And because I was thinking, because they had it banished, but then they never got a refresh. Because I was looking at the buff, and they never got it. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Thirteen it, it, minutes and ten seconds, though. Dude. <laughs> oh. I know. Well, here's our uh, our stats powered by a Warcraft logs, and uh, you can see again like perplex and echo, pretty neck and neck for most of it. Even um, a hat perplexed at the start, right? Until yeah. like the six minute mark. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yep. But just, it's, uh, I mean, it's like that right around that nine minute mark is, or yeah. that, that, that small spike yes. that's at eight minutes. So Echo obviously like snapped a pack on top of Beryllia. Um, so the mm -hmm. pull that Perplex was going to be doing was going to be a little bit smaller, but it shouldn't be like that much worse. And then they ended up just falling off super hard because of it. What can you do? I mean, uh, again, like at the end of the day, like Echo's just gonna be playing perfectly apparently, and they they don't look completely unbeatable, right? But uh, when they're playing like this, when they're doing things this intricate, it's tough. It's did you guys know corner, that? Isn't it? Did you guys know that you could actually refresh the lantern here? I thought they changed it whenever they made the lantern smaller. Apparently, if yeah. you like mass grip the mobs right on top of the corner, uh, you're able to still refresh the lantern there. And and then this is uh, what happened with the. Uh, perplex strategy so they were they were running a different tarvald area strat which i thought it was pretty decent um 
I was wondering what they were going to do with their Borrelia 10 stack, or if they were just going to go into that boss without stacks of the Lantern, which I was concerned with initially whenever I was watching what was happening here. But they, but with like this banish, you see Wolf Disco banishing the mob, and then you actually see it getting Freezing Trapped. A Shine is going to run off at the... Like, we don't have the POV whenever a Shine runs away. Um, but, like, towards the end of Tarvald, he's going to... Uh, leap out and then like go and touch it at the mob and either the lantern expired or the mob wasn't close enough to the lantern it, it's unclear what exactly was the cause of it but that ultimately ended up losing them the map they, they were so close there they are they were a matter of seconds away from being able to win the map but echo just doing echo things doesn't make a single mistake here their uh their general call just like how they were getting stacks of the lantern here and, and just their sequencing of their pulls looked absolutely top-notch and they were able to win off of that right i mean we were we were questioning the way that they were doing their lantern buffs here but i guess in the in the strategies when you think about this is the lowest key level on fortified so the boss doesn't have that much hp all you really need the lantern buff for at the last second there is just to make sure you get all the trash dead in the the residual aoe you get on the boss will get the boss to like below half hp and then you can very easily finish off the last set of the boss i think that's definitely an interesting way to do it because you will you do gain extra boss damage during p2 of general call right which is kind of the trade-off we we, yeah. we uh you remember as you guys remember whenever like h pally was meta and we saw those general call kills mm -hmm. that were like like 20 seconds i think on this yeah. level with the 10 stack of the lantern we're seeing the same thing okay certainly fast enough yeah well a 2-0 for Perplexed, and the, that is after Perplexed playing, I would say, substantially better than we saw them play yesterday. So, yeah. improvement day-to-day -day for Perplexed, no doubt, but still not enough to take down Echo. That said, Perplexed is going to still be a big threat in the lower bracket. The lower bracket is kind of, uh, you know, looking like it's going to be pretty crazy as well. Uh, we're going to have some good teams eliminated, that's, that's for sure. But, uh, for now... We'll look ahead to our next series, which is going to be Munka versus Donuts in Despair. Now, Donuts in Despair uh, getting the 2-1 win over Baldi, which I think a lot of people weren't necessarily expecting, but they got it done in the Halls of Atonement very last second, basically, off of a mistake from Baldi. But they're going up against Munka, and Munka has been playing extremely efficiently, some of the lowest times we've seen out of day one. So it's it's not going to get any easier for Donuts in Despair, that's that's for sure. Yeah, well... I Dude, the manga, those manga times from yesterday were... They they are a force to be reckoned with. They, it wouldn't shock me, like, just looking at their day one, if they're able to con keep that consistency, they could probably win the tournament. Yeah, the thing is, though, right, because uh, yesterday when we saw Perplex, we were like, oh, maybe not, like, the greatest times, because afterwards we compared it to manga times, and manga was much faster. But yeah. today I saw Perplex, and I was like, oh, maybe yesterday times are not actually that relevant anymore. So, yeah, I think this series can go either way, because both of those teams have the potential to be incredibly fast. Yeah, we'll see. Oh, hi, Mike. <laughs> Mike <Mix> literally <laughs> just kicked... <laughs> Mix Mix Hey, Makes Kate Zyrotic <laughs> off the broadcast? Hello? Just il oh. Don't get eliminated. <laughs> Speaking of uh, people being eliminated uh, this weekend, the MDI uh, International. Well, uh, well, you know, we, we're happy you're here, Mex, but I'm afraid we have to go to a break now. She's just so excited to get in for the next match. I can't blame her. I'm excited as well. I get to be here all day. But I'd like to give I'd a jumping in too. I'd like to give a shout out to remote broadcasts. <laughs> exactly. We'll be back in the studio someday. See you in a few. <laughs>
Well, we are back here at the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals. Your host, Doe, here along with uh, Tettles, Dratnos uh, joining us, and uh, Mix, who is yeah. just incredibly thrilled to, to be here today. So thrilled, in fact, that you just I never know what she's going to I couldn't contain myself. I was just so excited to get on the desk, you know? <laughs> she's everywhere. Well, we've got a great <laughs> series coming up. I can't blame you. It's going to be Donuts in Despair. Versus Monka, we talked about this a little bit before the break. Uh, Donuts and Despair getting maybe a bit of an upset win over Baldi, although I think that uh, that point is debatable. But uh, Monka is going to be a difficult team to beat with their efficient runs yesterday. Isn't that right, Dratnos? Yeah, looking at the games we were seeing yesterday, it's hard to hard to describe this as anything except uh, Monka maybe moderate favorites here. That being said, as we saw, yeah. Teams look different on day two compared to day one. Often you'll see teams budget their practice times differently based on how much resistance they expect to encounter on day one, right? So you could imagine a world where Monka was like, look, we need to do everything we've got on this day one series in order to win there, which uh, then maybe they're, they have less for this series than the, these maps. And we have a little bit of a closer series. Donuts and Despair, on the other hand, we know they weren't super happy with how yesterday exactly. went. They felt like they kind of got through uh, mm -hmm. off of you know, some, some luck and some mistakes from the other team. And uh, so, oh. yeah, looking Ooh. at the 50-50 on the Pick'ems, yeah, it's, it's hard wow. to describe this as anything other than a toss-up. I mean, that a little actually... bit of an advantage for Donuts mm. and Despair. I, I don't know if I expected that. I would have, like, I did think it would be close, so, but I thought that if there was, like, a tick on the scale to one side, it would be in favor of Monka. So I that's picked, really interesting. I picked donuts in my pickums, and I regret it in the, on this series. I think Monka are definitely uh, look better as of yesterday. Ooh. But again, these pickums were all made before the tournament started, so uh, information updates weren't available, and we didn't get to see how good that day one was yesterday from Monka. And we start off okay here in the twenty three streets as well, which I believe donuts banned yesterday as well. So maybe another point in Monka's favor. Both teams actually taking the necrotic wake out of the pool, which means the sanguine depths hmm. also not going to be played as it is the fifth I, map here. Just immediately, I see the spires of ascension that mm -hmm. uh, got left unbanned, and I'm pretty sure that's just. <laughs> an, I think that this is maybe a uh, a bracket that uh, like a series that is Monka favored at least in the maps with that spires of ascension going through and how dominant they looked in that dungeon yesterday you have to be scared if you're donuts and despair uh just that being the third game series so if donuts and despair are gonna win they're probably gonna need to bust out a 2-0 yeah, if we yeah. get there, I want to see. I want to see sanguine stats. I want to see uh, who had the more healing. Oh, but we're starting already. All right, let's go. Donuts in despair. Monka game one. Let's see who takes the early lead. Ooh, difference in composition immediately. Um, we got the Ooh. fire mage from Monka and the demon hunter from Donuts in despair. Big fan of the demon hunter makes. Yeah, I mean, I play demon hunter, so I really like seeing that. But the. Uh... <clears throat> It's something that we have seen in that streets before. I'm not so sure if I like the mage more. Uh, hmm. Crims is a fire mage main, right? So I, I think it makes sense that if they're going to default to something that's atypical, it's going to end up being that that mage. Uh, the mage does bring arcane intellect, which is so like the the havoc demon hunter, at least by, by these MDI teams, is hmm. normally seen as just chaos brand. Allow your warlock to do more damage. <laughs> so That's so yes. toxic. <laughs> I mean, you are right. The the other thing that the demon hunter brings to streets is the but high mobility. So, oh, yeah, they did. They, they are pulling the boss now too. So. That's that's all right. I was like, would they lost without the boss? But they're actually pulling everything here. Donuts and Despair are full sending it, and so is Monka. Now also with that bloodlust, I really want to see what the Demon Hunter and the Mage do here because Warlock and Survival we have seen a lot, but I kind of want to see how these two classes rank up against each other in this big, big, massive pull that will determine on which team will get a teeny tiny lead here in this dungeon. Well, right now, Monka is just use, utilizing that Fire Mage only to do single target damage to Zofax. And whenever they are lusting this boss, I, I think it kind of makes sense. Just so they were a little bit slower, maybe somewhere in the range of 10 seconds getting that boss spawn. But with the difference in the lust timing, just look at look at where these two teams are positionally on the boss HP. Monka is starting to open up somewhere around a 30% a tra or 30 percent boss hp lead and now they are grabbing this trash pack here i suspect they're going to be uh getting that woe drifter buff and they're going to be 
uh, drifting on out of here. Oh goodness, every, all those relics were kind of low, but they did get the Woe Relic from Monka. As I think that they're somewhere in the range of 10 seconds ahead, maybe 15 seconds ahead of Donuts in Despair. Yeah, they also have this trash pull nearly finished up that Donuts and Despair are now engaging. So like you said, they are in the lead right now, finishing off the boss here. At the same time, finished with the trash, will move on with that woe buff, just speeding past the security. So really nasty, you don't want to play them. And now I'm curious what their next move is going to be. It is bolstering, so big pulls can be a little bit scary, but we have seen teams go pretty big here. It doesn't seem like they want to though or do they scarla is waiting assumedly Less. for the pet to come back is is he waiting on the patrol or was he waiting on mode to get back he was waiting on mode i thought okay. he might wait on the patrol but he was waiting on mode they did put down that warlock portal to make sure mode could be with the team as soon as possible but this is a really, really big pull for bolstering and explosive. I'm actually scared for them. No bloodlust. They are using defensives here to make sure they're not going to get too much additional damage onto the team. Moat Mode is using that boon as well to make sure big AoE damage is coming out of every team member here. Oh and now gosh. the bolsterings come in. They actually do such a good job of killing them at the same time. And I think it comes down to the fact that they were able to get that pack group so tightly, like you were talking about, just being able to have that mass grip and uh, just get those mobs all fully stacked. It really allowed them to uh, go super quick with that pull. And Donuts of Despair are doing a very different route here. So they, they are skipping that trash that Monka was grabbing. And instead, Donuts of Despair are in that middle of the map area. So they're over towards that menagerie side where Monka has made their way into the mail room. Um, we, we don't see all of their players with them. Assumingly, Crims is off doing uh, the, like, he's delivering all of those uh, RP events where you saw yeah. Mode, he went to the Menagerie and started spawning the boss. This is something that was relatively typical whenever we saw these teams in couple play. Yeah, you do want to do your best to kind of shave time off and make sure you're not waiting on any RP events or, you know, little intermission things you have to do. So something like you said, we've seen a bunch from these teams and Monka is now going with the Postmaster and is 23 tyrannical. This boss is not as easy as one could assume at first, right, Tuttles? This bo this boss has definitely caused some wipes. It, it's mostly due to like the trash or whenever you have other issues on this fight. However, for Monka here, they were able to get the trash killed off. It's not like quaking or something else where mm -hmm. it could uh, end up causing problems. And in addition to that, uh, with oh, the change to bolstering the, the season, stun. beautiful. Yeah, you Sorry. saw that on the the sorter. They they stunned the chickens. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sick. it was moat mode stun. Which uh, for anybody that's not familiar, it has a very high cooldown. It's like. 45 seconds if uh, you don't use an awful lot of smites, so having that ready there, pretty nice. So now Donuts and Despair, their routing is, I think, a little bit worse than Monka's, just looking at the, the trash count difference. So Monka has already dealt with uh, the Postmaster. Now they're making their way towards that Menagerie area. They're not going to the Oasis. They're, they're running all the way around to that Menagerie side. They're going to come back to the Oasis last. Donuts in Despair, I mean, somewhere in the range of 15% count behind. They're going to be able to get some trash here, but I, I think that they are... I, I think that Monk is solidly in the lead. How, how far in the lead do you think that Monk is right now? Um, well, if I were Dratnos, you know, I would say they're like a half boss fight ahead. Okay, um... that's not what the, <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, I do think they have like a substantial lead here. So like 30 seconds, maybe 40 seconds, which is in MDI terms a lot. And they might even be a little bit quicker depending on what they do with that end boss. They are now pulling these peacekeepers into uh, Alcrux, which will allow them to get like a little bit more additional trash like they did with all the other bosses as well, while also dealing with the boss mechanic. And I would think they also take one up to the final boss to make sure they get the additional buff. 
Something that's also important for Monka, look at this. So Mode and Crims both have their meld on CD. And, and so before they made their way into this area, they ended up killing off some of those relics. And, we, and we've seen this from some of the MDI teams. They're going to be able to grab that Woe Drifter at the very end of this fight, uh, pull it in whenever you do uh, just have that last boss active. And then, okay, so look on the left side of your screen, you see Donuts in Despair. They have that Woe Drifter uh, spawned off to the side as well. And both of these teams mm -hmm. are going to be able to just like, uh, snag that at the last second, get that speed buff, and then make their way onto the Oasis. Donuts and Despair has started to catch up a little bit, but they are one of these bosses behind. And look at where Monka is tanking this Golem. This is different than where we see most teams on live tanking cool. this Golem. Um, yeah, no, is it? I have seen a lot of teams tank this Golem there. Um, I think any corner is fine, uh, and this one has to kind of close-ish walls, so all of the orbs just bounce off, and whenever you get the debuff that's currently on Crims, you can just run into the corner and absorb them all, mm -hmm. which uh, is really, really nice. So we have seen this happen on this corner, I think we have seen this happen in like the entrance corner, and also in like the other side of this room, so any corner will technically work, right? Yeah, all right, now Miss Vinza Goldfuge has been summoned. Uh, something that they do have on the side of Monka is they have a bunch of purges. You see Krems more often than not is spell stealing off that uh, shield from that golem, and now they have it in position like you were talking about. They make sure it's perfectly in the corner. The, uh, the Whirring Annihilation, very dangerous. If you get sucked mm -hmm. all the way into there, um, it can cause problems, and they want to kind of be stacked on top of that robot to where they're able to get that damage amp. I, I think that Donuts in Despair is starting to catch up a little bit, but whenever you look at the trash count difference, 5% enemy forces separates them too. So, Malko looking really, really solid in this first map. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of continuing where they left off yesterday, right? We saw them yesterday do really, really crazy times, like echo-threatening times. So, I'm really happy to see that out of them here. Uh, but, yeah, a little bit, a little bit scary, scary there for a stack. second. So they're going to do this Woe Drifter it is. without the boss. Yeah, that's a little bit of a time loss, right? I mean, to be honest, the Drifter doesn't have too much HP, so it doesn't take them very long. But yeah. You could have maybe just pulled it in. Maybe they were scared that they would reset the boss if like, the debuff spawns on the person that's at the far end trying to get the Woe. But they're... I'm unsure, because look at Donuts in Despair. They have that Woe Drifter. Uh, it did just melee mm -hmm. cryptics, which is not great. However, they're able to use that, that 20 stack of that buff that you see currently on Yips to just massacre the Woe Drifter. They're going to be able to get that killed off. And so that's going to be some time that they're going to be able to claw back. But, I mean, they're they're already 50 seconds behind where Monka were. Um, mm -hmm. And count. It's like, they're behind in count as well. So things aren't looking great for Donuts in Despair right now. Yeah, but they could still turn it around in a second map. However, you said this before we went into the game. The third map that's waiting here yeah. is the Spires. So if Donuts and Despair manage to kind of even it out, should Monka take this one, they have to go into the Spires and win that one also. And on one hand, you could say, well, they know what Monka is doing in the Spires, right? So they know what kind of time and tech they have to be. But then on the other hand, what Wonka was doing looked pretty insane. So uh, it's definitely not an easy task that Donut and Spear are up to now. But they are speeding on, uh, trying to get to this little boss here where you have to play some instruments. So now also in the arena here and we'll get started with the trash as soon as possible. So Skylark actually ended up proccing his purgatory on this pull. Uh, so they snapped. You're able to snap. Commander Zofar. So looking at the left side of your screen, you see Dunstan Despair has Commander Zofar. Monka also snapped Commander Zofar into this oasis area, and it ended up proccing uh, Skylark's Purgatory. However, all of the trash being dealt with, they only have that one Peacekeeper left. Um, I, I think that Monka is looking okay. They, they are a bit safe, but that's just something that can come back to bite them if Skylark is not careful later on. At that point, any amount of tank damage that he's not expecting can cause his death, and at that point, tank deaths are the most costly thing in the MDI, and like that would probably cause a team wipe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So happy that he chose to go with that purgatory. We have seen the bloody case this weekend, 
uh, to mostly go with it, but uh, some variation has been there from, from daring teams. So Happy Skylar went with the safer route. And to be honest, it, I think it's something we've seen Monka do in general. So yesterday and also today, like playing that Woe Drifter on its own, they try to minimize, uh, well, critical elements as much as possible. So they don't go too daringly. They try to not do stuff where something could technically fail them pretty hard. And I think if they didn't do that, they could be even quicker from what we've seen so far. Like yesterday, for example, when they played the Plague Fall, they decided to uh, DPS down the first bomb on Dr. Ickes, whereas most other teams had just decided to use defensives and lift. And Monka was DPSing the bomb, thus losing DPS on the boss, which they didn't need to. They didn't get the second bomb. So I feel like if they feel very confident, they could be even quicker, yeah. All right, now Zogron going to be going down for Monka here. Uh, they do have that woe buff as well to be able to go towards that last boss. And, and things are looking great for them. They portal out of here. They use that Warlock gateway. And uh, we do know that they snapped Commander so far. They're going to uh, be snapping one more trash pack onto the boss. And, and mm -hmm. it, it applies an AoE enrage. Whenever that enrage is uh, applied to the mobs, all of the mobs that are surrounding it take increased damage. And it, this is a boss that we've seen get killed off in something like 40 seconds. Monka does have Bloodlust available. They have most of their offensive it. CDs, and things are going to be looking pretty good. Look at that picture in picture of Maystein running yeah, off to beautiful. the side, portaling back up. So he went up for anybody that's unfamiliar with this technique. All of the team goes up, he puts down his demonic circle, uh, then goes down again, pulls the groups like the Enforcer and another smaller pack, and then. <laughs> comes back up using that <laughs> demonic circle and then goes to the corner here trying to snap them onto that little edge on the wall and then what happens is uh, he gets instant acro from these mobs so mode mode using I that gs making right sure now. maystein gets to live here yeah i mean they're tanking everything into the wall all right now look at that enforcer that enforcer is going to be going down meaning, meaning that soasmi is going to now be taking uh, just normal amounts of damage, but Monka already has so as me at 55% HP. Things are looking so good for them. That double technique, you're going to want to kick that at the last possible second, um, it, and it allows you to be able to beat up the boss as fast as you want to. Uh, it, it like allows you to have a uh, higher uptime because you're not going to have to portal around as much on the left side of your screen. Jonas oh. in despair, making their way up to the last boss, but it seems like it's too little too late as Monka has so as me down to 25% here. Yeah, I mean, uh, you really need to hope that they miss a kick on the double technique or something if you're Donuts and Despair now. <laughs> Gosh, that just gets emphasized uh, as I say that. <laughs> that would be really awkward. Yeah, last second. There we go. Like you said, try to get the most of it out of it. Because the boss is not porting around, not doing anything else while it's casting that. So you try to make the most of it. And now it Skylar is pulling Soazni to the far side so they don't need to port through the wall here one more time two percent one percent that is it one to zero for monka not bad not bad not bad <laughs> really good <laughs> name form as they were uh, yesterday which is to say uh, looking very good right dranos yeah this is the the caliber of play that we saw from them yesterday and it is very very scary for every team in this bracket potentially including even echo uh, so really good sign for monka that being said series not over just yet there's a chance that streets of wonder may have been a weaker map for donuts and despair we saw them choose to ban it out yesterday uh, and of course the first map in the series not bannable so they couldn't do that today maybe though that bodes a little bit better for them for the remainder of the series We will have to wait and see as we look ahead to uh, the other side, which is going to be our second map of that. But we've got a lot of clips to talk about. And when it comes down to it, it felt like Donuts and Despair didn't have like a bad route or anything like that. Yeah, it's uh, zero it deaths as well. Yeah, it just seemed slower, you know? What what did you guys think of the Demon Hunter versus the Mage? 
Did it impact this much at all? So, I mean, we can, we can look at the damage done here, right, and see that it actually looks like the Demon Hunter is doing well compared to the Mage. You know, obviously Donuts and Despair did less total damage because uh, they were less progressed in the dungeon, and yet their Demon Hunter absolutely keeping up relative to uh, to Crims on the Mage. And when you think about it, Chaos Brand is adding more damage than Arcane Intellect generally as well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Plus you're bringing that, that Sinful Brand, that's an extra defensive for your tank. So I actually think that pick holds up rather well. Yeah, and you can see Monka just a little bit ahead, uh, pretty much the whole way through. But uh, anything jump out at you uh, specifically on this one? Tell us. Yeah, you could kind of just see a, a lot of the damage was done here in the first few minutes, right? That's where you can sort of see these graphs getting that separation and then holding for the rest of the way through. Most of the rest of the dungeon looks pretty similar, just like shifted by a minute in favor of Monka, but. Yeah, you can see they just have that extra spike of damage around that two-minute mark that Donuts and yeah. Despair don't replicate, and uh, and then they hold on to that lead for the rest of the dungeon. That was a lust timing difference between the two teams. <laughs> like mm -hmm. Donuts and Despair had to do that or wanted to do that trash pack without lust. Yeah, one thing I liked about Donuts, I I, I I thought this was an interesting decision to go mid and not pull any of that like wise guy stuff over on the side here. This does set them a little bit behind in count. They're getting a little bit less total count out of this, but they make up for this uh, with a couple clever things. One thing they did was pull an extra mini, not mini boss, but one of the securities near the first boss. Uh, meanwhile, on the other hand, we had Monka doing just this more standard muscle wise guy pull over here. This is really scary pull, especially with bolstering, but they do a really good job of even cleaving here and having everything die all at the same time. That binding shot as well, preventing those uh, mobs from getting to people while they have all those bolstering stacks. I think that I prefer the the Monka pull there because like they, their backtracking is a lot less because uh, with what Donuts and Despair had to do there, they, they ended up just like running around a bunch relative to where Monka, because mm -hmm. Monka was taking a more linear route through the dungeon. Yeah, both teams, you know, they ended up doing a fairly similar total amount of, uh, of backtracking, I think, but... Uh, definitely is like a, you know, you, you're getting a lot more count from that one big pull, and that lets you set up, you're, you're at 94% coming onto this last boss, you just snap up the one uh, big enforcer, you get that damage done, increase to the boss, uh, and it's a, a very nice way to speed things up here. One thing that we didn't really get to see too much of, because the game was ending, but over on the other side, we had Donuts and Despair actually going bigger here. They needed more count. They were 89% here. They snap a double Enforcer pull here uh, oh. going into last boss. Wow. And this is something that I think is pretty cool. Great, a great way to use their Bloodlust. And uh, this particular part of the dungeon, you know, it also gets them some of that count that they lost from the smaller pull in the middle of the dungeon mm -hmm. rather than the Wise Guy side. Um, so interesting, interesting tactic. And I think there are things there to take from the Donuts and Despair plan that are good. Like, I think that I think if you can snap double enforcer onto last boss, that's got to be a profitable thing to do. But it, are you going to be able to find a good way to to use that five percent that it makes for you somewhere else in the dungeon? Is the question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that wise guys pull, like we were talking about, it's just like in the way, and you would rather pull mm -hmm. it just because like you don't have to go out of your way to. Yeah, I mean, if you're already like... woe skipping, right? You're you just zip past it and it doesn't doesn't do anything. But it's a nice thing to do. Uh, yeah, you know, positionally in the dungeon, sure. Yeah. How did you, Dreadnoughts, feel about the difference on the Menagerie boss, where Donuts and Despair pulled Wo into the end of the boss fight, and Monka just let yeah. Wo sit there? I, I I was curious about that for Monka as well, the about the decision to just leave the Wo and do it after the boss, because Donuts and Despair, yeah, like you said, they pulled it in and cleaved it with the end of the boss, which I do imagine also has to be a better a better thing to do, right? Like, to you just get yeah. to cleave. You get to bring it in, and they had to do pretty much the same setup as the other, as each other, right? Because you had to get the woe ready. So maybe it just ended up being like the woe was a little bit out of range from how they'd planned to be able to pull it in or something. Uh, That's what I'm thinking. I think it like has to be a mistake. They almost certainly planned to like, because you have the twenty stack of the damage buff as well on the boss. Like yeah. that woe drifter is not that, not really that dangerous to grab in at the very end like that either. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's just a case of like, hey, look, we we're, we literally just want to focus on the boss. We you know we we just tested it against each other, and the warlock sending the pet to go do this or whatever is just not uh, okay, not time efficient, and we get to DPS this thing kind of for free while we're running out, and it doesn't have that much health, so it dies while we're running out. Like maybe maybe that's the thought process, but my guess is that it is just like uh, generally better to do it the donuts way. Yeah, it's a tiny thing, but like way. yeah, either way, those, it's those it's probably five seconds either way. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah, for sure. It's not much, but sometimes five seconds can be all it takes. Yeah, right? this time it didn't seem True. like five seconds. Like the 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 streets yeah. seemed like maybe yeah, thirty yeah, that, or forty seconds were created difference. in just the first few minutes <laughs> of the dungeon. I'm just saying, technically, yeah. yeah, they were up to play against a team where it was closer. They could shave up even a couple more seconds, right? Chatting five you seconds. You are correct. <laughs> all so, right, so DOS twenty four coming up with the old uh, inspiring quaking tyrannical combination mm, i feel like lovely. of the three maps that are in this series this has to be the one that donuts are most able to take a win in because that spires again for monka yesterday looked so insane so uh, this is definitely their best shot of at least making this a three game series we don't know too much though about uh about what is what it's going to look like for the teams right yeah have we seen either yeah, of them in this place time? yeah not yet we didn't DOS? see it at all yesterday yeah yeah do you feel like don'ts and spare those in that position too, where it's like uh, you, you don't want to be in a position where you're in the same uh, situation that you were yesterday against Bal Baldi, where you're kind of hoping they make a mistake and like that's your win condition, right? Is if the other team messes up, because obviously that's not going to win you a global finals. But um, if they play it cleanly, we'll see what they've got for it. And and I guess uh, no one would be surprised to see the series get tied up. I mean, most of the fans expected Donuts and Despair to win this one, even so, we could go to the distance. It's it's interesting because like uh, with the the group of players that Monka has, they have like Crims on Hunter more often than not, Maystein on uh, Warlock and RX on that Windwalker Monk. Where Donuts of Despair, I, I think that they have like a class advantage with the people that they have uh, on their default classes. Whereas like with Monka, if any if at any point they're able to flex into that um, to flex into that mage play with Prims being that long-standing mage main, I think that that gives the Monka like a pretty distinct advantage. And I think that that definitely helped them in the streets is that Prims is just known for being a sick mage. Whereas Donuts of Despair is probably just a little bit better on default compositions. So can you bring the mage to the other side then? What Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You will not be bringing that. I mean, a monk would be right. Nice. Yeah, hey, what is that? Sorry. Mm. Oh, oh, hey, I'm all right. right. <laughs> oh, mind if I nice. Do. Hey, congrats to. Oh, uh, they sorted it alphabetically now. I hate what, it. But Nagura is above <laughs> Zyro now too. Yeah. It's it's just they make a qualitative decision whenever mm. people have the same score about who's better. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sure I've, they do. I'm sure they I've do. Escaped. I've oh, escaped Nagura the Pepe zone. I'm, I'm happy. In our green room text, the guru is like, let's go. <laughs> All is right with the world. I was like, Tettles, you have Monka winning this series, and I do not. And I, I believe oh. soon you will be taking that gold medal and uh, not handing it back. <laughs> See, the problem is I can't even get points because I didn't think these matchups would be happening. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm I out. Don't, I don't even know who I had. My bracket was so messed up. <laughs> Well, um, oh, yeah, it's well, kind of it's kind of like soon. an MDI dungeon, right? Where when things go wrong at the start, they get wrong the whole way through the rest of it, right? Because uh, <laughs> yeah, the foundation is bricked. It's like necrotic oh. wake, but you used your exactly. Items. Yeah, you, then you don't have your weapons <laughs> for the rest of the dungeon. Uh, painful. My echo trajectory is good. Hmm. So wait, how did you uh, catch up to me? Did you have echo two o? Yeah, I had echo two o. Oh, Earlier. okay. I see. I see. The, I see what happened now. <laughs> I don't, oh, I don't, you didn't I have Echo 2 though? Uh, Tettles picked all two ones basically the whole way through today. So know, every well, time I a series ends that. in game two, he's Tettles losing points. Tettles was like, this is going to be a close final. Yeah. Everyone I... going three games. <laughs> I had Baldi beating Monka in this one. It's not going to go well for me. Because Baldi oh. isn't even playing in this. <laughs> oh. All yeah, right, well. well, less said about that, the better. Uh, map number two Wait. underway. Let's see if Monka can get the two. Oh. Oh. Uh, Tettles? Well, Question mark? At uh, Bozo Tettles. Alert. Bozo alert. Send tweet. Tettles, do you mind? Do, do you mind? You want to explain what's well, going my, on? Why is there a mage? My expert analysis said that uh, if Monko is allowed to bring <laughs> mage, then they will. And uh, mm, Crimson true. will do you a said great, that? great job on mage. I just didn't think and then you said a... no mage on DOS, so... I thought this was a Windwalker dungeon, I don't know why. I but I said the same thing, and we're seeing a Demon Hunter and mage. So maybe at this point it's just a comfort pick? Well, as somebody once said, those who can't do, cast the MDI. <laughs> okay. it's 
So we're gonna go in both teams with the woe yeah, going straight for bosses, it seems, but actually you are right. Donuts and Despair is on their way to the Night Fae part of the dungeon, whereas Manga has decided to make their way for her car, actually going really big here, utilizing that urn on the right side of the screen, probably. Here it is. I'm gonna keep it real, I'm gonna keep it real with the viewers at home. We've seen difference in routing in the other side, basically the whole entire expansion, and I'm still not sure which side is faster, <laughs> left or right. And it's been this way for basically the whole entire expansion. There was sure. some stuff with Prideful where like uh, some some routes were better just because of Pride timings. Now I'm sitting here and I still just do not know which route is faster. Donuts of Despair on the left side of your screen doing an absolutely massive pull into this urn. They have grabbed the whole entire Arden Wild Wing. Uh, that urn does actually pierce through the inspiring um, CC reduction, mm -hmm. and it looks like they're not even using it. They're they're still just they're just killing this pack straight up. Yeah, I mean they still have it. They could use it at the end if they wanted to. Yeah, oh, see, so Cryptix is using it now. The thing is, if your Warlock is the only Night Fae in the team, and it seems like he is. You probably want the Warlock to like use their damage oh. and cooldowns and then only use the urn after. He's doing purple class damage, and I'm not talking about the good one. <laughs> Sorry, what? He's Look at how much hunter. damage he's... a Demon Hunter is doing. He's, doing demon he's on hunter 120k. Damage. Sorry? <laughs> that was Ooh. a meta into this huge pack. Sinful brand applied to every creature in this pack. Okay, so Beautiful far. Demon Hunter damage. The car has been engaged by Manka, and, and we were looking at the Donuts of Despair massive pull. Manka's pull on the right side of your screen, by the way, was also incredible. They they grabbed the whole entire uh, Hakar area's trash. They pulled it straight into the urn. They used the urn instantly because uh, the inspiring with the Hoodoo Hexers can cause a lot of problems. Manka late lusted uh, Hakar, and that allows them to get multiple uses of like that lust timing on these blood barriers and i i really like what monk is doing with this mage pick as well they're able to kind of just burn this boss and i wonder if they're able to skip like an additional blood barrier they would have over something like if you brought the windwalker monk to this dungeon and now look at this high priest that monk has uh, that's just wandered on in that woe drifter now has also been mm -hmm. summoned for monka they need to be Beautiful. getting Hakar killed off here look at Hakar's uh, energy is at 100 percent Oh, that's they're getting another oh, they get one, but... Oh my god, they're so sick! Uh, they used what? defenses, made sure they, they didn't get it too high, but uh, yeah, that was really close. They're now killing off the high priest so they can actually utilize that woe buff. Then on the left side of the screen, we're also seeing that Bloodlust getting popped on Dilarxexia as they now have her on 50%. There is one Matriarch in the pool as well still, now finished off to make it a little bit easier on Yip as Monka make their way for the next big pull. So for those who don't know, the way that Monka canceled that blood uh, that blood barrage is if you do enough damage to the like first kick of the shield um, that comes out on her car, her car will immediately cancel that blood barrage. And Monka held some globals, they instantly canceled it. That is, that is a massive time save for them, by the way, the fact that they were able to get that dealt with. Beautiful, and now they're gonna go for a little bit bigger trash pull, but since it is tyrannical, shouldn't give them too many problems. Hopefully there's a lot of group damage going out as the enraged spirit was doing some shenanigans here, but they should be able to finish it off one more time. They're gonna get some enraged mass, but should be fine to kill before he channels another time. Donuts and Despair now have the Alexia down to 10%. They need to jump up one more time, but so far doing a fantastic job dealing with the debuff here, making sure nobody takes too much damage and they should be finishing this off. And just have a look at the trash percent now. I mean, of course, Monka uh, already a little bit more of the walkway done, but 32% one boss, whereas Donuts and Despair 50% one boss. So, I don't know, depends on if they can be quick when it comes to walking around DOS, since it's just a big, big dungeon. If you can get woe skips wherever, then maybe Donuts and Despair Route is the one I like better here. Monka snapping these uh, slimes towards the mana storms. We saw them engage them, and this is something that we've seen a couple of times, the sentient oils uh, being snapped into this room. It just makes for this pull to be a lot more efficient here as you do see 
Now Monka has summoned that Urgis Mantler on the left side of your screen. Donuts and Despair finally leaving the Ardent World wing. They do have 51% enemy forces, so that is a major difference between these two teams. They didn't grab a Woe Drifter buff to get out of here, so they're having to walk at just normal speed. That, that feels really mm, that's slow. That's what I meant, right? Ah, that hurts. You really do not want to be like normal speed walking through this dungeon. It's just too big, it's too far, it's too wide. It doesn't it doesn't spark joy, but this urn sparks a stun, so they will be able to deal with this spirit easily. Whereas Monka has Millhouse down to 50% and should be able to go for Maleficent. Yeah, she's down already, so uh, let's see how much they can shave off. 24 Tyrannical. Ideally, you only want two phases here. I don't think you can one phase it anyway, so you need to make sure that your damage is split in a smart way. You don't want to kill Millhouse before you have Maleficent in kill range, else your tank is going to get absolutely smacked. But so far, getting her down to around 50% seems good. Do you think, uh, not to look ahead a little bit, but do you think that on Moizala, either of these teams are going to be able to one phase this boss on a 24 Tyrannical? Mm, yeah. I do. It, I think it's really close. Warlock is notoriously awful at uh, killing those those images on um, on the final boss here. I, I think I think it's gonna I'm, be really really close. I'm a little bit scared for Anarchy because even with like Sinful Brand being a really strong single target, yeah. it, it could be a little bit tough. Uh, I'm I'm actually I wanted to look what uh, what trinkets. Anarchy is okay. running, because maybe that helps. You can do that, and right now we have the left side of the screen. Donuts of Despair have, has evened it up. Uh, they have pulled the Mana Storms. Look at the count difference. I think that that's the biggest thing between these two teams. 59% enemy forces for Donuts of Despair versus 37% for Monka. But do not be alarmed. Monka's going to be able to get an insane amount of their count in that Ardent Wield wing. And so even though both of these teams are effectively halfway through the dungeon, uh, mm -hmm. one of the sides is very count heavy. Um, in that Arden World area versus the Hakar area that Dungeons and Despair has to still get through. The Hakar area, incredibly technical, and I, I'm really, really worried about Dungeons and Despair's ability to be able to get those, that Hoodoo Hexer pull that Monko was able to uh, get dealt with. Yeah. That's going to be something that we have to watch for Dungeons and Despair because that's super scary. Yeah, but at the same time, Monka, of course, still having uh, the Arden Wield wing open, they have a lot of trash to chew through. And if they deal with it, how they dealt with the trash around Venom Blade yesterday, then they're going to be a lot quicker for that part of the dungeon, just with their sheer throughput they have. They, I mean, we did see the Demon Hunter using the Metamorphosis on Donuts and Despair side there, doing, I would say, pretty good damage, 120k peak. Um, if Crims can do more than that, then maybe they might be quicker there. That would be really good for Monka. All right, and now we have Monka here having killed off uh, the Mana Storms. They've pulled this Woe Drifter into this Arf Arf pull. I think that this makes a lot of sense for them. They're going to be uh, getting this Woe Drifter buff. They're going to be leaving this area here immediately. They're not going to pull any of these other mobs. Most of these mobs are deemed really inefficient, like the Lubricators and stuff. They're, they're pretty mm -hmm. bad, so a lot of teams skip this Mana Storm wing just because you have to do the like pulls like one mob at a time more often than not, or you can only get mobs realistically. I'm interested to see if Monk is going to grab this pack right now, or if they're going to grab it after they come out of the Arden Wild area. And it looks like they're setting up to get this pack engaged before uh, they make their way there. Yeah, and uh, I'm just looking at cooldowns to see if anything's ready. Combustion should be ready in a couple of seconds. Um, but yeah, maybe that's just the way they want to do it. Get another woe to be really quick there. Could be the angle. I, I actually. The more that I've been watching this, I think I've, the more that I've understood like what the Fire Mage is doing. So the Fire Mage here, realistically, the, the reason that they're not bringing the Windwalker Monk is because it's a 24 Tyrannical. They don't need much more AoE damage, and they value mm -hmm. the amount of single target damage that the Fire Mage has been providing to the group. And that's realistically all he's here for, is to just make sure that he's doing the most amount of single target damage. And like we saw it on Hakkar. I think that uh, the Mage like saving procs and dealing damage to him and like skipping one of those Blood Barriers was an absolutely integral part of their strategy. Yeah, I, I agree. And then, like we said before, Crims being a mage main, 
of course plays into that as well, right? But Donuts and Despair now should be able to finish off this boss, and it feels like they're taking really, really long here. But I want to see what Monka is doing. They're rounding up the first pull here, and it could be the only one that they're doing from the size of it. That is a massive pull. They basically pulled everything that was available to them in this whole area, and you can see how much damage is coming out of this team. Crimps on the night they now opening up the urn, making it a little bit easier for the team to DPS as now everything is locked into place and they can just annihilate what's in front of them. Maystein on 250k, followed by RX on 220k. They're blasting this. Yeah, Maystein is also allowed to play uh, that Kyrian Destro Warlock because Crims is bringing that Night Fae buff like you uh, were talking about. And I, I really like the ability because the Mage is able to dump most of his damage from his Combustion very early on into the pack and then click that Lantern so much faster than whenever we saw Cryptics click it for Dunnets and Despair. And I think Monka has just taken a lead in terms of trash count. And I, th I feel like they're substantially ahead right now. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I would agree with that. They still have to chew through some of the trash here, but uh, yeah. it shouldn't take them too long. Whereas, uh, yeah, Donuts and Despair still have a little bit more in front of them, and one of these groups is the Hakar Thrash, like you mentioned, which isn't easy. You have the urn, but it still is a little bit annoying, so let's see yeah. how they do with that. They're skipping past all of the trash on these platforms. You're deciding not to go with it, at least this time oh, running right. with the oh, Ropa. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Oh, that's so, not good. Uh, th those, uh, oh gosh, the... They battle rest. The Spritelings, I think is what they're called. I don't remember the exact name of them, but they started channeling on RX because nobody was in range of them. And it just ended up killing him off. That is so unfortunate for Monka. They did commit a battle res. Uh, they haven't popped their lust or any offensive CDs. So it's mostly okay. I, I, don't, I think that that was an unfortunate death, but I don't think it's going to be costly long term. No, the good thing is... Oh, oh Mo, Mo, Mo down goes down! Really bad. They need to rest him really quickly. They did do that, so he's back with the group, but that's two deaths on the side of Monka now. Ten seconds death penalty that they have on their side, which is not ideal. They are able to finish off the trash pull and do a substantial amount of damage to Xyxia as she's now down to 50%. But, oh, that was really unfortunate. Okay, so both teams do have their Bloodlust available. Monka is going to be dealing, uh, killing off Zyaxa here in just a moment. On the left side of the screen, we see Donuts and Despair going to ha into Hakar. I wonder if Donuts and Despair are going to commit their Lust on Hakar, because it looks like Monka is just going to have it up uh, for the final boss of this dungeon. And, and that that's a major strategy difference between these two teams, is just where mm -hmm. they're us utilizing that final Lust. And Donuts and Despair is, is pretty low on trash count even coming into this Hakar area. Yeah, that's true. So they still have these platforms out there that we just saw them skip by with the woe that they need Ooh. to play. So um, that's something they also need to get through. Whereas Monka, they can just happily go back to Mozilla and get it going. And like you said, they also have the Bloodlust. So let's see, Donuts and Despair not using that Bloodlust just yet, but doesn't have to mean that they're not using it at all. We saw Monka use it a little bit late, like you said, to make the most out of the duration for the Blood Barriers. So maybe that's what Donuts and Despair are also aiming at. They also have a Vi though. So it might be they're holding it for Mozala. All right, look at Hakar is at 100 energy here. Going to be casting that blood barrier in a second. If they're able to get through uh, the first tick of that barrier, they're going to be able to cancel that, and it and it saves them just an insane amount of damage on the boss for like high keys teams. It's really important that you're able to like hold CDs and stuff like that, uh, and be able to mitigate the amount of blood barriers. But the no lust for Donuts and Despair. Oh, oh they late lust. There we I go. Don't I don't mind the late lust on this boss. A lot of teams do mm -hmm. late lust on this boss, especially for high tyrannical keys. So it makes sense. But I think that I prefer Monka's strategy of being able to get this lust on Moizala, especially if they're able yeah. to one phase the totems with it. Okay, I'm really curious to see if they can one phase all of the yeah. totems, like you said, because that will be really important. I mean, technically, it's not something we've never seen before that a team has to go twice and like and go back and do one or two totems again. But ideally, you want to one phase it, and I think they technically have the damage. I'm not sure how the mage does, but I 
thing. Maystein has yeah. cooldowns ready. Mode Mode and Skylar definitely have enough damage together. And then RX Crimson. probably can also do it. Crims looks like he's going to have his combust up. So they, they elected to get yeah. the Vi Interceptor here. And so Crims had shifting power. Um, and he's going to be able to... I, ho I, I suspect he's going to be able to get enough CDR to get his combustion back up. And with that combust, assuming they're also going to commit Lust, which is what I think you and I both believe at this point, yeah. that should be plenty with that Vi Interceptor haste as well. Okay, let's see. Oh, Maystein that, goes that's down. Be bad. They that don't have really a battle rest. Oh, they, they don't have a no. battle rest. We are 16 minutes into this dungeon. They do not have a battle rest. They need to play two Oh, they're jumping uh, off. They're two jumping totems, off. Oh, but they're deciding to just jump. This is where Donuts of Despair can claw it back, makes. So Donuts of Despair yeah. have engaged Moizala with all oh of his trash. Goodness. This is so dangerous for them. But if they're able to pull it off, I think that they could beat Monka. I mean, yeah. Right now, Monka has 35 penalty seconds. That's so much time but, but the in the MBI. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they do have a lust, but they need to run back. They haven't even started the fight with Mozilla yet. He needs to respawn. They are now fooding up. Donuts and Despair is nearly finished with that trash ball that they're doing. They have a buy at the back that they need to look out for just a little bit to make sure they're not getting lasered from behind. But they're now finishing it off. Er comes in. Vi should be going down at the same time as they are putting porting to the totems but this is the moment where it went south for monka so be really careful now as they okay, manage to it. kill everything off this is so important for donuts and despair if they're able to one phase this boss then i think that they should be able to take it over monka if they're not able to one phase this totem area i, I think that monka is still going to be able to claw it back even with uh, that massive time disparity between these two teams and all eyes are on cryptics you see him, he drops his infernal they have that vibe up He's the one that it, it's the most difficult for him to be able to kill it off on this 24 Tyrannical because these sure? Visages have so much HP. Uh, I mean, Anakli is running Cage, so he probably also has that Tasty Axe ax buff that just gives you additional bleeding once you I-beam or crit in general. So we got hopefully all. they all made it. Okay, it looks like Donuts of Despair have all of their uh, totems clicked is what it looked like uh, whenever we did a quick pan around the room. And I think things are going to go well for them. We'll see if they have a four stack of that Blonde Som debuff and Moizala reaches around 20% HP. Okay, so we get the fourth stack of the refresh and Donuts in Despair, assuming they're going to be able to get this trash pack dealt with, they should be able to win here, Makes. I mean, Monka is right behind them, but like we said before, the full wipe and then the additional two deaths are what will do it in for them, even if they are able to one phase these totems. And it's looking pretty good, actually. Crims are doing a fantastic job. I think Maysine is also finished, and RX should be getting his done. Yes. Yeah. They didn't so, even lost it. Um, <laughs> They are all able to, to play these totems, but Monka is going to come back and uh, use the Bloodlust on this pull here. Yeah. But even if they finish just in time as Donuts and Despair is finishing it up, they still have these additional 35 seconds, which I don't think they can come back from this. So this should be going into Donuts and Despair's hands as they're now finishing off the Warlord. I mean, this is the first mistake that I think we've seen Monka made across the whole entire weekend. And look at this, Moizala is at 17% for Monka, 15% for Donuts of Despair. Monka still has their Lust available for them. Yeah. Are they going to be able to I would... catch up? Question mark? Hmm. I mean, What's going they, on? They, What's going that, on that, that's what I'm saying. They need to do more than just catch up, right? They need to, to catch up and overcome. And that by like 30 seconds. Is that a realistic thing for them to do? I don't think so. Is our is our lust tracker maybe not right? Because sometimes sometimes it gets messed up, but I don't know. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, it, they would have lost it by now. Okay, so uh, we just got confirmation. Monka apparently pressed their time warp at some point. I don't know when it was. Yeah, probably here, right? Uh, that's <laughs> Pro what... probably here. Probably oh, here. Oh goodness, there's a there's an enraged spirit that's uh, walking up to the right hand side of the screen. Yeah, but th they're not going to get in combat with that. The rangers have decided to stand a little bit more to the left, and that should be fine enough. But yeah, right now, both teams very, very close in terms of percent. But like I said, the death penalty 
will be the death of Monka for this round. So, um, Tettles, are you excited to, to go back to Spires? <laughs> ah, yes. Spires of Ascension, Skylark's home. It's the third season in a row, and that guy is still inexplicably very good at that dungeon. <laughs> one to one. How exciting. That's right. It, uh, it came down to the wire, and, and it shockingly, you know, Munka took a full wipe and still was nearly fast enough. But don't in despair. We, we talked about the win condition. Uh, when their opponents make a big mistake, uh, they can win the map, uh, and, they, and they did. They did this, do this one, Tettles of Profit coming through, predicting the 2-1 victory for one of these teams anyway. But uh, that was a wild map, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that was a, uh, wow, unfortunate turn of events there on the last boss, and really goes to show the importance of the preserving your battle reses as well, right? Like, had they not, had Monka not needed to use those two battle reses earlier on the dealer's eye exit bowl, they would have been able to recover that first death, and they probably would have won uh, the game in the series right there, but all three of those deaths, if any one of them hadn't happened, uh, that would have been the difference. But yeah, you can see, ends up just not being enough with them having to jump off, and I mean that the, just the death penalty is almost the whole the whole gap here. So Munka were sizably ahead, but not ahead enough to win after wiping. Was it was it like a routing difference? You think? Do you think? Do you think that going right early really yielded that much of an advantage for them? Yeah, it's really hard to say because it's really hard to to compare directly while the map is going on. Like we see, you know, obviously the big uh, Arden World spikes just at very different <laughs> times in the dungeon. Uh, yeah. So it's hard to to come up with like what exactly was the the gap right between the two teams uh and how to, how did it open does it have anything to do with say the mage versus the demon hunter one of the things i loved about the mage pick was that your mage gets to be your night fay your mage gets to be the person opening those urns gets to be the person doing the work and your warlock gets to just play Kyrian and do full damage but also not ever have to open an urn and just always be able to do full dps uh during those moments so that's definitely right. a big uh, a big thing in it. I think I overestimated how much uh, like AOE was necessarily required in DOS, and that's why I thought that, like the Windwalker Monk was going to get played. But the more that we ended up watching it, it made sense that both like the Havoc Demon Hunter and the Mage were the two picks between these uh, teams, and they were just bringing single target damage uh, for the group. And mm -hmm. you didn't have to play that Windwalker Monk because like the Windwalker is decent, but it's like it falls off on bosses oh, even still. Here we go. Yeah, so this is the uh, the difference in that first loss, as we said, between the two teams. I did yeah. like this size of <laughs> of pull, and again, the imp it's impressive that zero deaths were done in this in this wing by Donuts and Despair. Right, this is a very scary pull. A lot going on here. One thing about Hakar, uh, first of all, there was a delayed lust here for Monka, waiting until they had cooldowns ready. Another thing about this boss encounter. And you'll see it, I think, in one of the later clips, but I'm going to spoil it a little bit now, is the Blood Barrier cast. If you can break it right when it spawns, uh, right before... So the, the way it casts is it puts a little shield on Hakar, and then all these projectiles go out to all the players and all the sons of Hakar. And if you can break through that initial shield in the first half second, it doesn't continue to, to get bigger, right? So see it right here, Blood Barrier, and then uh, we'll see it later. We'll see it later. So t stay tuned for that when we get back to Hakar later. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a, suspense, suspense, it's going to be killing yeah, you for sure. Yeah. Teaser there. Yeah. Here's back to what I was talking about about the um, <laughs> about the the Night Fae urn technology, right? You get to have your mage doing this urn. Yeah, yeah the mage, you know, they're not going to look good on the damage meters compared to the uh, the warlock here, but it's really efficient to just have your mage do this click open, and then you just have Mace sign there with the the soul, the dark soul, the power infusion, everything. Okay, so here it is. Uh, watch Hakar here. Watch during this blood barrier cast whenever we get to the. The next one here uh, and you'll see normally you know that ends up taking a really long time you have to break through it it gets a big shield but if everybody saves their global and just presses a big damage global right into the shield you'll notice the boss basically gets no no shield at all and, and you don't have to spend any time on it so that uh, coming up hmm. any second now that sounds blood. horrendous on quaking by the way with casters yeah it is a pain for your casters as well there's the blood barrier and you can see it just breaks instantly right instantly yeah. broken through everybody saves a global for right then it, it was a fell rush uh with unbound chaos there that's the death for maystein that we saw was the uh the master of death frontal right in the middle of the room just barely one pinky toe inside the uh inside the damage zone that's all it takes for uh for a death to come out and 
Ever the team, I think, correctly jumps off, deciding it'll be faster to just go again with five players rather than try and, and, and get over the finish line, but not quite enough. But the thing I liked about Donuts, saving this trash pack for doing it with the boss, I actually think this was good out of Donuts. I think that the more count you're just doing with Moizala, the, the better you're going to be. So uh, saving that that outside of the Mechagon wing, we very rarely see that trash done with Moizala, but I think that looked rather good from them. I think I think that they lost a lot of time with like their woe drip. Yeah. Optimization. So they didn't like, they, have they woe missing. walking out of Arden World, right? And that's something yeah. that when you look at that, that's uh, it, it just feels like you can feel the time, right? You can feel the sands yeah. of time draining out of your hourglass while like you're, you're just waddling along little... that. Yeah. <laughs> you feel yourself getting older. It's uh, it's tremendously painful. Yeah. So I, 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 that's the downside. But then it does let you do that trash with that fairly easy trash pull onto the end of Moizala. So. You know, trade off. Yeah, give and take. I mean, that's uh, that's how you got to figure out a route, right? But uh, interestingly, Monka coming into this dungeon with only one death total on the weekend in the last three maps they had played. Uh, now, of course, this one goes poorly a little bit, and that one moment goes up to seven there. But Donuts and Despair gets the win. But can you really count on that same type of thing happening on Spires with okay. Monka? With Skylark is your tank? I, I'm I think that's excited a for this dangerous one. preposition. Yeah. What? Which would you rather have, better strategies or voodoo? Because it seems like Donut to Despair, they just cast a curse on every single team that they're playing against, and they have voodoo. I mean, we're out of the other <laughs> side, though, so I don't know if that applies anymore. Well, it worked in yeah. the Halls of Atonement. There was a oh, large amount of voodoo in there. That's true. Some yeah, this is, of, uh, Maybe they're just so intimidating. That some sort of supernatural donut. shenanigans. This is yeah. so, it's such a high pr uh, high pressure map here as well because the winner gets to go straight through to Sunday and the loser is going to have to come back later today fight their way through the lower bracket and uh, even if they survive there you know they're going to have a much more grueling schedule uh, instead of being up against Echo for potentially a ticket straight into the grand finals so very yeah. very decisive game that's coming up here on Spires Monka definitely have to yeah. be the, the favorite still. Their, their Spires looked so good. Their DOS was definitely better as well. Uh, but yeah, one or two deaths and the thing could quickly turn around. Donuts have had basically zero unplanned deaths. Their death in DOS was actually a uh, a death that let them play Troll for Berserking on their Warlock. Uh, and then they just had to, hmm. to die instead of Meld Skip. Uh, and that, you know, so that, that one death was there, but that was, that was planned. So if they can just avoid so, having any deaths, you know, that's still a path to victory for sure. I'm Monka. Dranus, you sounded like your Monka favorite here. Yeah. <laughs> Makes. I feel like I have to say donuts now, but I like out of logic and what I've seen yesterday, I would go with Monka as well. 1625 is the time that they locked in. It's the Noah? fastest time we have seen in Spires. I mean, you got you got to pick Monka, right? Because of the time Makes just said. Also, they had a zero death run yesterday on this map, so uh, you know, as long as everything goes according to plan and there aren't any crazy wipes, it's, it's got to be Monka. But you know Don't Despair is going to be right behind, so Monka can't afford to mess up, that's for sure. We'll see who takes it right now. Yeah, we're going in, and Crims is back on that hunter, whereas Donuts and Despair have also decided to go with a monk here. Happy, Tuttles? Well... I think that Monk is really good in here, and in addition to that, it's Sanguine, so it makes sense. Um, yeah. Monka having some casts going off. You saw Crims drop incredibly low to that Burden um, debuff that he has on him. And now you do see Monka here, Ice, Shining Force, and Ring of Peace, but some of those mobs are stuck in Sanguine for Monka. The Castigator getting a couple of ticks off, but it's it's not looking too bad. For Donuts and Despair, you do see that Sanguine Icker uh, healing making its presence mm. known on the healing meter as they... That's always the, the sad moment when you see the Sanguine Icker yeah. in, in the two slots of the healing meter, you know something wasn't right. But they also managed to finish off this pull and move on with what Dratnos called the airplane. I, for one, still think huh? it's an angel, but Monka will now start pulling. And we have seen them yesterday go into this, pulling everything into the boss and also using Bloodlust. It's one of the pulls every team has done so far and allows them to just do big damage on everything here. Need to be really careful with one, the Sanguine, and two, the Interrupts. So let's see how they do. 
I really like uh, Dennis of Despair leaving that mob Ooh. off to the side. Parrot. Ooh, Anarchy going down. Oh, and then a no. cast going off for Dennis of Despair. That's probably the rebellious fist from the Goliath. That's going to be a full team wipe for Donuts and Despair. On the right side of your screen, we see Monka here with their lust. They were able to get that pull dealt with, and it's what we were talking about. That pull is so unbelievably dangerous, that one minor mistake. I, I couldn't tell if Anarchy got meleeed by a mob or what happened, but then there's just like it cascaded out of control. The Rebellious Fist goes off. Now, I mean, yeah. now everybody is looking on the right side of the screen. This is Monka's game to lose here. They... They have to make sure that they continue to play consistently and avoid basically a full team wipe. Yeah, so the good thing is Donuts and Despair apparently haven't used Lust yet. So uh, maybe not everything has been full sent and they still are able to finish off this pull quite quickly now. But they are running against the timer, being 30 seconds behind per default now. And it seems like they decide to go a little bit slower. Oh! Eating my words, they are pulling the boss in now, bloodlusting, using all of their cooldowns, and hopefully they can maybe catch up to Monka here. But Monka already has Azulus down to zero and Kintara to eight percent. And if they play the same route that we saw them do yesterday, they're just gonna go to the right side and play so, the kitty cats. So Monka didn't look perfect on this poll. Look at look at the sanguine healing they had on the boss. Like they they ended up mm -hmm. healing Kintara. I, I think it may have been three ticks, so uh, fifteen percent, which is it. That is a sizable amount of healing um, that just went off there. However, Donuts and Despair's mistake far greater. They had to take that helicopter uh, back across the platform as well. Helicopter. Uh, well, yeah, it's a what helicopter. is it with you and Dratnos? An airplane and a helicopter? Well, it's, it's clearly not an airplane. It's clearly a helicopter. Okay, I, I'm pretty Anyways. sure Chad's with me on this. It's an angel. But uh, anyway, Donuts and Despair now finishing off Kintara and Azulis. And, but they are behind here. So they might be able to shave off time in like a routing difference? Question mark? We saw Monka's uh, route yesterday, so I'm phrasing this very carefully. <laughs> Maybe there is something we don't know yet. I don't... If I'm Monka, I don't know if I'm altering my route at all. <laughs> no, no, no. Monka will play the same route, but maybe Donuts and Despair has a better one? Maybe. <laughs> it, it, I don't know if they have a, a better enough one to overcome six deaths, but uh, yeah. we shall see. Mo Donuts and Despair also doesn't have their battle res available to them as well. So any more mistakes, like any other deaths, uh, they're, they're not going to have that leeway. Where Monka here, they do have their battle res available. Battle reses are generally uh, difficult to use in Spires of Ascension, I will say, because like a lot of the time, there are a couple of pulls, like this pull in particular that Monka is dealing with. If you have one person go down, it could just spiral out of control so quickly because like, if you miss a Goliath kick or if you uh, mess up a knockback oh, or something like that. Oh, beautiful Shining Force. That was a perfect Shining Force, by the way. It, it just can spiral out of control so quickly. And that was a great touch of death. For, oh my goodness, that Sanguine management from them was unbelievable. Yeah, that was really beautiful, exactly what you love to see, and something they had done perfectly yesterday as well. So I was a little surprised to see that much Sanguine healing on the first boss, but they are going over now to the next pack. And the last time we saw them tread very carefully with these packs here, because they set them up in a way where it is the easiest to deal with all of the interrupts. So they're going to do the same thing now, waiting for the pad upstairs to come back at the right time and now they're going to full send it pull everything together the ether divers are in there the pack from the stairs is in there the goliath is in there just everything spirit oh some of the ether divers are still coming but they managed to be in there so uh, yeah big damage and now for manka in comes the ring making sure the sanguine doesn't do too much here the group is taking so much damage but they are dealing with this Pretty well. Oh, oh, the skirmisher stuck, uh, stuck in the sanguine. That skirmisher got healed all the way to full. I mean, this is why this pack is so obnoxious to deal with. And if you don't deal with it, basically perfectly, you you can just have any amount of mismatch damage, and just that skirmisher ended up getting healed to full. Now it has to have uh, priority DPS. I, I think that I mean that's going to cost yeah. Monka somewhere in the range of what. 20 to 30 seconds by itself. I mean, Sanguine mm -hmm. Icker is their top healer here. Does the Sanguine Icker stream? 
does the Sanguine Icarus stream. Uh, yeah, maybe they can rename to that the next time they compete in the Omni Eye. It uh, would be a familiar name coming back in, in some way. So they are able to finish that poll. And like you said, I think that was a significant time loss for them, but oh. they will be able to continue Whoa, here. Drifter, expiring soon, please. <laughs> okay, they're fine. <laughs> it expires in one second. Ah, right on time. Yeah. yeah. That was very close, but they managed. So now on to Ventanax. Of course, not pulling too much uh, onto this because everything around them is a squad leader and we do not like those. So will the only Ventanax and the Relic that they were dealing with getting that vibe up in now. So doing the damage that they can. Apotheos is getting popped by mode mode here, trying to do a little bit extra damage with the smites and uh, Donuts and Despair are on the same pole. The Goliath sitting comfortably outside of a Sanguine, but uh, yeah, maybe they can do better than what Monka did since their Praetor healed so much. I I mean, they're definitely going to be able to claw back some time, but I, I think realistically this is still very heavily Monka favored. Monka is going to yeah. have Ventanax down before Donuts and Despair even get Ventanax pulled is what it's looking like right here. Um, ooh, Krim's Chris? dropping unbelievably Please. low. But well, you know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is it really fine? <laughs> oh, that was really well, scary. But Crims managed a... to survive. 7% remaining on Ventanax. If you take a look at the deaths, there's still a zero next to it. So yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah, -ish. yeah, yeah it's, it, it's fine ish. Fine, fine ish. A helicopter, fine ish. So Donuts and Despair now also on the Ventanax platform will skip past using the Woe and the Woe is running out as they go past. They oh had God. to use Invis pots as well, making sure they make it. Uh, but they were, you know, on top of their game, making sure they had them ready where they needed them. So that's good. And now they can also start the boss fight. So. Uh, yeah, they're actually so much behind. What do you do if you're if you're donuts and despair here? I mean, is there is the any pull like that you can do that's like more daring? Uh, so technically yes. So what Monka is gonna do here with their pull on the right side of your screen? We saw perplexed. Okay, so Monka does it in like one and a half pulls. I, I say half because they do the uh, the second one like into Orifrion, so it's like less bad. Mm -hmm. But we saw Perplex do it like in one singular pull. Um, like all they got all of the trash grouped up and were able to deal with it in one pull. So there is precedent that Donuts of Despair could claw back some time, but I don't think it's going to be enough. I think that it basically the ball is in Monka's court here. And, and if they're able to get this pack dealt with, it's just this and the triple angel pull left for Monka to be able to deal with. And assuming they don't have a sanguine disaster and end up healing mobs to pull like these Justicars and these Hellions, they are in a great spot. You do see that uh, that Javelin is coming down for Monka here. Again, we have to watch out for the Sanguine healing. Once these mobs start to get incredibly low, we're going to see that Ring of Peace coming out. Right on time, we have that Shadow Fury as well. We do still have Lex Crims. available. Crim's going down for Monka, but all of the mobs are out of the Sanguine healing. I think that they should be able to recover this even with that one death. Yeah, they are going to use that battle rest, though, to make sure that they have all the damage that's available to them. They have a second one now ready if they shall need it, and they managed to finish off the pull. Donuts and Despair at the same time finishing off Ventanax, and I'm curious to see if they decide to, you know, go a little bit bigger, risk it, or if they hope that something goes wrong for Maka. There is still that triple angel pull that you already mentioned, which is very scary still, even though there was like some minor nerfs on it. So uh, maybe they just decide to keep on playing what they had planned and hope that something goes wrong for the other side. I think that you're just hoping, yeah? Even though this is part of <laughs> not the other side, yeah? I you're mean... just kind of... <laughs> You spoke about a curse. It wasn't my my frame. But uh, yeah, on to Eryphrion. And we will see Monka pull the pack that they're now moving towards into Eryphrion soon-ish. They will kill the Vive first, I think. Or not. Mace team getting into range here it, it before makes everyone else does. 
makes sense that they're delaying killing the Vi until a Riprian uh, is going to goes into uh, phase. phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it makes sense because they also do trash a trash pull on top of this. They do that warded. This this pack by itself really yeah. obnoxious, uh, and the and the fact that they're pulling it into this boss is unbelievably scary. And so now they have that charge stomp going out. A on phase is right as that pack is engaged, so perfectly timed. Look by at Monte the here. HP. He yeah. is melting. Yep, this is great. They have Lovely. to watch out for Sanguine. We saw this uh, yesterday. I think it was from Long Meng. They Sanguine healed this boss, and it's something that you have to be super, super careful of. Arifreon is getting absolutely owned by Monka here. Oh my goodness. I think this is the lowest we've seen Arifreon across this whole entire weekend. <laughs> it's just uh, uh, Monka did not came to play. They kicked uh, him out uh, of his <laughs> boss role. Look at Donuts in Despair. They have a new participant in their dungeon. Uh, they, they, he's, he's taking over the roller role from Timber as the main healer. It's uh, the Sanguine Icker. Woo! Welcome. Welcome to the yeah, team. Yeah, they also have Timber in that holy form back there. We'll be able to just okay. survive a little bit longer. Hopefully, they can kill the Hellion because it does a lot of AoE. But they should be fine here. Question mark. Timber receiving that battle rest instantly as they finish off the Hellion. But there's still a Goliath that needs dealing with. And Monka is on their way. But Monka doesn't have a spear anymore. They use both of them. And I think Donuts and Despair, if I saw correctly, they should still have one more Javelin to use Wait, on the Triple Angel pole. Really? Okay, so Monka knows that Donuts and Despair wiped. So they did, they did a Triple Angel yesterday. So Monka knows that Dennis and Despair wiped, and so they're instead ah, come on. electing to uh, go against the fans. They hate the fans, and they're double angeling here. We're taking away one of the one of the good stars, like a golden star. We're revoking it from Monka for not going for the triples here. Well, I mean, I I understand that they do it, but if they wipe the if they wipe the triple mind, angel, then we would be critical. However, if we do if they do the double <laughs> angel, then we're critical. I, I think that they're not winning here. I think that this is a fine play. <laughs> no, I absolutely understand what they're doing, and I would probably advise them to do the same. I just really like the Triple Angel pool. So they are deciding to play it safe, dealing with only two of these angels, and then the third one after. Donuts and Despair are still trying to catch up. Arifrion now also moving towards that pack on the left side, as they also have a Via Interceptor with them. But it will be it will be very difficult to claw back that time. All right, so now Clotos has been engaged by Monka. They lusted it by itself. <laughs> A really testament to how difficult this boss truly hmm. really is. Many bosses, uh, the many bosses in this dungeon have been uh, very very difficult for an incredibly long time, and they don't even need it for the the final boss here. They they just determined that they want to play it safe. They just need to make sure that they get through Clotos. Everything else is going to be fine once they do um, have this mini boss dealt with. Yeah, I mean, really, I, I cannot criticize them for for using everything on this mini mini boss, and they will now pull a Devos, and that shouldn't give them too many problems. Of course, they still have to play the intermissions, but we have rarely seen teams have any problems on this boss, even when it was tyrannical. Since this is a fortified key, I don't think. This is going to go badly for them. Just make sure you watch out for those run-throughs from Devils, and you should be super fine here. That's kind of what we were expecting, right? I think we said it before the series. Like, even if Donuts managed to, to go for the 1-1, Monka in that Spire's very scary perspective. Uh, is, is it true that if you bait the run-through incorrectly as a range, you just hate your melee? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is true. Okay. Okay. That's what <laughs> I was told. Do but uh, I, for some reason, I just had the irresistible He's urge to just bait the run through towards the, the edge of the platform. Edge of the platform? Yeah, that's I, a true Boomkin thing to say. <laughs> I, I just, did not expect anything less from you, Tattles. It was just coursing through my veins to make my melee the not have 100% uptime on the boss. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Anyways, so uh, Monka is doing something that's super smart here with the buy interceptor. Um, they're they're delaying killing it, and so they can get that, that haste buff once Devos comes back down, and, and so they're going to be able to optimize uh, the amount of haste that you have to basically just utilize that buff full time on the boss here. And you do see Maystein grabbing that javelin, throwing at Devos. So they they did have a little bit of time wasted um, in the intermission of having that buff, but overall, I, I think that that was a, a great play by Monka.
to delay that buy interceptor. Um, yeah. Going. And on the left side of your screen, we see Donuts in Despair here. They have engaged the triple angel pull. But does this feel too little too late for us, Makes? I think it kind of does. It for me. does feel too little too late. I mean, they still have the, the 30 seconds penalty more than Manka. So at this point, they should be equal if we want to talk about them catching up. Uh, they are committing that bloodlust, and I think they still have the javelin that they will use oh once God. they are a little bit lower. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't see them catch up. I don't think how that would be possible in in a realistic world. So a uh, second intermission for Manka happening right now. Uh, keep in mind, Donuts and Despair still need to play all of well, that as well. So I, I don't think there's any way. They actually it's don't also, use it, Javelin. It's also impossible to wipe on Devos from this point. It, yeah, with, exactly. with the Holy Priest and the Destro Warlock, double Dispel, it is impossible to wipe from here. There's no chance that Manka could wipe at 10% on Devos. I feel like you saying that so much will cause somebody to die from the run through. So <laughs> I would like you to to stop saying that so many times. But yeah, Mace it I, should be Mace very I safe. run through an ethical direction. No, unethical direction. But yeah, there it is. Two to one for Monka. There it is, indeed. Uh, an unfortunate early death for Donuts in Despair, but uh, in the end. You know, uh, Monka able to just keep doing things cleanly. Slightly less clean than yesterday, but it's still a very, very fast Fires of Ascension run. They will claim victory 2-1 in our second series of the day. They'll go on to the semifinals to face Echo, which is obviously going to be a scary match, but they seem uh, fairly well equipped to do it. Meanwhile, Donuts in Despair going down to the lower bracket to play the winner of Sloth versus Long Ming, which we'll see a little bit later. But uh, Dradnos, take us through that one. What, what did you notice? What stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, this looked, again, very good for Monka. I loved that call at the end of the dungeon. You know, just go go double angel. Don't worry about the three. Because yeah. when you're thinking from Monka's perspective, like, how do we lose this game at that point? The only way you can lose is by having the triple angel pull go wrong. So if you just eliminate that chance, uh, you go from 90% or 99% or whatever you think the, uh, the chances are of that pull working out all the way up to 100. And that's exactly what they did. The strength of that, it really was created off of this this first catastrophe for Donuts and Despair, right? Had this not happened, this would have been a, a somewhat closer series, but we ended up having Anarchy go down and then just a cast start going off. Uh, once one player's down on a pull like this, there's so many important casts that you just can't kick uh, and the whole group dies very quickly was, afterwards. That yeah. just creates a minute, two minutes worth of advantage. And Monka already looking so fast in here, you know, going onto these bosses, doing so much single target damage, getting those Vi buffs. Even Skylark there hanging out at a, a cool 20k here on Ventanax, uh, sub 50%. So, so much damage being put out by all the members of this group. This pull here, the, uh, the Spear Hellion pull. It didn't look quite as good for them as it did for them yesterday, but it was still very, very strong. We did have that one death, of course, coming through, but uh, not the not the end of the world for them. They were able to get that res. They were able to minimize Sanguine Healing here. You can see Sanguine Healing not showing up on the meters. Really good job of them maneuvering around and handling that. And then, yeah, as I said, coming up to the end of the dungeon, knowing that you're four or five minutes ahead and saying, you know what? We will give up one minute of our advantage here to avoid having the chance of giving up all five of those. And uh, that's exactly what they did. That's how they won the game. And Monka looks super duper duper strong. I don't know if there's other teams in this bracket besides Echo that are going to be able to beat them on form. But we will get to see that Echo matchup tomorrow. That is the, uh, the very first match of the day tomorrow. I cannot wait to see that one, actually. I'm really excited for it as well. I think that will be a very good pinpoint. And actually, I did reach out to Maris before today started, and I was like, you know, Maris, MDI question. Do you think what Monka has been doing so far is a threat to Echo Times? And uh, uh, he wasn't very clear in his answers, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was a yes. So. Uh, did, did he give you like a cat emoji and a thumbs up or like, well, what did he uh, give He you? gave me like, for anyone that's familiar, it was like the Monac S emoji as a reply. So um, mm. yeah, maybe a reference mm. to Monka, maybe just actually Monac Asian, so. <laughs> sure, no relation. Uh, but yeah, that uh, that is going to be great. That's going to be the first match tomorrow, as Dratnos said. That's going to be really fun to watch. 
Um, and we'll see. I, I think, you know, a lot of people still expecting Echo to take that one move on to the Grand Finals, but maybe we could get a, a Monka Echo rematch if they're able to bulldoze their way through the lower bracket if they do get knocked down there. But speaking of the lower bracket, we're going to start right after a quick break when uh, we'll, we'll see Sloth versus Longming first, and then Baldi versus Omega Lull. Uh, I think Long Ming's got a, a bit of a mountain to climb if they want to take out Sloth, uh, just based on what we saw yesterday, but you never know. Um, that said, whoever uh, wins that one runs into Donuts and Despair, and Ooh. then Perplex is going to be waiting for the winner between Baldi and Womegalaw. That would be a, a Group C finals rematch if uh, Sloth versus Donuts and Despair, right? Yeah, which, uh, I think you're which right. Went 50, me... Which went 50-50. Yeah. Like, Sloth ended up winning one of them, and, and then Donuts ended up winning the other. Yeah, that's right. Well... Uh, here are our two pickums for our two first lower bracket matches. We have a big advantage, obviously, for Sloth over Long Ming, and then uh, Baldi, pretty large advantage over Omegalol as well. So, the fans have uh, picked their favorites. Uh, do you do you agree, Dranos Tettles mix? Mm, yes, I would definitely agree with the <laughs> Sloth one. With Baldi, I don't know. It's like uh, depends on what they do. <laughs> I think... It could go the other way. I think Baldi wins, but we'll see. Really? I, I hmm. have this Womegalo favored, but not by much. Yeah, I mean, 60-40, it's close. There's uh, people picking both sides for sure. So, yeah, this is, uh, is going to be important for our brackets. This is going to be a, an important series of matches. We've got four elimination matches in a row, so it's even equally out. as important for the teams that are playing. Bongo oh, yeah. only won two to one, so they could uh, help me out with the points on my bracket. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> they got me. so. They got me. <laughs> it's mm. uh, the, the Tettles bracket that's uh, become the most important thing. Uh, not, not yeah, the we're all worried about the Tettles. No, no. I need as much help as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you need as much help as possible. I don't. There's like barely anything I can get right at this no. point. Look at that. Can I'm we just move barely on? above makes by I'm virtue sorry. of uh, alphabetical order. Don't mind if I do. Gonna rename to A makes. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have ten now. more points than both Doa and Mix. This is crazy. Hey, <laughs> hey, uh, well, you know, it's painful. <laughs> sometimes you get lucky. What can I say? You know. I just, you know, I had to be in favor of some of the teams where it wasn't as expected. Somebody has to be a fan of the underdogs. So you know, I could be a fan of them. I'm a when fan of the vote... underdogs. Hello. When you, you predict well, with your heart, you're not. you predict with your heart, at the end of the day, that's how you get to sleep well at night. I, you know? I don't think yeah. I picked higher seeds just straight through. <laughs> not uh, not cold, unfeeling logic like some people use to <laughs> so messed up. up. All yeah, right. I so know, right? You gotta, you, gotta have, you gotta have heart, right? <laughs> Well, we're gonna we're, we'll figure it out over the break. Don't go anywhere. When we come back, it's gonna be our lower bracket kicking off with Sloth versus Long Ming here on the MDI Global Finals for Shadowlands Season Three. It's gonna be great. We'll see you in just a few.
Welcome back, everybody, to the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals. That's right. My host is Doa. Uh, I am Doa. Do wow. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Whoa. What just happened there? It probably I'm was I'm the D&D curse. Either. I know, right? That Donuts in Despair striking back from the lower bracket. We'll get back to them in a little bit. Nagura Dratnos makes you with us at the desk. We're about to go into our first lower bracket match. It's going to be Sloth taking on Long Ming. Sloth sent down... By Echo, it happens. Long Ming uh, sent down by Perplexed, and uh, you know, we'll we'll see, right? Uh, Long Ming, uh, people saying uh, looking better than they uh, did the last time we saw them, but are they good enough to take on Sloth, Dratnos? So I think that from the performance we saw yesterday, Sloth looked substantially better, but I think that there's a good chance that it would make a lot of sense for Long Ming to not worry too much about that round one and instead focus a lot here on the lower bracket. So I think there's a good chance True. that both of these teams will have expected, hey, you know, it's pretty likely that starting off against Perplexed and Echo, respectively, right, we're going to end up here in the lower bracket, and this is where we're going to have to make our tournament run. So going right in, we've got the uh, the bands coming out here. Long Ming taking that DOS out of the, out of the pool. Sloth opting for the Necrotic Wake. So we're going to start off in theater, where Sloth had a, uh, a strategy in theater that was... Quite good until we learned about the Echo strategy, and now everything seems obsolete in theater that doesn't do the uh, the Pandaren jump tech. I'm curious to see if <laughs> either of these teams have adapted to that over the past hour and a half since it's been uh, available. Yeah, do you think that's possible, Nagura? How how quickly do you think uh, you can adapt to something like that? Is it as simple as just swapping the Pandarens and making the jump, or uh, do you think a lot more has to go to, into it? I don't think they adapted to it just because, uh, first of all, they would have to create the characters. I don't think they already had a Pandaren because you don't need it for anything else. True. Create wow. your UI. And then you also time. need to fix trash percentage as well because you're skipping stuff, so you need to get it somewhere else. True. So I don't think it's a thing they do for today, especially since they play against Long Ming, which I don't think they need the Echo Strut to win against them because I think Sloth already has a really good theater strut. For tomorrow, it might be a different story, right? They can do it for tomorrow, but yeah, if they only have an hour to practice, I don't think they uh, spent all of that time coming up with that Pandaren strat that I could have. All right, I guess we'll find out. Uh, Long Ming, uh, what, in your opinion, makes what do they need to improve on to have a chance today? I mean, we saw them in the Chinese regionals as well, and they are kind of the team that has bottom classes as their mains, but some of their routes just aren't as clean as what we've seen from a Manka, from a Sloth, or, or any of the other teams here. So if they can pick up anything from yesterday or today even, then maybe that's their angle, but I'm a Sloth fan at heart. Well, here we go. Here we go, indeed. Both teams getting started with a big pull into the boss. Lust popped as well by both teams. They are also on the same comp here, so Long Ming Despite using a lot of the Vengeance Demon Hunter in the Chinese regional finals, 
uh, have adapted over to the, the Blood Decay, the Holy Priest, uh, the, you know, the more typical stuff. And of course, this is a dungeon where that Windwalker does tend to shine based on the number of those sort of three to five target pulls and the fact that you are very interested in having a Necrolord player to click on those banners, right? Yeah, and we don't see any Fandarins in either of the teams, so we definitely know they didn't adapt to that Echo strategy. And uh, there was already a little bit of a difference in um, relics that they killed. Longming did go for the Ur relic, while Sloth ended up killing the Vi relic. And it looked like they had a little bit of a delay on the um, Enrage dispel on Desia. Because Desia starts chasing a person, gets a huge shield, and is basically Enraged. Can be dispelled with a hunter on both teams, but Sloth took a while, presumably because uh, Javier did dispel maybe um, the mob, the, the trash mob that also enrages, and then just didn't have it ready in time, which cost him a little bit of time. Still managed to finish off the boss quicker compared to Long Ming, though. Yeah, Sloth now going to be invis potting their way through the uh, Shackled Soul section. Long Ming looks like they're interested in pretty much the same here. Tank is standing and waiting for a little while. Maybe the tank is going to run through after the other, the rest of the group. Yeah, and actually grab all of these shackled souls. That is exactly what's going on. Whereas Sloth are only interested in about three of them, which they're taking on to this portal guardian. Is the tank even going to make it all the way through here? That's Perg popped, and actually that's a dead tank. Oh no, Maybe long name. Maybe he didn't have a pot ready. Maybe yeah, that's uh, seems like something you wouldn't want to do. But maybe if you accidentally uh. Didn't you? You know, you used your pot on the first pull somehow. Uh, then that would yeah. have to happen. But to me, that looked like uh, not how that was planned to go. Yeah, it's interesting because both of the teams, or at least Sloth, looked like uh, like they skipped that that first um, like area with using Invis pots. While we saw Perplex earlier, they they just ended up killing the Woe Relic on the first boss and then used that buff because the first boss is pretty quick. You can see 59 seconds for Sloth. So if you kill the Woe Relic uh, pretty late or decently late, you still have that stealth to just go past that um, first area in that wing. And I do think that is a really good strategy if you end up skipping those mobs. So you don't have to waste an Invis pop there. Yeah, there we go, Sloth now. A little bit of a, a little bit ahead compared to Long Ming because uh, Long Ming had that issue with their tank going down. Yeah, also Long Ming, you know, if they were planning to do all those souls earlier, may now be in a position where they're uh, going to be a little bit scuffed on their, their later plans, right? They might have to go and get those at a time they weren't planning to. And so we'll see how that affects them, if that was what they were up to. Uh, hard to, to be sure, though. Meanwhile, Sloth in a very scary pull here. They've got all of this trash onto this first Portal Guardian, a dangerous enemy, but they have taken care of it through the power of the Warlock damage and the uh, the Windwalker damage too. Almost all of the cooldowns, including all the defensive ones, you can see were committed on that pull. So a very scary one indeed. Yeah, so they have the Woe Relic that they finished mm -hmm. up earlier. Um, and they immediately go to this Shackled Souls, not even pulling the middle area. Possible that they maybe even skip it and still use the Woe buff to skip the last platform, because that is what Sloth's Theater of Pain strategy is kind of known for that they skip that last platform before the boss. But Longming having some issues as their healer does go down on one of these Guardian pulls. Yeah, they are going to use the Battle Res as well rather than uh, than standing and casting Resuscitate. So they're going to be able to get their healer back up, but no Battle Res available now for the next six minutes for Longming. Meanwhile, Sloth doing that, that patented Sloth skip woe around the side and avoiding that nasty and uh, inefficient pull towards the end. And they're going to be able to pull this first boss here with 32% count, looking for probably some of these Shackled Souls to be coming during the boss encounter as well, if I had to guess. Yeah, I actually really like their adaptation there to not pull that Bone Reaver, the mob that Long Ming is dealing with right now on that platform. Because, yeah, technically it's, it's somewhat efficient because you can pull the mobs um, from the left and to the right, slowly into the mob. But you can see they already cleared the whole platform on Long Ming's side, and the Bone Reaver is still pretty healthy, just because that mob has so much HP. So Sloth deciding to completely just skip that mob and deal with the smaller HP mobs, and then just moving on, is a really good decision in my opinion. That means they will have to make up some trash somewhere else, but uh, we'll see where they get that. Long Ming with the, the woe buff here are also potentially looking to skip. Yeah, they are exactly going to do the uh, sloth skip as well past that platform and towards the last boss of the wing. And at 38%, yeah, like you said, 
Uh, they do need 6% less from the rest of the dungeon compared to Sloth, but Sloth are grabbing souls and bringing them up during the boss here. Looks like Long Ming are also doing exactly that. You can see Fate heading over there and tagging some Jackaled souls. So both teams will be collecting some count during this boss fight and getting up around that maybe 40% mark from here. We also see a woe for Sloth, but also a dead a hunter. They have that woe buff now that they'll be able to get and use to run towards the next wing. I wonder where they'll plan to go. Yeah, this can uh, be really scary, this boss, especially if you pull those souls on top, because there can be uh, just a very deadly combination of possibly getting ha the hand plus the magic debuff plus a channel from that soul, and then you're bursting on top of all of that with the magic debuff the boss applies. Definitely lots of damage that can happen at the same time. It looks like that's maybe what happened to Javier on that Hunter for Sloth. But now with the will buff, it, uh, they probably go to the Gorge of Wing, uh, possibly even skip all the way and then do a boss pull. That is something, in fact, uh, I remember now that Sloth did talk uh, to somebody of the MDI production before the tournament and they said that this is one of the most scariest pulls they have in Theater of Pain. So all eyes on Sloth to see if they can execute this pull here where they maybe pull a lot of this trash here on top of Gort Shop. Yeah, that woe buff still has a good 20 seconds left on it as they're all getting into that Gort Shop room. The whole team is here and here comes all the trash as well. The boss hasn't been pulled just yet. They're going to group up, dodging that backle from the... Uh from the gas bag. Now they are going to pull in the boss after that first cast. They have to be really, really careful here. This timing can be very deadly if they're not uh, perfectly planned and when they pull the boss, right? If you have that, that fronty backle coming out at the same time as a grip from the boss. They're doing a good job here of maneuvering. Those bursting sacks are also going to be adding some pressure here. And luckily, nobody... Oh, actually, we have a Warlock getting hooked. Luckily, Warlocks do get to have a lot of defensives and... Uh, not risk death too much from that. The Ur is also going to help bail out Sloth against this big damage that is coming out from all of these mobs they're fighting. Yeah, Ur is definitely helping. And you can see, unfortunately, Hunter did get gripped through a uh, storming, getting knocked into the air there, had to use the disengage, but unfortunately was uh, disengaged into that silence zone. And a lot of the dwarf racials weren't ready at the start, so they didn't manage to get rid of that uh, bursting as well. So they had to stagger the mob deaths to make sure that it doesn't extend, which they did a really good job at. And then, of course, the Ur buff helping them out too. It looks pretty stable, but there are still some mobs left alive, and their tank actually just got picked up. Oh. Just barely managed to survive, did use the dwarf facial, but unfortunately didn't get rid of that bleed effect that he got from getting picked up from that chain. Definitely scary for Sloth, but things are also going poorly for Long Ming, who are just doing a more standard start of Gorchop wing pull. But they are having players going down and releasing and coming back to rejoin the pull, but that is such a scary thing to do. Very quickly, if that starts happening, you can go to a position where you actually end up having, you know, five, six, seven deaths all in the same pull. That burst cast going off as well, blasting the whole party there. Long Ming are up now to five deaths on their tracker. Somehow their tank hasn't died here. But everybody else, uh, it seems like especially their clothies, are going down multiple times on this difficult pull that they're doing here. And yeah, this is such a hard pull to execute, especially if you want to kill Wo, because there's so many spells that need to be interrupted um, on this trash pull alone. And then additionally, you also need to interrupt the Wo um, Drifter as well. So definitely very difficult pull. Their Warlock getting going down as well, up to seven deaths now. Um, on this pool, well, six deaths plus the DK death that they had earlier. So definitely a big time loss, unfortunately, for Long Ming here. As Sloth did finish up the boss, and now they're doing a very similar pull to Long Ming uh, upstairs, also finishing off a Wo Drifter as well. They have to be careful on their side because it's the same thing, just requiring lots of interrupts for this for this pool. Yeah, they do have enough, especially when you have that, that death grip, the mass grip, the ring of peace. You can use all of those effects you can see on these sludge viewers to keep them in the group and also sometimes to interrupt one of their casts at the same time. If you do that well, you can really minimize the damage. If you're thinking about saving time in here, you really want to make sure that you get the meat shield kick as well. And you want to get it instantly before it starts channeling down because then it will... Uh, yeah, you can see there for slots, great job on that kick. It's about one second, I think, of a cast, so it's a pretty quick reaction time. But if you can stop it from even getting that first tick of the shield, uh, that saves you a lot of time in that wing. This could be another potential really big pull by Sloth 
as they have that Woe Drifter buff, and you can see Malek on the Blood Decay just aggroing a lot of these trash packs as they're walking through all the way to Xav. They do have Bloodlust available, so they might be committing it here as they walk around the corner, waiting for all those trash mobs to come in. They did pull a Relic pack as well, as you can see. They are trying to finish off the Ur Relic as fast as possible, and then finish off Ur to get that buff so they can stabilize a little bit. You can see the mini boss here as well, plus all of these Arbalest packs. There's going to be so much damage coming in. And the boss is going to be engaged in just a second, too. Yeah, that captain mind-controlled here for Sloth. Ooh, but Malik ends up going into Purgatory even against this. So that is going to be one more death, and, and they'll lose their uh, their DK. they got to be really careful. Guardian Spirits coming out to keep everybody alive here. A lot of damage, though, on this boss fight. They need to get these mini-bosses taken care of really quickly here uh, before they end up dying during the boss fight as well. And the, the movement speed reduction from that banner is starting to hurt them as well. And that AoE circle actually is going to take out Javier there on the Hunter. They have to decide now whether they want to use the Battle Res. The answer is yes, but that means the next death could be fatal for Sloth. Oh! Yeah, they did also engage that mini boss here now, which is going to help them to get out of the duel a little bit quicker. That means, though, that this mini boss is going to be... Uh, Snapping up to the boss in just a second as well, so they're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, presumably, they might want to. They're presumably want to. Yeah, there we go. So there's the mini boss snapping up. They have to deal with this now. And Xav is on 25%. Uh, this can be still dangerous for them dealing with the boss plus the mini boss. Uh, I think they wanted the boss to be dead at this point, but because their hunter went down, they lost a decent amount of damage. So now this is getting pretty spicy with the mini boss and the boss. Yeah, that mini boss has that whirlwind cast, and you could easily imagine that lining up with when Zav, you know, grips you in, right? And that could be, uh, that could be very deadly. But they have managed to kill off Zav here. Credit to Sloth, they are doing a lot of DPS, and they were able to get that boss taken care of very quickly, so they didn't have to deal with it for too long. And now they're just going to finish off this mini boss by itself. That'll bring them up to around ninety percent count. We know they have a little bit more that they can grab as well, and then they just have to go to Mordretha. It does look like they are sending... Yeah, the healer is up ahead of the group right now, just starting that Mordretha RP, if I had to guess as well. So uh, definitely making sure you have exactly what's going on here. They get that Mordretha RP started and make sure they're not losing too much time. Playing that Priest, you can just jump down and levitate yourself as well before you hit the ground. Uh, and then they can rejoin the group and not have to wait for Mordretha later. Yeah, and as you said, they still need some extra percentage. Simkin's actually procking um, the pot here, unfortunately. That's going to cost them a little bit of time and might actually go down to that AoE. Never mind, the pot is immune. And <laughs> the pot is actually like weird sometimes. Like yeah. some abilities that you think are not going to kill you are killing you. And things that uh, you think are going to kill you do not. So uh, a little bit of a hit and miss there. But unfortunately... Uh, fortunately, he did stay alive, as they now go up to Murdratha, and they need an 8% trash still, that uh, they maybe snap up so, to the last boss here. Yeah, uh, I think it will be... another mini-boss? Exactly, I think it'll be the other yeah. mini-boss, and then maybe if they need it, they can release the Ancient Captain as well, but I'm not even yeah. sure they need it. They, they might have enough just off of the other mini-boss. So that is exactly what Malik is doing right now. Grabbing that mini-boss, and now grabbing Murdratha, and we expect in about one second here, there's going to be a mini-boss joining this party. The Ancient Captain actually has been released. Are they re-controlling it, or are they just killing it right now? Looks like they are just killing it right now. So all these mobs... Oh, no, re-controlling it. Okay. Yeah, just making sure that they don't have that going off. And there is, indeed, uh, the mini-boss, too. Yeah, so they're going to be cleaving down a mini-boss. They do have a lot of... Um, or almost all of their offensives available here at this point. So they should be... Um, cleaving this down really quickly. They also finished off Vi as well. They have even an, uh, they have even more damage, extra buff because they don't have the Bloodlust available since they just used it on Xav. They do get that extra haste from the Vi Interceptor. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the time, it's actually really fast. The fastest time we've seen in theater was from Echo earlier with a 14.15. So uh, definitely a bit quicker than Sloth with uh, that skip that we've seen uh, in that Kulturak area, but still, Sloth incredibly fast, considering that they had the two deaths as well. Yeah, Sloth are definitely looking good here, but like you said, they're uh, particularly... I feel like, the, you know, every dungeon... Every dungeon is good for Echo, right? But then we get into these tournaments, and there are just these dungeons every tournament that Echo comes in, and you're like, oh, they are not looking particularly beatable in that dungeon. And I think Theater of Pain is going to be that dungeon for Echo this weekend, based off of the strength of the, the panda movement that they have. 
may be possible for teams to replicate if they want to practice over the uh, over the practice time between today and tomorrow. But I don't know. That's a big time investment to do that. May not be worthwhile. As Sloth just finishing off Mordretha here. Now they have to finish off the mini boss as well. And I think that'll either take them to 100 or 99, and then they'll have that captain if they are at 99. But it may just be 100 for them, and that will stop the clock at. 1559, so a minute and a half slower than Echo, but still more than fast enough to beat Long Ming, who have had a run that has had its share of uh, of disasters in it. Yeah, pretty smooth victory for Sloth overall. Obviously, some speed that could be made up when you talk about Echo, but that's any dungeon with any team, so they'll take the win there, and Long Ming uh, having, having some problems. What what can you say, uh, Mix? We were watching that, and it was just... It was, it was tough to watch because they had just kind of like, their tank ran off and kind of died by himself at one point. Uh, people were just getting hit by mechanics, it seemed like. It was it was rough. Yeah, it was a little bit messy. Um, we'll see some of the good and some of the bad in, in just a little bit. But I think uh, it's really hard to go into TUP where up until today, Sloth was known for having a really, really strong route. And, and try to replicate that, try to keep up with it. So uh, credits to them, and Sloth did a fantastic job. I didn't expect less of them. So uh, we'll see the overall, and then after that we'll have a look at what exactly was going on there. Yep, obviously the damage number is looking a little bit lower for Long Ming because they just uh, did not finish the dungeon, so that'll be having an effect on it as well. Um, but, you know, when, when you're watching the games, uh, you know, what 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 do you think is there i i struggle i'm trying to find something for long ming to improve on but it just seems like kind of a little bit of the basics right a little like bit of everything <laughs> probably so this yeah. skip i wasn't really sure what was going on and i think you dratnos and tells were all uh dratnos and nagura you were also like hmm, was this intended or what was going on but yeah. uh Sloth, of course like we know them doing really well with these big beautiful poles uh, perfect CCs coming in everywhere, then getting that Woe Drifter here. And actually, I was surprised to see Long Ming do the same skip that Sloth did, where they are using that Woe to just speed by the next group. And we're going to see it here from them as they get ported over, they still have the Woe buff. And then they need to be very careful where they are walking and they're just gonna go like around it, make sure they don't get in combat here as it's very, you know, uh, inefficient trash to play and move on to the boss. But of course, what I was really excited to see, the big poles in TOP speeding past everything, getting that trash to round up with the bosses, and then doing these big, big, beautiful poles. It's just the best thing in EMDI, if you ask me. So very nice to see that come back, even with these affixes, and them doing such a phenomenal job of that. Need to be very careful with these interrupts on these poles here. There was one meat shield that was going through, but nothing that could stop them. And then we also saw a similar technique that Echo did this morning, where they pulled some of the mini bosses around, and that was really nice as well. Yeah, so it was good for Sloth. I my question is because we're going into uh, Gambit next, uh, you know. You kind of have to expect things to go similarly to what we saw on the last map, unless Long Ming finds some sort of like second wind that can propel them to you know greater heights than we've seen so far. But I actually want to jump ahead and talk a little bit about Sloth versus Donuts and Despair. Maybe it's a little bit rude to do, but like I think okay. I, I, wow. I think we can talk about this a little bit. Uh, it is the calling? type of run. Sorry. It, <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? But uh, so toxic. But is the type of run we saw them put down on uh, Theater Pain just now, does that look comparable? Does that look like something that can beat what we've seen out of Donuts and Despair in their last match? And I feel like, in theory, it is. Yeah, I think it's very close. I think that we have, in this tournament, we have, like, a obviously, like, the Echo caliber at the top, and we have teams like Monka that are threatening to break into and equal that bracket. And then we have a very strong you know, just below that tier. And yeah. I think Sloth and Donuts are, are both looking like they are in there along with Baldi, Womegalol. So uh, I feel like those sorts of series could go either direction. 
Longming, on the other hand, I think that it looks like they are a little bit below that point where we've seen some strategic and execution challenges that the team has been struggling with, but we've only seen them in three maps so far, so Gambit may be a place where they could turn that around. This is a dungeon that's new. There's a lot of stuff that uh, you can do in here to speed things up, and uh, also potentially a place to break out stuff that is not in the meta in other places, stuff like the Fire Mage uh, can be potentially good in here. Maybe Long Ming has some interesting ideas, and it's a short dungeon. You know, one good idea can be enough to overcome uh, a time gap against another team here. Yeah, and Slough uh, also had issues in this dungeon before, right? They were mm. playing it yesterday against Echo, and they did have six deaths they wiped on the last boss because they were trying to pull lots of trash into Solia, and it just didn't work out for them. Not sure if that was planned or if they just tried to do that because they knew Echo was ahead, right? So they might not have to do the same risky strategy if they are against Long Ming. But uh, yeah, definitely lots of potential for things to go wrong in Gambit, especially with Sanguine. It is always possible, I suppose. Uh, and I mean, you know, again, it's not over till it's over. You know, we saw that yesterday with the Donuts and Despair versus Baldi matchup. Things can turn on a dime. But, you know, definitely Sloth coming into this one uh, as the favorites. But, and it, you, what you talked about, Nagura, it seems like that's something where they're aware of that. They can either say, all right, well, let's practice this a couple times and see if we can do it cleaner. Or they can say, you know, against a team like Long Ming, maybe we can actually scale back a little bit. You know, maybe we can do something a bit safer because chances are we'll have the, you know, additional sort of like time buffer to do that. So I'm curious to see how they approach it uh, after what we saw yesterday. You know what I'm yeah, really sure. curious about? So we have seen Gambit before and Echo locked in uh, 11 minutes 45 and Baldi locked in 12 minutes 6 seconds. So I'm really curious where Sloth places on that scale that Dratnos just explained, because hmm. I feel like they would be closer to Echo than to Baldi, but I might be wrong. So for me, this is really the interesting question here. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, uh, we won't know until we get into the dungeon, obviously, and the players all uh, working on getting in there right now. You know, no doubt, maybe, you know, switching making some pandaren characters you know you never know when you might need one but uh you know not that your pain's over maybe not but uh we'll see either way uh yeah i my prediction is sloth duo i mean no no secret there i think they're going to clean up what we saw yesterday i think long ming um you know i i would love to see them have a cleaner run at least this time um but you know we'll see i guess any additional points anyone wants to make on that one <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I do think, think they also had the possibility to look at strategies yesterday, right? Because they already played Gambit um, yesterday. So it's could. possible that Long Ming looked at that as like, oh, wait, they do this. Uh, we should maybe try the same thing. So they had a, like a whole day to maybe adapt their strategy, at least in Gambit, because they knew it's very likely uh, a map that they're going to be playing and stuff. And Theater of Pain is a dungeon that we didn't see yesterday, right? So it makes sense that their strategy maybe wasn't up to par, but Gambit is definitely something they could have adjusted. Yeah, or something they could have banned as well if they were if they weren't yeah. if they thought they were definitely going to lose in here. Now maybe maybe there were a lot of maps in the pool that they were worried about, and so uh, there wasn't a, a great option for them. But on the other hand, you know we're looking at a sanguine dungeon. This is always the kind of dungeon where plans can can be good, but just good sanguine execution. If you can just do a run where everybody is playing out of their minds with damage priority and with knocks and with uh, grips and stuff, and you're not getting any sanguine healing, that creates minutes of time in uh, in a dungeon with this affix so it's definitely something that if they're if they're doing that well they could definitely uh take this to a game three that being said i'm also on the sloth 2 prediction train <laughs> uh based yeah. on what we've seen so far yeah it's hard hard not to pick anything else i mean you know long Ming, one thing they do have going for them is their name apparently means dragon's roar there's a dragon on this map maybe they True. could join forces I, I don't know. yeah worst case for them next expansion should be a good one for them so yep that's true. True. Change your name Pirates to Dragonflight. Pirates Roar, is it a thing? I mean, Time Cat and Hook Tail does. That one does, Dragon, for sure. Right? That yeah. one does. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I don't think Pirates roar. necessarily roar. They more like <laughs> sing shanties. But uh, Dragons Roar. So a Dragon Pirate would both roar and sing <laughs> sea shanties. So on that note, let's see if Long Ming can tie it up or if Sloth takes a 2-0. Long Ming with some world markers already down in this uh, in this dungeon as well. So they've been in here. They've been practicing. They are now getting their first pull together. 
It's grouped more quickly than Sloth, so it looks like Sloth may have collected a few more Murlocs and some different Murlocs as well for this first pull. Very scary, very large pull for Sloth. Longming doing a good job here. A little bit of Sanguine uh, on the Giant, but not very much. Sloth, 3% health on the Windwalker, but they are going to be able to get through it there. Wow, that was scary. One key level higher, and that was a gamer down. Yeah, Lung Ming getting 25% trash account in that first pool in comparison to Sloth, as you can see, having quite a bit more trash once they finish up these last few Murlocs. But yeah, Lung Ming having a death already on the board, immediate release there, no uh, use of the Battle Rest saving that one because they are so close to that respawn point. And now Sloth did finish off the Woe Relic and they are moving on to the next Murloc pool that they are executing here, up to 34% trash now with that single pull they did at the very start yeah you get so much count so quickly in this area as long as you can stop that uh, fish stick cast that those uh the scale binders do right you just got to make sure that you come in and you you stun those on that cast if you can do that these murlocs die fairly quickly the sanguine is a little bit annoying in here though that's something they have to watch out for so good job so far by both teams to keep it from being too bad although you can see sanguine creeping up on those healing meters for sloth there yeah, Longming also had one of the Murlocs run away as they got low HP and then walked into a Sanguine yeah. pool and just started casting there, which is just very unfortunate uh, because you cannot control where they walk. You can, of course, interrupt them with stuns or slow them, but you cannot control the direction, so it definitely can be a bit unlucky as the Longming does reach the boss room first and does manage to start the RP a little bit quicker than Sloth. But Sloth has more trash percentage, so they don't have to pull the Guardians on top of this boss if they don't want to, which could speed up their boss fight a little bit, while Long Ming did decide to pull the Guardians onto the boss. Sloth needs some count. They're at 50%, and the number we're looking for here is 53 to be able to, to go to the rest of the dungeon and skip that last uh, Adorn Adorned Starseer at the start of that last boss room. So they're actually going to pull all four of these Guardians, which means they'll actually go well above that 50 they're gonna go up to like 60 percent count here and they'll be allowed to skip something extra as well later in the dungeon so i'm curious to see what that will be for sloth meanwhile logming are just barely gonna get up above that 53 percent line once they finish off these guardians gotta be careful here of the sanguine but they're doing a good job of managing it so far as they finish off these ads during the intermission and deposit the uh the runes into the correct consoles as well Looks like the boss is a little bit high percent for Long Ming, 73% in that first intermission phase. Not sure if they can get through all of that HP before the second intermission starts. We're gonna look, keep an eye on that, as Sloth did manage to get the boss 10% lower on their side before that first intermission, so they're gonna have a much easier time finishing the boss off before that second cycle, because if that second intermission triggers, that's just gonna be a pretty big time loss for Long Ming if it happens. Yeah, it's kind of surprising to me because looking at the difference between these two teams, I, I would have thought that like the Kyrian Destro lock would be uh, more damage on boss here, but it seems like maybe just Sloth put a better, did a better job of either, you know, optimizing their damage, not having to move from those various effects from the Guardians, uh, or maybe just focusing more on single target rather than on AOE and saving these the Guardian killing for during the intermission when the boss is immune anyways. That being said, Long Ming. Getting close here, I actually think that Sanitizing Cycle cast is going to happen for them. Sloth, on the other hand, is going to be really close. 30% on Hillbrand, and we're looking for the difference between the boss health and that energy bar at the bottom. You can see for Long Ming, that energy bar is full, and they have to do another intermission. For Sloth, I actually think it's also going to fill up. I think they are also going to have to do a second intermission. So both teams potentially missing a potential push uh, that was possible on this boss. Yeah, Sloth did move the boss all the way uh, into the corner, so the boss has a little bit of a longer walk into the middle, but I don't think they're going to make it as the boss is still on 12% HP. You can see they're starting to finish off those ads as well because they had hard to seat them, thinking that they would be able to skip the intermission, but then not being able to, they had to finish off those ads so they can put those runes into the consoles. And there we go, Long Ming now finishing off the boss as well. This really would have been a time for Sloth to catch up, uh, some time, but unfortunately just didn't manage to do the push either. So very equal for both of those teams, except the trash difference that we have in favor of Sloth. Yeah, so Sloth have traded 15 seconds for 6%, 5% enemy forces. We'll see if they can do something good with that as Long Ming are going to get started on this pull here. 
Sloth, I'm not even sure really what they're allowed to skip as a result of this either. Oh, Long Ming are going crazy as well. We haven't seen this out of, I think, anybody is running this pull forwards and taking it with them down into the uh, into the hooktail room. This is maybe kind of crazy. Yeah, this is what Echo did yesterday, and oh. uh, they pulled all of this trash room with this uh, trash that Long Ming just pulled as well. And then afterwards, they pulled the boss with only one pack. Probably because of Sangun, right? So if Longming manages to execute this, this is incredibly hard on the tank because there's just so many casters and so much um, t damage on the tank as well that cannot be possibly interrupted. You have all of these AoE stuns that help you out and they are actually melting. Sanguin is also a big problem here. As you can see, um, Braun and the Ring of Peace helping out a little bit to uh, gather everything apart, making sure they don't heal. And yeah, this looks really good for Longming. They actually executed this full really nicely. Yeah, we'll see what Sloth has as a reply here, but that definitely confirms that Long Ming have spent some of their practice time between yesterday and today in this dungeon, right? That's something that they uh, they yoinked and uh, improved over the time. Meanwhile, Sloth, they pulled that first pull by itself. Now they're fighting all three of the trash pulls in this room with the boss as well. So this is also a huge time save if it works out. But the challenge here is Sanguine healing. If you get some Sanguine healing on the boss here, this was not worth it. But if you can avoid Sanguine healing the boss, this is really, really big. And this is another very hard to execute pull by Sloth. You can see the boss didn't heal just yet, but there's still a lot of trash left to finish off. That Ur um, binding. needs to Great die in just binding. a second as well. Yeah, really nice binding to make sure the mobs don't walk onto the, under the boss uh, as they go down. So yeah, really nicely. Um, nice usage of all of the CC that they have on Sloth's side. Looking pretty good so far. They still wow. have to deal with some of those. That nice knock there as well. Knocking all of those mobs into the frontal from the boss. This was so clean by Sloth. Yeah, we don't even see Sanguine on their healing meter here, which is really good. No ticks on the boss at all. They've dealt with all of the boss adds too. This is uh, this is textbook, and this is going to propel them into the lead. They now have more count, and they're going to be killing this boss first, uh, unless Long Ming can find a lot more damage here. Yeah, and Long Ming, even though they did uh, pull the boss a little bit earlier compared to Sloth, they didn't have any offensive cooldowns ready because of that huge trash pull they did before. So they just dealt with the boss quite a bit slower. Sloth pulling all of this trash on top of the boss meant they're also sending all of those cooldowns at the same time. And a lot of the classes that they're running just have so much funnel uh, onto the boss as well. Uh, especially with the Dastra Warlock, having the PI just spamming that Rain of Fire, all those Infernals just doing boss damage too, not just damage to the trash. So uh, really nicely done by Sloth. And you can see the boss is melting for them. And yeah, with the trash difference as well in favor of Sloth, they don't even have to do those risky pulls anymore as um, they did yesterday where they wiped to the last boss. They definitely have to deal with some trash, but they can maybe leave some of those really dangerous packs alive and don't have to necessarily deal with them while fighting Celia. Yeah, so they can skip that first adorned star seer that everybody skips with the uh, with the relics. I think they could also skip one of the three packs too. Mm -hmm. I don't think they could skip the the patrolling five pack. Nor can you really fight Solia while that thing is alive. Yeah. So I think what we're probably going to see is they'll probably go and take that patrol into maybe the other three pack and then do the star seers with the boss or something or. We'll see exactly what their plan is going to be here. They're heading around the side. There's that first Star Seer skipped by Sloth. They're looking at the Relic pack. There's Mind Soothes going out, so maybe they're walking past this one. And there are those two Star Seers. Walking around those as well, and it's going to be Star Seer, Star Seer boss. No, it's just Star Seer boss. Okay, so they are going to be pulling a bunch of trash during this boss encounter. They have to be really careful to make sure that the mobs do not accidentally get pulled before they want them, but they are going straight into boss. This is a really fast way to do this, right? To just chain pull onto the boss. You have to be really careful of two things. Sanguine and accidentally body pulling those mobs during the boss mechanics before you want them. Yeah, the, another scary part about this is all of the mobs here in this area just have so many dangerous casts that need to be interrupted. You have the heals that can go off, and you also have the AoE casts that would just kill you if it goes off, while also having to dodge the Star Seeker's frontal, the Drifting Star, plus the Pulsar that you need to kill. And on top of that, that first phase of Celia, you have those two adds that spawn that uh, jump out and also need to be interrupted. If that cast uh, goes through, it probably also means that your group is going to wipe. 
So lots Ooh. and lots of interrupts you have to deal with here and lots of mechanics. As they pull this whole a trash bag past the patrol, it's actually incredibly scary. They have Bloodlust available just now. I think they might want to be using this to be able to deal with it. As everyone drops incredibly low, I think one of the casts might have gotten off there. Yeah, a lot of danger here. The AMZ is coming down to help keep them alive too. These mobs are going to start to die as well and they're going to have to manage that sanguine. You can see one of the ritualists bathing in a little bit of sanguine, but not too much of the end of the world. As Solia now reaches 40% and starts this cast uh, into the phase two, this gives them a little bit of time to just efficiently finish off the rest of the pack since they can't do any useful damage to the boss right now anyways. But now they have to actually hit these relics while that other Starseer is alive, and they do not plan to pull that Starseer. That Starseer is not needed for their count. They are just going to mind soothe it and hope they don't pull it. But that's a very th scary thing to do. Most times that teams attempt to do that, they fail. Yeah, and they didn't manage to get the relics done instantly, so they had to do another round of those um, arrows, which means they had a two-stack debuff that's a lot of damage to the group while those mobs were still alive. So because of the Sanguine and maybe some cast going off, it wasn't as clean as they maybe hoped it to be. And they have to be careful with this last Ritualist that is still alive because it looks like it's really close to the boss. If it does die there, it might oh. heal Solia. They don't want that to happen. Um, so they need to use SSC. I was just about to go down. I was so scared. And that star, the Collapsing Star, also spawning so close to that Star Seeker. Um, it looks like they might be fine, though, because of that uh, Mind Sooth that the Priest put onto the Star Seeker. Yeah, now the question is going to be, how are these relics positioned, and are they going to be able to hit the next one with the Hyperlight Jolt without actually pulling that mob? It's always possible if you do, like, a really complicated geometry, you know, big brain, mm -hmm. draw the arrow through it without getting too close to it, but that is tough to do sometimes, and it looks like they're maybe just going to abandon it and deal with it on the next cast here, but once again, we are going to see another go. Oh, this is definitely going to pull. Oh, no, it's no, not going to pull, they but they, ha they have two stacks oh, now. They weren't no, able to hit three it. Stacks. Are they going to hit it on the third? Yes, they this is gonna are. This going to so much damage. Wow. Three stacks of everybody. Oh, my God. I, I'm a bit confused on why the priest didn't get the arrow through on the first one. Because he just had to walk a bit backwards, right? It looked like he was able to hit it. But uh, either way, they did manage to finish it off, and now they have the Bloodlust available, available to recover. They have to deal with that last, uh, yep. with the last three trash mobs that they pulled here for the last three percent. And look at Long Ming; they only have the boss left. Of course, it's still a lot higher HP on their side because it took them a bit longer to engage the boss. Um, but yeah, at least they don't have to deal with that trash. Yeah, if Sloth can beat the next Hyperlight Jolt, they should be okay. But if they get to that next Jolt, they are again going to have to make sure that they... Actually, they'll probably just pull the Starseer and not worry about it at that point and just make Maybe, sure that they yeah. get that first hit. That would definitely be the uh, the smart thing to do. We'll see, though. Salia so now 4%. Uh, is it going to die like before it gets to that next Hyperlight Jolt? Looks like the answer is yes, and Sloth are going to punch their ticket through later into this tournament. They are sending Long Ming home, unfortunately. Long Ming, despite a nice run here in Solia's game, but, you know, definitely a, a team that, that can compete here, but they are done doing that just for now. Yeah, it's going to be a 2-0 for Sloth. Uh, really, uh, kind of, it was, it was uh, scary. It was a scary dungeon to watch from Sloth, but they got it done. But on the Long Ming side of things, that's probably the best we've seen them look all weekend, and unfortunately it wasn't quite enough to uh, push it to a map number three, but, you know, at least I think they can end it on a, a pretty, you know, high note with a clean performance. But Sloth are going to be the team that moves on to face Donuts in Despair in our next lower bracket match later today. Yeah, and I mean, I, I said we're all kind of expecting this, and it's a little bit unfortunate to see our only Chinese competitor get knocked out as early as this but i'm really excited for the next match and for whatever sloth is doing we did see them deploy that technique that perplexed stride but just comparing their 13 minutes 20 seconds to what i said earlier like the echo and um the baldy time it seems like they're a lot slower than baldy even like one minute and some more so uh, maybe we rated them a little bit too high Maybe, uh, it's I, I I do wonder what what do you what do you guys think? What a Dratnos Negro. What what do you think after uh, watching these last two maps? Was is Sloth maybe a little bit overrated right now by us? <laughs> I I personally 
actually already <laughs> thought that Sloth is maybe not uh, uh, comparable to something like someone like Echo, uh, especially mm -hmm. after I've seen Monka yesterday and Perplexed yeah. today. I did think that Sloth is definitely a little bit uh, below them. The now, it's also slipping. possible that Sloth uh, decided to. Uh, to practice a lot for the other dungeons because they were thinking, oh, it's Long Ming, you know, we don't have to put too much time into this. So True. it's also Kid possible toxic. that they just come up with an <laughs> insane strategy for some mm. other key because that is what Sloth is known for, right? They're this new team. Yeah. They're not maybe super um, incredible when it comes to like execution, but they're really, really good at coming up with these really new strategies in dungeons that we've been seeing by other teams a long, long time. So that is definitely something they could still do in other dungeons. Yeah, so let's have a look at what they actually did. So, of course, they did some big pulls in the Murloc area. I feel like we've seen these so many times, doesn't really matter. In Hillbrand, they did pull the Crackle Boys into it, the Storm Guardians, but they didn't manage to one-phase it. So I feel like that's where they lost a lot of time. And then here on Time Cap and Hooktail, Long Ming actually seemed like they had the upper hand for just a little bit with pulling all of this into Time Cap and Hooktail. But Sloth overtook them on this boss fight and just absolutely blasted it going into Solia. And that was really fun because we did see the tech that perplexed it um, play out without a full team wipe this time. So they are playing that Star Seer together with Solia in the first phase. And then they're going to grab some more trash from behind. Uh, while keeping the stars here on the other side, you can see it in the background, they will mind, uh, mind soothe it later to make sure they're not going to get in fight with it. And it's a technique we've seen in a lot of cups. And more than often, a collapsing star spawns on the stars here. Too close to the stars here, they can't use the relics. Uh, so they have to go for round two and three. And the, the, sure enough, happened for Sloth as well. But they managed to play it out. So that was really, really great to see. Mickey always going in trying to use the fate where possible to get out of aqua range with the star seer and there you have it that was so so unfortunate they decided not to go for the first relic because they would have shot through the star seer mickey was trying to get closer using that fade but it wasn't close enough so they did get that three stack which nearly killed them so really really tough but they managed to get it does yeah, it actually pull it. the star seer if you point the arrow through it I wasn't sure about that. That's a great question. I'm sure it and one we'll leave as an exercise to the audience to go test <laughs> yeah. in their next keystone. I mean, it looked like it would have, because they could have just yeah, shot it. Yeah, because that's why I was right? wondering why didn't he point it through, but maybe yeah, it does maybe, pull. Yeah. yeah. I think it does damage on impact, and maybe it does damage on impact for the Star Seer as well. Hmm. That would be interesting. Because then you could just bring a bunch of mobs and line them up to get. Shot by Celia, maybe on that phase. If that yeah, if that were the case, so I, mean, I, I feel like the mob does that doesn't much damage, hit. Doa. Now, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, but <laughs> most I, abilities don't right? damage other enemies, though, right? Like most right. enemies yeah. don't. So, but maybe just yeah. going through it would uh, get it into combat. I've, there are things that behave that way for sure. So that absolutely could explain that movement that Nagura, mm. you and I both thought was was weird. So, yeah, uh, yeah. definitely could be what was going on there. Either way, they were able to get it with three percent health left on somebody after that third stack, but no big <laughs> yeah. deal. So. Yeah. That was very had it, scary. Had it gone a little differently, though, that could have been the game three right there. You know, uh, Long Ming were right on their heels. So uh, very well done by Sloth to prevent that happening. But I still am so suspicious of any strategy that involves leaving that Star Seer like that because it just I goes hate wrong it. so I often. I hate it. I was yeah. saying yeah. to well, Doa in the green room, I hate this technique so much. They had to sacrifice so much. They had to to deal with it in a way where the healer couldn't do da any damage. Everybody had to use defensives. They, they had to really use everything that was available to them. And surely just playing the Star Seer would have been easier, right? I don't yeah. know. I really don't like this technique. I'm it's sorry. One of those I love things... Sloth. Don't like this. <laughs> yeah, well, like we were talking about, it was like, is this something that works really smoothly in practice all the time? And then it's just like, bad luck in MDI, you know, now you have a lot of awkward positioning. But it does seem like you're opening yourself up to uh, to some, some dangerous scenarios. But either way, they did make it through. 2-0 for Sloth. They'll go on to face Donuts and Despair later today. kind of want to but... see the cast or pick them. Can we... Are they updated we don't, yet? Uh, we don't need to see that. I don't think yeah, that's Yeah, I really want to see the no. cast. They are updated. I want to see them. Can we see them? I don't I think, think anyone's interested friend. in that. Thank you, production. No. 
Beautiful. <laughs> no, Sarah. What's Nothing to see weird? here. Oh no. Beautiful. Nothing to see here. So you guys had a two one instead of two zero. Oh. Mm. The Peppa laugh is not on me anymore. That's all I ever wanted. <laughs> I don't think it's ever going to change. I think I'm down there for good. Well, here's the pickups as far as the percentages for Baldi versus uh, Womegalol. Moving on. Uh, big advantage for Baldi. Uh, we'll see if that's warranted. I, I think I think Baldi's certainly coming to this one looking a little bit favored, but uh, Womegalol, they they uh, are a roller coaster. They do have the high highs and the low lows. So uh, I guess we'll we'll see. Do do we agree with this? I feel like most of us kind of agree with this, uh, this pick'em, right? Yeah, I, I have Baldi 2-1 in this series, so hopefully we'll see. Uh, but it's definitely one where it's like watching the watching the gameplay yesterday, I feel like these two teams are very, very evenly matched. So I could see this going 2-1 or 2-0 in both directions, right? Like I could see either team winning either map uh, for sure. Certainly could. I could go the distance. I didn't have any of the teams in this series. <laughs> so, well, oh, hmm, interesting. So I guess we'll see what the uh, points look like after uh, after this one then. <laughs> so I have to wait and check that out. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, our lower bracket elimination matches continue. Who will survive? Baldi or will Megalol? all? We'll find out when MDI Global Finals returns in just a few.
are back here at the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals. I'm your host, Doe. With me this time around are Dratnos, Tettles, and Zyronic. And we're about... Zyronic with the double microphone. He loves it. <laughs> oh, shit. I for here, forgot it was there. Here. Whoops. Uh... <laughs> that oh, happened. Wait, I need this one. Mine's, mine's squeaky. <laughs> wait, I have I a double microphone. I had a double microphone, too. Wait, how would it be? All right. Pure professional. I forgot it was there. Baldi versus Omega Lol is our next series of the day. Uh, Baldi getting knocked down to the lower bracket by Donuts and Despair after that last minute, uh, you know, failure to kill Zagar in, in uh, one one phase, I guess, between casts, I guess you could say, against uh, D and D. Uh, they were not able to capitalize on that. Hence, they lost the map. Hence, they lost two one. Hence, they're down here. Uh, well, Omega Lol getting a two zero loss uh, against Monka, who we found uh, is a quite a strong team obviously so we'll see what they can do but uh looking at this one uh Zyronic, like do you feel like baldy may have a sense of of we shouldn't even be here uh and then there's the fear that goes along with that when you're running a new team like omega law i think that's a really good way of putting it they definitely are a team that has gotten to lower bracket because they played poorly right they made a huge mistake on that inquisitor cigar and halls of atonement like you mentioned mm -hmm. and if they didn't have that mistake happen they would have just been in that previous match against Monka, right? So yeah, they're definitely in a spot where they're not happy with, but they're a great team. The problem is, well, Mega Lul also looked insanely good yesterday, only losing out to a Monka that just looked even better. So I think we're in for a banger series here. Like I'm almost certain that this is going to go three games either way. Yeah, it's it's scary for sure. We see our bans coming in. Well, Megalol banning uh, Necrotic Wake. That's one that everyone does not want to play this weekend for very obvious reasons. Spires of Ascension banned by Baldi, not wanting to deal with the uh, the Sanguine. That has been kind of annoying for everyone. So that leaves us with Streets, the other side, and if we need it, and I I would imagine we probably will too, Sanguine Depths. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, Dratnos, looking at our looking at our dungeons, looking at what was banned. Uh, does that give you any insight? Do you feel inclined to pick one team over the other now? Yeah, so I'm in a position where I had I had this in my bracket. I had Baldi 2-1 oh. over Womegalol, but I do not know how much I like that given the, the play yesterday. I feel like these two teams are somewhat evenly matched uh, when they are both firing on all cylinders. But I'm a little bit worried that Baldi might be a team that's more liable to, ha to have things go wrong for them and to have... Uh, have errors happen. Of course, it's a big amount of extrapolation from just two or three maps that we've seen each team on, so uh, definitely yeah. going to be something as well. The other question is, how much did these two teams plan for the eventuality of ending up in this spot in the bracket, versus how much did they plan to stay in that upper bracket and focus on the series that are up there? If there's a team that made a decision to be more prepped for the lower bracket uh, and a team that got surprised by getting sent down here, that could absolutely be a huge factor when we get to a series like this between two teams that are so good ind individually. It's just weird well, because I, I didn't expect Will Megalol to look as good as they did yesterday. Yeah. And, and, and so it's made me start to question myself because I also had Baldi 2 1 in this series. But whenever I watched Will Megalol versus um, the Monka yesterday, obviously it was a 2 0, so I didn't get to see a ton out of Will Megalol. But they looked a lot better than I anticipated, which has put me in a position where I, I think that Will Megalol is going to win this 2 0, even against my own Whoa. predictions. But Wow. All right. We'll so you're saying 2-0 victory because so prediction master Tettles with the best bracket right now. I think I'm wrong. Says it's uh, gonna be a 2-0 victory for Omega Lol. I I have a 2-0 for Omega Lol in my bracket actually. So this is one where I could pick up some rare points because I had them 2-0ing Donuts and Despair I, for this one. I don't know. The, the, it's it's one of these things that like the MDI. Whenever you see a 2-0, it's not always like you can have a yeah. Very it doesn't mean it wasn't close, right? Yeah, oh, for exactly. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm hoping that Omega Lol wins, not because like I think they're the better team, but just so that it messes up Tettles' brackets, <laughs> but I have a better a better chance of catching up to him. My good perfect reason. bracket. Good it, it, if Baldi wins, then I have a perfect bracket. Here we bracket. go. <laughs> Baldi versus Omega Lol. Omega Lol fighting all the way through the last stand tournament to make it here. Can they stay alive? Let's find out. Oh, man, this is gonna be. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a three game series. Both of these teams looked equally good yesterday, I and mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like you pretty much agree. How, do, how are you feeling about the, the mage pick from Womegalol here? We saw it earlier. Um, we saw Monka running the mage as well. It brought a substantial amount of single target damage. And whenever we saw Donuts in Despair, they were playing a Havoc Demon Hunter, which kind of similar philosophy. Baldi running that Windwalker Monk. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure. Now, remember, there is there have been 
random, not not necessarily random, but slight tuning patches in the past couple of months, and one of those tuning patches was a pretty significant single target buff for Monk, oh, so honestly... Oh, no, 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 oh, no, Oh, no. that is not the way to start off a dungeon. Igloo already dead. Now, fortunately, that's not the worst death in the world, right? Because they're right at the start of the dungeon. They don't have to commit a battle res. You can release him. He's right back with the group already. But that's five seconds on the board already. Not how you want to start off a dungeon. But it does look like they're getting through the trash pack relatively quickly compared to Baldi. They lusted. The, the, the oh, J JB died too. Lusted. JB died as well. Uh, but, Bal right. but Baldi was able to hold on to their bloodlust here. So that is true. I, I think that this is... I think that Baldi's going to get the advantage here. So they did a very similar pull. Well, Megalo commits their lust, and they both end up killing that trash pack around the same time. In addition to that, Baldi not committing that battle res where well, Megalo did. So uh, just a little bit more room oh, for uh, error if uh, if that's going to end up happening. But I mean, this is like where Baldi should be uh, shining with that Windwalker monk over that mage, right? Like that those couple, first couple of trash pulls. That Windwalker monk should have provided a little bit more leeway. So it makes sense that they were able to not lust that pull. Yeah, they didn't have any of their major cooldowns up until just now. The Infernal just came out from Lips, so we should see Baldi catapult into the lead here with the Lust and the Infernal available. But really, like, they're kind of just staying even. They're really not gaining that much value out of this Bloodlust. And honestly, well, Mechal might start to pull away here. The Combustion's back up for Dr. J. So this Bloodlust play might not really have worked out for them very well. Now, of course, they're going to be able to pull the boss into more trash in a second here, but... Okay, they're, they're pulling ahead a little bit, at least. So it's just, stra maybe that it's just strange play. because, like, it's a 23 Tyrannical, and, I, I mean, just the general consensus has been the 22, 23, 24 range on Tyran. Like, you don't need that much more AoE damage. Uh, Destro, Warlock, and Surf Hunter provide, at least for most of the MDI teams, it seems like it provides just enough AoE to where you're not looking to uh, ramp that up with another Windwalker Monk. Instead, just a lot of these teams are playing for more oh, no, single but... target damage. Oh. Okay, that, that was, was a rough close. scenario. He was in the prison and he had a bomb spot on top of him from the trash. That could have been really bad, but he's a warlock, committed dark pact and wall, lived through it just fine because that's fair. But yeah, no. So what, what I was what I was gonna say before the priests just decided to just grace us with their angel forms at the same time almost. Make sure you get your <laughs> screenshots, by the way. Was that I, I don't really feel like playing for single target in this dungeon, even though it's tyrannical, is like that big of a deal. Like, when you think about the things in this dungeon that you're actually just pure single targeting on, the only thing that really comes to mind is the menagerie. In, like, the second half of the last boss, and maybe, like, the very end of the uh, the club, right? Because you're pulling trash on top of every oh, boss, right? So the AoE is totally fine. Look at, Ooh, what look are at we doing? Ball is going left. left. Okay. Yeah. We saw we saw uh, uh, Donuts and Despair earlier doing a really weird route in this area, but Baldi's even going left and then left. So uh, whenever we were watching Donuts and Despair, they ended up pulling like an Enforcer pack in this middle area. But it looks like Baldi's is Baldi starting in the Menagerie wing with this. Oh, oh they're pulling the dogs too. Hounds? Hello. What? what? What is this pull? Okay, so two things. We've never seen these hounds pulled in the MDI before, I'm pretty sure. They work pretty much like the old Molten Core hounds, right? You have to kill them at the same time. They have a curse that you ha you can either interrupt or dispel. And then it's they just also have the damage cast as well. And it is also bolstering, so they need to focus those two hounds down. Very scary if you don't focus those down. And you can see they get bigger and bigger every time they get bolstered up here. It almost makes you wonder if they were pulled on purpose, but kind of have to be. But oh. Shakib goes down. They have a battle rest for him. They're probably going to want to get him up because this touch of death is probably the only thing that's going to let them kill both of the dogs at the same time. But they're not committing it, so they must be confident that they can kill them off without. Nope, there's the battle rest just now. So he's going to be able to touch a death once one of them dies. Well, was that oh. the enforcer or was, or was that the mini boss that they ended up grabbing into this pack? I, I, I couldn't the... tell. Oh, I couldn't tell either. Hmm. Not quite sure, we'll, but we'll see, we were we'll so excited later. with that pull. Well, Megalol has more trash counts still, though, even even with the size of the pull from Baldi. I I think that like what Baldi is doing is totally fine, though, because the, their position in the dungeon, just like where they're standing relative to the uh, remainder of this key, it, it's okay. Whereas on the right side of your screen, you do see well, Megalol, Doctor J is off uh, delivering those goods, making sure that all of that is getting dealt with, while uh, the remainder of his team is often starting like menagerie RP. And then they're also getting ready for this postmaster pull. They just need to make sure that like the bolstering is done well. Make sure that you kill off this trash cleanly. I think that Will Megalo is playing a fairly standard route here, though. The ball, the the, the, oh, the cats coming in from Baldi. The cats coming huh? in. So these cats, another throwback to a previous dungeon. They work a lot like the dark heart thicket cats. They'll jump towards a ranged target, 
including pets, by the way. And for some reason, the damage that they do isn't reduced against pets, so they can just kill off pets. That includes Warlock Infernals. <laughs> they can just one-shot <laughs> Warlock Infernals. So that's actually... I mean, it's a great God. trash count. It's a great trash count, don't get me wrong. But it can be a very big damper on your DPS. Looks like they've gotten through them just fine, though. And they also have more trash coming in again. We have a Spark Caster on top of the group, too. Man. Interesting. So they, they're just getting so much trash. So a lot of the times... Teams have been snapping an insane amount of count into like the Oasis area, and that's a lot of the times where teams are getting like a large amount of their count. But Baldi, with this double left play, I, I wonder, I wonder what this is going to be like relative to Womegalol's very standard route. So Womegalol is running what most of the MDI teams have been playing um, across like Cup weekends, and I, I wonder like what this Baldi route is going to enable them to do. Of course, it is bolstering and stuff, and like that pull that Womegalol got off the right side. Um, it's really dangerous, and so maybe Baldi was just not feeling it because of how uh, sus it is on bolstering, but maybe they just found good success with it in regards to how much time it saves them. So, a couple things. Number one, that left side trash count, both of those dogs and the cats, they are incredibly efficient count. They give yeah. a lot more count per HP than most mobs in the dungeon. And honestly, like that's the preferred live key route right now for most teams because of that. But also the thing that we don't really talk about too much is just pure travel time throughout the dungeon. This will mega little route that we see most teams pull off, they usually go from Postmaster, then to Menagerie, then to the club, which means you're backtracking across the dungeon several times. They're not doing that, though. They're going from Postmaster to the club, so the amount of travel time they're going to have is the club. pretty similar to what Baldi has. Yeah, well, gotta, gotta... I mean, that. I, I guess that's what... Is it the club? I don't even know it's what the, it's the It's boss. the Oasis, I think, is the name of it's it. It's the Oasis. It is a club down, though, right? Uh, Ricky dropping his portal in the wrong part of the club. <laughs> <laughs> the ba the no, that bouncer works. has that bounced works. him down. That still really? goes up. Even what? even though the visual is on the bottom, it still goes to the top. It's weird, but trust me. It does. I disagree, Blizzard. <laughs> Alright, so uh, well, Megalo here has snapped a bunch of mobs. It looks like they just have wise guys and muscles. Um, I'm surprised that they didn't end up grabbing... Like either a mini boss or an enforcer here. I, I think a lot of the times we've actually seen mini bosses and enforcers grabbed into this part. It is a lot more dangerous. For the record, is it is very scary whenever you um, snap those enforcers into this pack. But it's something that I think that Will Megalo should be doing at least in to make up uh, to make up a lot of time. Baldi on the left side of your screen here. They have that woe drifter. Um, it is drifted on in. It, that's pretty standard. Teams have been killing like a woe relic off to the side, leaving that drifter there just like melding. Or feign deathing um, that will drift her off and then tagging it with a warlock pet after the fact. I think that what Baldi's doing for even though they are in this uh, menagerie area, which is non-standard, I, I think that the way that they've been doing some of this stuff has been super good. The pan dropping really low right here though. It looks like they were all kind of like just starting to run before the boss even died. And Lepan's sitting there like, guys, <laughs> kill the boss, please. One but here we go, off okay, to the races, the Drifter buff is out. Was, it was, was an enforcer. enforcer? It okay, so the mini yeah, boss yeah. is still there for them. Okay, cool. Now, this is important, though. They actually lost a little bit of time on that Woe Drifter buff. Shakib is going to be the one to go off and do some of that RP, get the uh, get the Oasis unlocked for them. See how quickly he's able to do this here on the Monk. He's got the, he's got the meld as well. So it, it, yeah. we've seen a lot of different classes do it, like the... The mage was the, pe the person to do it for Womegalol. Just him having the invisibility, it made a lot of sense. And so if, like for Shakib, if he accidentally gets in combat with some of these packs, he can just meld it back off. He actually doesn't even get into combat with it. This is totally fine for Baldi. That was so speedy. He's already back doing to be, damage, too. Who do you prefer to be right here? Do you prefer to be Baldi, or do you prefer to be Womegalol? Because Womegalol is uh, about to finish the, last, the final part of this boss. Uh, I think it's honestly pretty close. Um, okay. It's hard to say, because Menagerie is the longest boss in the instance by far, right? Probably a minute longer than any other boss. I think it all comes down to how fast they're able to deal with Postmaster here in, you know, overlapping those Melemental buffs. Looks like they're doing a pretty good job so far. Do they have the third one banished off on the side? Because if they're able to get all three full-time bubbles up and not have to do a single one of the briefcase phases, this could be pretty quick and get them right back in the mix of things. But Baldi's not going to have a Wove buff to, to get to the Oasis area, are they? Hmm... That, not. Uh, uh, that seems like pretty inefficient just as a whole because well Megalol is going to have um, that Woe Drifter buff, so they, they ended up killing that Woe Drifter at the very bottom of Zog Run. And since Zog Run has so little HP and they have uh, that damage buff, you're able to uh, levy that 
that low drifter speed and just get out of this area so much faster and it allows you to cross the Ooh, remainder of the area with Baldi. They're going to have to go gonna be tight that. for Baldi. It's going to be tight for Baldi. Look at the timer of that one briefcase there. Oh, they no. have to kill the boss before that timer goes off. Uh uh uh, uh, uh oh god. One explosion guys, might not guys, kill them. Guys, the second guys, the second one definitely will though. Oh boy. They have a siege. Shakib is still alive. JB's an angel. Le Pen can stay alive on his own for quite a while. One last briefcase goes off. But we'll be back alive in a second here. Can they finish the boss off, though, with just Le Pen and Lip? I... Oh, no. Well, well, I think that's all she wrote for this dungeon, Tuttles. I think that, I think that ended that. I, I, I was questioning... I mean, it was going to be really close. I, I think that this dungeon was going to be super close between these two teams. But now, I think it's pretty heavy. Well, Mega to hero it out. He kills the boss. I mean, They're going to be able to release and come back, but they need a, a huge mistake from Omega Lil here, right? Like, that's the only way they get back into this. Lepan is going to activate this this portal. I mean, this this makes sense, but it's uh, that's a massive time loss. I think that that's somewhere in the range of... So they have the 25 seconds depth differential, but they probably have another 30 or 45 seconds on top of that, just getting back to this point. Yeah. That's rough. Oh, Anyways, we'll on the see. right side of your screen, <laughs> we have <laughs> Omega Lil. They, they ended up pulling an Enforcer into this boss, which is really, really scary for LeMike. LeMike doing a great job of uh, tanking that, that trash. Womegalo also does a great job of making sure that like the bolstering is managed well and just no deaths are occurring here. And, I mean, now they're just playing a fairly standard boss. This is just typical to live. It's a 23 Tyrannical, so it's not easy, but they, they shouldn't have too many problems getting through this part. So it looks like Baldi is making sure to finish off these lackeys before they get into the the oasis. They would have had to do this regardless of the wipe on on the on the postmaster, right? Because you really need to make sure there's no trash mobs like funneling into this room with you when you get to the what to the uh, instruments. So playing it safe. Now, do they have anything coming from fired up? That is the question. Usually, we see teams snap a bunch of trash onto this boss oh, using a, summon. a summoning portal. That doesn't seem ideal. Hmm. Well. Well, well. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> I don't. I. Is this tech or is this? I don't know. Please. Okay, it's tech. <laughs> All right, he's here. <laughs> okay, that was kind of that was actually kind of sick. <laughs> so Zafar has now snapped them. So now they have the mini boss in here, and I, I'm pretty down with this. I. I'm gonna be real with you guys. I don't know how they did that, but it was cool. I wonder. So I think that it has to be something like. Pet gets in combat with the boss. You feign, accept a summon, because when you're in feign, you're technically out of combat. Yeah. And then you can accept the summon, and then it snaps the snaps the mini boss to you. That's the only way I can I can Maybe. see that working. Yeah, I, huh. I don't know. It's a it's definitely one that I'm unsure of. However, I think that that would have made up for like the lack of the woe the woe uh, buff because Baldi would have just ran to this area and started the RP while fired up is the person who's. Um, just getting all that stuff ready, then while the RP is going on, Lip is summoning fired up. I, th I think that this, I mean, it made sense uh, to not have the woe buff for this. I, I I wish I could have seen how it played out between these two teams, because I think that what Baldi has done, it looked good. I mean, they got punished, unfortunately, on the Postmaster, because they you know, were just a little bit off damage-wise, but I, I mean... Well, it's not all over yet, because while well, Megalol has just lost like their last little layer of defense that they had available to them, Toba went down in the middle of this boss. They committed their final battle rest to getting him yeah. up. So if there are any major mistakes in the final pull of the dungeon, which we know can go poorly, we've seen them have, have deaths for other teams in the past, that might be the opening Baldi needs to get back into this one. And honestly, that's kind of their only shot of taking this map. Yeah, I mean, uh, the death differential isn't that much between these two teams. Ricky here already leaving, getting himself in position um, early to snap that Enforcer up top. And and this is the, the final difficult part of this dungeon. So Ricky's going to be porting up, um, making really sure to not pull so far, because that could, that could be uh, problematic. He's going to drop his Demonic Circle here, and then he's going to jump off the platform, pull an Enforcer. Uh, basically, like an Enforcer in a trash pack, they're going to be getting their final 7% enemy forces there, and then they're going to be dealing with that. What is Ricky doing? Is he ever going to pull trash? I Maybe they're having is, their Hunter do it instead. Is Tebow doing it? Well, how... hmm. You can do it with MD. Uh, but I don't know I how you can do it with MD. You can technically do it with MD, but it, it, oh, yeah, it puts you in a, okay. It, they just MD'd it. It puts you in a weird spot if if Tobo messes up like 
Uh, it, it, it can potentially you just have to not pull hunter. the boss until it gets here. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're fine. Uh, the Will Megalol yeah. is okay here. So Asmi, the Enforcer's been engaged. Bloodlust is coming out. So the advantage of doing it that way, by the way, is that you don't have to commit, like, Unending Resolve plus Dark Pact or, like, a GS or something like that uh, to your Warlock. And so instead, you're able to just bomb all of the healing into the tank because the tank is the person that's getting the mobs snapped to them. And so they're getting meleeed as opposed to the Warlock. Well, it seems like it worked out for them just fine. They only have that Enforcer left alive. And honestly, I kind of want to keep it alive as long as possible because that's the thing putting that damage increased taken aura on everything around it. That's why they have the boss already at 40%. And the major danger is gone. I mean, oh, Megalol. Not exactly playing the cleanest dungeon, but not having any major mistakes, allowing them to take this map one victory. Only 30% left on the boss for them to get through here. I mean, th things are looking pretty good here. They just have this double technique that they need to kick. And I think it's... There's no possible way that they could wipe from here. Okay. There's I've no way. <laughs> but, I mean, realistically, well, Megalol, I, they looked really good here. They had four deaths, but nothing was... Uh, Super catastrophic. I really wish I could have seen how Baldi's route uh, compared to what Megalol is, if both of these teams have a perfect route. Because that, the Baldi route was so innovative. I just wanted, I just wanted to see what it looked like whenever it was uh, done to perfection. However, Megalol is going to take the best of this one. Uh, map that I really love watching because everything is just on such a razor's edge the entire time, right? Where if yeah. Baldi hadn't lost a few extra people on Postmaster, like this would be a much, much closer dungeon than it was. It looks like they might lose a couple here as well, but it's it's over anyway. We'll make a little win that one. But this series is is anything but over right now. Yeah, good showing there from both teams. I, I, I liked the Baldi plan as well. The going left idea seemed strong to me, and I think we would have actually seen them really close in time had it not been for that wipe in the Postmaster room. Both teams definitely showing some weakness as well, having a sort of spot death scattered throughout the dungeon. To some extent, I think that's a feature of Tazabesh Streets, where there's a lot of mechanics that can do that to players. But also, it is something that they are going to need to tune up, and if either team can get this shape down to zero death runs, I think they'll be able to take the series from here. Yeah, I mean, I our mean, next map is uh, the other side, so another opportunity for a lot yeah. of scary pulls and things can go wrong. But uh, what were you going to say, Tuttles? The, that Baldi mistake, I think, probably cost them like a minute, like yeah. minimum. Yeah. So even though it was five deaths towards the end of the, the key, like that, that, those deaths were really bad. Yeah, one thing I liked from Baldi, actually, here's here's right at the start of the dungeon. So this uh, we had deaths coming out from both teams just on early pulls. Uh, and Womega will commit a battle res to their first one. You can see that battle res actually cooling down for them here. Whereas on the side of Baldi, their first death, uh, it is just on their healer, so it's a little bit less important to get the res quickly for time. But you can see there, ends up just breaking Angel Form and releasing rather than using that battle res. And yeah, you know, this costs a little bit of time in theory. It's a little bit slower than, uh, than just sending that battle res. But honestly, on the healer, it's not even worse. And then you get to save this battle res. That battle res being available here for Shakib. Uh, on this nasty, nasty enforcer, corehound, peacekeeper shenanigans that, that they get up to here. Off? Or yeah, is there's it peacekeepers. A... I think it, it was it a looked... breath that got him. Yeah, it looks like a, a combination of things going off there and on, on the Windwalker <laughs> as well. Uh, it can be day. rough. One thing that went a little bit wrong as well for Womegalol, their Warlock Gateway, I don't know if you saw it out of the corner of your eye there, ended up not actually going all the way from the upstairs part, so they ended up losing a little bit of time having to reroute around. Uh, afterwards, but they were able to get this uh, this pull down here. They weren't doing the mini boss into the Zogrom area, which uh, we saw most other teams, including Baldi, deciding to do. At the end of the day, these were all small to medium sized differences between the route, and the big thing ended up being this wipe here uh, for Baldi. It wasn't a full wipe. Luckily, they were able to get over the finish line on the Postmaster, but you could see these uh, these briefcases exploding. I think they were just planning to have the boss die before they exploded and weren't quite able to get over the finish line in time. Something about their damage just wasn't the way that they were planning for it to be and uh, ends up being a very costly, yeah, Tettles, like you said, a minute worth of time loss mm. there. Minimum. Like, like minimum. Min yeah, minimum. maybe more. Uh, yeah, even, like, because LePan ended up having to solo that pack f or the boss for maybe even 15 or 20 seconds by itself. So it may have been a minute and a half that they lost. That was a, that was a massive time loss. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, 3% on a tyrannical boss and a, like a plus, what, 23 that was or something like that. It was 
it it is significant. That's still a significant amount of HP to burn through, uh, even if you're a, even if you're a blood DK. But uh, they got it done. It just uh, took a lot of time. But it seemed like it was one of those situations where it's like you in practice, you always kill it with that cadence, you know. And then suddenly you find yourself in the heat of the moment without the damage, and you just kind of go for it anyway. And that kind of stuff just happens. But like we said earlier, far from done. Uh, we're going to a plus twenty four the other side. Uh, and this one's gonna be pretty scary too. Again, like lots of massive, massive pulls, lots of opportunity for things to go wrong. Um, and so a punishing dungeon like this, I mean, we could see this go to map three pretty easily. Yeah, and you have to think as well that Baldi's probably pretty upset about what happened in that key, right? They made one tiny misplay, oh, yeah. cost them five deaths. Honestly, it's well, like the same thing as what happened yeah. in Rise of Atoma, right? Yeah, one seriously. misplay costs you the entire dungeon, so... I mean, this is a long dungeon, DOS. We just saw one done 10 minutes, you know, 20 minutes ago by another pair of teams. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in this key, and you have to somehow find yourself in, like, the right mental space to come back and play a clean dungeon to keep yourself in the tournament. I mean, their back's against the wall. One more dungeon map loss, and they're out of the tournament in 7th, 8th. We saw yeah. the video. That's not where JB wants to be. I, I think, though, a... that one of the strengths of having, like, fired up in Shakib on your team, right, is that your mental resilience as a team is going to be bolstered by, like, there, there's, they're not going to be a team that has that first map go wrong and are just playing worse for the rest of the day. I think that they're going to be able to bounce back from that, and I think they're going to be able to come into this DOS and, and give it, you know, a full 100% effort attempt. Uh, so that's what I'm yeah. hoping for out of Baldi. I do definitely empathize with them in this position where their last two maps both went down, like you said, to uh, to one mistake in each of them. And that's a, that's a really, really rough way to uh, lose a series and potentially a tournament. Are we going to, are we going to see both teams playing mage in here? You think? I think <laughs> no, so. No, not a chance. No. Yeah. <laughs> I think fired up, you know, anytime mage is an option, I think fired up on it is a, a very, you know, he's one of your best, one of the best mages in the world, right? So, uh, if Baldi, if other teams are playing mage in a dungeon, I think there's a very good chance that Baldi will, yeah. You know, going back to Baldi, too, losing those last two maps in kind of a, a you know, heartbreaking way, uh, there was a pro gamer named Baby Bay in the Overwatch League that used to talk about uh, something he called Goldfish Brain, where it's like, you just have to live in the moment as a pro gamer. You have to forget what just happened good or bad have that five second goldfish memory and just you know do what's in front of you right and like that in his opinion was one of the like keys to success as, as far as like maintaining that mental fortitude so yeah baldy just kind of needs to have there's that this, goldfish uh, brain about that last there's this one. really popular football coach who says the same thing his name's like ted lasso or something maybe that's where he got yeah. it well and, wait uh, he was saying it years before ted lasso though maybe fired ted up lasso in got it from him legitimately I think, was... I think do have goldfish brains as well so uh, it should work out rather well for the team i think dude dude <laughs> i think abraham lincoln said that first but yeah wow I'm just out there throwing the hot takes about oh, brain size that's not a, that's not a hot take <laughs> it's actually oh, a very frigid that. take that's, not really that's very a fr freezing cold take it's a based opinion <laughs> all right the arctic take yeah sure yeah, for those well, of you who haven't caught any uh, Fired Up Shakiv streams, those are uh, a, a delight to watch. Those two being in the <laughs> same uh, environment has been a gift to uh, to the WoW spectator community, for sure. It really is. Would you say uh, the people who watch those are fearless spectators? Oh. Not possibly. yet, but if they watch our broadcast for two hours, they can be right. as long as they connect their Battle.net account to their YouTube account by clicking that connection button right next to the like button. You nailed it. It looks like a diamond, kind of. It's a rewards thing. Yeah, make sure you do it. And then you, too, can be a fearless spectator watching your uh, pugs die in silly ways. You just throw on the title, and you're like, well, that's what I do. Goldfish have recall also... lasting at least a month? I don't know if I believe that. That undermines our whole point. What are they going to recall? Like the Not the any of the goldfish I've the... talked to. Yeah, they haven't, yeah, they haven't yeah, been able to say anything. Yeah. They They're going to recall the, the top versus the bottom of the fishbowl? Like... Fake news. Uh, maybe they mean, well, there's, there's a difference. There's a little goldfish, right? And then there's, uh -huh. like, the big koi fish. Maybe the bigger ones can remember better. Just uh, if... Because they're the bigger. Bond. If the admins are listening, now would be a good time to start the game to get us out of this particular discussion, <laughs> if uh, if you're wondering. But, sorry, go ahead. Continue, Doa. There's some big koi in, uh, like, the, the apartment complex that oh. I'm in. They, they're, uh, they don't have their own apartment, but they live in the pools uh, nearby. I'll go and uh, have a chat. After. It's crazy that your apartment complex can afford a pool for koi fish. I mean, it's 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 a whole bunch of it's a whole bunch of like uh, channels and things. 
Oh, so it's a water feature. So you live in a bougie yeah. apartment complex. Okay. Jeez. Well, it's pretty. It's pretty old, but it's pretty cool. I like it. So it's got. We got a water feature. I can't say too much more. I don't need. <laughs> you dox yourself. People showing up. <laughs> at my uh, my apartment complex. Yeah, I don't want that. It's pretty easy. We just need to search for apartment complexes that like have motorcycles driving through them every day. Apartment a complex with koi fish. <laughs> I find them true. to be rather simple, it's actually. Koi on the motorcycles. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. You said, but you said they're complex. How could they be simple? Well, just oh, okay. just a bunch of apartments stacked oh on top gosh. of each other, right? What's so Wouldn't complex about that? Uh. <laughs> but but it's an apartment complex. Yep. Sure is. <sighs> Gosh, I really wish for, I really wish the admins would start the game. <laughs> Ooh, I gotta love these. You could imagine them just uh, just saying like, "Nope, now I'm not gonna do it." You guys have another five minutes. Uh, let's <laughs> let's, to us let's now, see how yeah. bad this gets. Why is the Millhouse Manosaur in picture? Why does it have claw marks through it? Did That's Maleficent. Do that? She uh, from from she was mad at him one time. I'm pretty sure. Does she have claws, or did she get one of like the chickens to do it? I think it's that the rip saw that she uses to put that nasty bleed on the tank. Probably oh, also effective against right. portraits. I had to, if I had to guess. You could be right. Yeah, could be. Well, you know, times like these that I like to uh, just appreciate the logos that we have in MDI and the artistry that goes into them. Okay, I, I have a more serious question. Are we, are we gonna see people go right oh. or left side? Because we saw both earlier today. Is there, a, is there a preference between the people here? I, I think don't care. Right is better. Why? Is it inspiring? Uh, sounds like a nice way to go. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if I was if I was picking the direction, I'd go left because everyone knows clockwise is a superior way to go around a circle. Is it? Huh? Well, we'll no. we'll let you guys debate that. Uh, we'll if see if we'll make right it when you walked into Sanctum. Did it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> All okay. right, here we yeah. go. Into the key. <laughs> uh, we have two fire mages. <laughs> Thank goodness. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, let's go. So what exactly are the advantages of fire mage here? Do you think it's kind of similar to like the what we were talking about earlier, where it's you don't need that much more AoE damage that a Windwalker would provide, and you'd rather have the single target? Yeah, I mean, 24 Tyrannical. Bosses are dangerous. Fire mage, literally one of the best consistent single target damage classes in the game. Not to mention, scales really well with both. The Erdus Mantler and the Via Interceptor buffs, like both of them are great on the Fire Mage, especially if you can stack them too. Like you're literally just Fire Blast Pyro, Fire Blast Pyro for the entire Dismantler debuff. So like, it's pretty nice. It's a pretty good spec for Mythic Plus single target damage. Say we is going to suffer a little bit when they don't have Combustion up, but they can keep up when they do have Combustion up, as you can see on that first trash pack fired up, able to keep up with the, uh, the Hunter and the Warlock. Now, if that trash pull lasted like 20 more seconds, different story, he's going to do a lot less damage. Uh-huh. You know, for these smaller pulls, especially on Tyrannical, when the trash doesn't have extra HP, totally fine. Both teams going right immediately off the rip here. This pull is so unbelievably dangerous. So you have the High Priests and the Hoodoo Hexers, and it's very, very scary here um, to have this done on Inspiring. The Earn Stun does pierce through the Inspiring, so that that is an advantage here. Baldi even delays uh, their Earn Cast to where the Hoodoo Hexers have a more preferable cast to even get that stun where well Megalo, they got their pack grouped up a lot faster but then they earned almost instantly well Megalo even uh, polymorphing one of those high priests off to the side they're just going to have that wander on in once they get to hakar that seems pretty normal jb on the left side of your screen ending up in a frog this is not the most dangerous thing what? as long as the healing wave doesn't go off for baldi this should be okay why did why did baldi let the guys transform into birds I think maybe they want a little bit more count maybe they is uh Okay. Maybe they're like living on the edge, I don't know. Interesting. Because it's, it's one more count per bird, right? I think so, but it's like, it's so minimal that it's not, I don't, and those are so annoying to deal with that I probably would never want to do it. Now, did they, were, did they manage to get the CC on the, on the Woe Drifter, like, yeah, aggro on the Woe Drifter here? I, I didn't see if that was something that they did. I think they did. How, how does it look like this on Little Megalo's side? Are we, are we fighting the old Hakar? I have no idea. This is so bright. I'm not used to this. It's like red too, it's like really red. It's like the old, it's like the, the Sunken Temple Hakar. Isn't that where that guy's from? Wait, yeah, what what actually are they using? This must be I something similar to... I, I do not know. Well, looks cool. But it is neck and neck as we go into the first boss here. Both teams very, very close together. Also both holding their bloodlust for this boss as well. 
Now, I wonder if you don't do the World Drifter skip here because this boss actually takes quite a bit of time to get through on Tyrannical, right? Like, the timing would be very, well, very weird. You'd have to keep the Drifter alive for quite a while, would you not? But they're going to... Uh, the I mean, what we saw earlier is that both teams just had that Wo, uh, the Relic Pack. Look at this. So Wo oh, no, there we has go. The, yeah, okay. the Relic Pack just wandering on in at the end. That's what that's what the teams were doing earlier as well. I don't know if Baldi's going to be doing that. I suspect the answer is going to be probably. The biggest thing on these bosses is making sure that you're able to skip these blood barriers. We saw teams like holding globals at the very final second. They were able to burn straight through a part of that shield. And if you do enough damage to the boss within like 0.5 seconds of them putting up the shield, you can cancel the blood barrier uh, immediately. That is a massive time save if you're able to do that. Yeah, essentially the way it works is that there's a base amount of shield the second he casts the blood barrier. And he puts an initial small shield up, and then he also sucks in a little bit of extra shield from everybody in the room. But it's on a little bit of a delay, so if you're able to break that initial barrier like instantly okay. with timed casts, it'll break it. Looks like Omega Lil got that off a couple times, because they are so far ahead of Baldi here. And they Baldi. also have the Drifter, where Baldi does not. That's that's what I was about to say. Like, Baldi not having the Drifter here is going to be the biggest uh, point of time loss. Is... So, you saw Womegalol, they, they they skipped past uh, all of the Sons of Hakkar, but they got the, the relics off of that pack, and that's where they get this, this woe buff from. I'm interested to see what Baldi has available to them at the end, because there's a count disparity between these two teams here, but I'm not entirely sure where it's coming from, because I would expect that Baldi has more, should have more count, but maybe not. Well, we got to okay. get this Woe Drifter buff here, guys, don't we? I mean, no, they're Baldi's just skipping past it as walk. well, so Baldi's going to be very, very far behind. It's going to take them probably like 30 seconds to just straight straight up walk to where Woe Megalol is in the dungeon right now, so I'd imagine they're going to deal dealing with that trash pack. But let's focus in on this massive pull from Woe Megalol. Not only are they dealing with the trash in the normal way we see it, but they also have pulled one of those enraged spirits in as well, and every single time it casts rage cast, you're going to be so much damage going out on the group. Hopefully they can skip the next one, and it looks like they do have the damage to do that. Igloo able to keep everyone topped up for that first rage cast. Pretty insane execution for them here. I mean, this, is a, this is one of the advantages of that Fire Mage, right? So the, he's in his combustion right now from his um, from his legendary. He was able to just prioritize that that enraged spirit where the rest of his group is going to be AoEing. And like, so he doesn't need to be doing an insane amount of AoE damage. Like, look at the damage meter here. Tobo and Ricky have that covered. Jay's only job is to just sit there and hit that enraged spirit. It's kind of what we saw from Rogues, most of this expansion, where Subtlety was super good at priority damage. Um, Jay is just kind of taking that job as his own and um, doing that priority damage. And now with Megalol on the right side of your screen here, they're utilizing this Woe buff as their namesake and skipping all the way into the Mana Storms area. Yep, let's see if they're able to get the uh, the snap on these sentient oils. Not sentinel oils, as we've called them a few times. Oh, I thought they're they were not in combat, but they can definitely snap them still, so... Let's see if they actually end up pulling okay, now that they're off combat. here. Look at Lemike. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he, he's, uh, he's on the damage meter. That's how I always tell. Yeah, yeah. One of the, the damage meter resets. Baldi has caught maybe... up here though, but they have less trash. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think they did the. I don't think they did the, um, the, the two guys in front of this wing of the dungeon yet. So we're still a little behind. Okay. I mean, it's not that far behind. Uh, if Womegalol well, makes a mistake, even like one death, I think that Baldi can slingshot themselves like back into the lead. I think this is one of those dungeons that 3% enemy forces doesn't really mean a lot because you get so much of your ca uh, trash count from the Arden World wing that like one additional mob in the Arden World area or a couple additional mobs in the Arden World area doesn't mean a lot. It's like yeah. it's not going to one, thing one I will mention. difference. Baldi was a lot faster on getting their oils up and snapping, so they actually made up a little bit of time there as well. That's good. And you know what? Honestly, I think the biggest thing so far with the difference in routes is how cleanly Womegalol is going to be able to deal with the trash pack that is in front of the Hakar wing, right? We saw Baldi just dealing with that on its own to get their Woe Drifter buff that they then used to skip essentially all the way to the Mana Storms. Womegalol is probably going to end up pulling that with Moizala at the very end of the dungeon, and that's something that can go horribly, horribly wrong, especially on 24 Tyrannical, where the boss is dangerous, right? So, Any extra intake while taking a boss could just be a death for Lemite. Well, what is Baldi going to do with the double warlords and the... What, what is like? What are they going to do with the double warlords and like the bone soldiers and stuff like that that are outside of this wing, then? Are, are they going to do I would imagine they're just going to pull them. Like, I would imagine or, they're either just going to do them next or literally pull everything. In, there is a world movie. where they skip both of the enraged spirits, right? I think that the, I think that that definitely could be 
Uh, that definitely could be the route. But that also kind of seems inefficient in a couple of different ways. We know that if you have both of those enraged spirits up, you have to be super careful of who you're sending to what platform. Um, they do have a fire mage and a, and a hunter, both of which are night phase. So that may be what we're seeing. The, and that may be the reason that both of those guys are also night fae because they have invis and they also have feign death. And then on top of that, they're giving a little bit more redundancy back up. So maybe that's what Baldi's looking to do here with these racial picks. Hmm. Yeah, we'll have to see how it works out. I mean, they definitely are not going as slow as we originally thought, but they're definitely still slightly behind Omega. Yeah. Right? Omega Lull is just pulling, somehow pulling slowly ahead on this boss. I mean, there is a little bit of RNG to Warlock, but not 4K DPS. I wonder what Ricky has going for him here. He's doing a whole lot of damage. Oh, you know. Oh, you know. I don't know. <laughs> you know War Warlocks. I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if this was a PI diff. If if, uh, if Omega Lull was giving PI to Ricky and Baldi's giving it to the mage. I think it actually is the right play to That's probably the, the diff, yeah. Target. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense if, if that's the diff, because then Fired Up is able to just burn it straight into the boss. Um, it would be probably advantageous, like, uh, just single target there. I don't I don't know how much of a difference it's going to make just over the course of the whole entire dungeon. Well, Megalol here are going to be getting the Mana Storms down. I suspect they're going to pull the Arf Arf and then get that Woe buff and peace on out of here. We do know that they pulled the Warlords, like, Bone Soldier pack, so there's no trash It's about to happen coming. again. It's this. about to happen again to Baldi. They're about to get chickens, and they can't stop it because the other guy's dead. Oh. Oh, no. It's, it's like the next cast. Um, they, ha they have to live through this with just personals. Okay, they got it. Come on, Baldi, don't do it again. Oh, no. Baldi, don't do it again. You have I, Turtle, I, you have Block. This is fine. This you have is a fine. Warlock. Stop by this. Stop by this. Stop by this. Uh, kill it! Okay. There, okay. You know. Didn't happen again. <sighs> Fake, fake news. <laughs> they, they're really making us sit on our toes here on the desk, man. Sit on our toes. I... On to Arf Arf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On to the, as I was saying, on to the Arf Arf. Well, Megalol, grab their Woe buff. Baldi going to do something similar. I suspect they're going to grab that Woe Drifter. You, like you and I were talking about, are they going to be grabbing these uh, two Warlords out of this area? Are they going to be saving those towards uh, towards the end of Moizal to kill that with the buff? I, yeah, it's up for debate. We're, we're, we're going to see what Baldi's doing. Baldi's route is different enough from the uh, standard route in this dungeon that I think I could see it going a couple of different ways, and I wouldn't be super surprised. Well, Megalol, they are skipping that uh, trash pull. They're utilizing this Woe Drifter buff, and they're running all the way into the Arden Will Wing. I really like this. I think that it just makes the most efficient usage of that Woe buff, and uh, they'll come back and they'll get that trash pack with the Death Speaker that's in front of Moizala um, after they come back. What is okay? Why does the dungeon look like this for Wakalo? <laughs> I don't know, but what... it looks really cool, and I want our really? I want our spectators to tell us. Oh, you know what it is? This is the European. Oh, you, you know what it is? I think this is um something that one of our tech guys has been working on. They do this for P. They do this for AWC too, right? Where they change the um the environment. They change the skybox what? to make it look cool. I think this That's is like... the first time we're actually seeing it in the MBI. Are you sure it's not just the European client? Is it? Could be. They just have different uh, spell effects on <laughs> on EU servers. No way, it's that different. <laughs> no <it> way. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's really cool, <laughs> is what I will say. I'm pretty sure this is just a Starship special. Could be. All right. So we'll make a little here. You saw Doctor J clicking that lantern. This allows Ricky to make sure that he is able to put all of his globals into DPS here. It's super nice to have that Fire Mage as well because they'll dump all of their DPS during their combustion. And they're not um, they're not overly worried on just waiting because because they can dump all of their damage so fast, whereas the Warlock has like higher consistent damage. They want to be filling their globals. Lip going down for Baldi, that is a massive mistake. He didn't lose his Infernal, but it's still not great for him to be uh, slow on the ramp here on this pull. Yeah, I mean, this is just going to be massive pulls here. Well, Megalol already threw the first, like you mentioned. But, ooh, a little bit of trouble for Baldi here. Cauterize used. No purgatory for Le Pen here. I mean, this is definitely a scary moment for them here. they got to get through some of this trash so Le Pen can sit there and tank and they can do more damage. The more he kites, the less damage they do. We have to focus to shift our focus over to Megalol as they've now gone for every other trash bomb in this section of the dungeon on towards Dealer Di Dixer. Remember, this is a 24 tyrannical dungeon. Oh, it's lost That debuff that's being swapped around, the, the group is going to do a ton of damage. This is also right. You mentioned them where they used their second bloodlust of the dungeon. <sighs> These are crazy pulse titles. 
I'm getting word that the skybox is elimination mode. Um, that's that's why it's turned to this uh, this skybox is because we're in a <laughs> we're in a pivotal moment for Baldi. They are behind. Will Megalol in the lead here? The dealers IX at 57%. Baldi running down the platform. I think it's going to come down to whether or not Will Megalol is going to be able to one phase Moizala though. It, it's one of these things that Will Megalol got this dealer pull dealt with. They used their lust here. It's going to be super tough for them to one phase uh, Moizala on a 24 Tyrant, but we saw teams do it earlier. Is Will Megalol going to be able to also do it? And yes, even if Baldi's able to pull it off, they're so far behind. Now, the one difference is that they have a little bit more trash than Will Megalol, right? All of that trash on top of the boss is going to get them to something like 85% or so, so they'll have one less trash pull to do, but they have a lot of work to make up. They have to get through 60% of a 24 tyrannical Yo. boss. Oh. Will Megalol, uh, with the delayed Woe Drifter Ooh, the here, delayed drifter. It, yeah. it drifted on in uh, as Dealer's IX is at 6%. We were criticizing... Um, we were criticizing Donuts in Despair earlier whenever they had to manually walk out of this dungeon. It was very slow, and we were we were wondering if there was a way that they could potentially grab this Woe Drifter here and um, get on out of this area a little bit faster, and somehow Will Megalol was able to do it. I, I think that this is super sick for them. It's going to allow them to run down this, this Arden Wield hallway um, a lot faster. I, I think that this is great for them, and it's setting them up to be in a position where the only thing that can uh, cause a problem here is if they're not able to one ways Moizala. Jay got the slow route. He did. <laughs> Fortunately, he has the Drifter buff, plus he's a mage, so he can blink around a little bit. And he's got the fancy top hat on, so he's got the Mog for a little what, bit of extra DPS, um, too. What what was Lamike grabbing? Because Lamike was grabbing a trash pack uh, that we saw. Like So Jay was a little bit behind. I I, I, like, you see him on the damage meter. He's in combat with something. He tagged a pack. Okay, he still called himself. Uh, Lamike tagged a pack, but I don't know what he's doing. Maybe the birds are going to come another relic late? Pack? Maybe double relics? Hey. Oh, the, it's the bark line. Did trash. it snap to him? Or were they just following him? I'm so confused. I don't know. They that might have been an accident. Blinders. This is so sick. No, no, no. He was, they, grabbed, they grabbed it on purpose, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, you're right. On purpose. I'm in. W. Okay, notably not pulling with the boss here. That leaves a little bit of an opening for Baldi to potentially get a little bit of extra time makeup made up here. If they're able to pull off this pull with the boss, mm -hmm. they could very well be back in the dungeon here. Dealer has I exit going down for them, so you can Look see the, count. the gap is about a minute, and they actually have 11% more count, although a large majority of that is going to come from this pull. Probably more than that is going to come from this pull for Omega Lull, so that's going to be made up very shortly here. This is going to turn out to be a nail biter, I think. Looking at the travel time for the teams, Baldi's going to come out of this hallway about the same time that will Mega Lull engage with this boss. It's going to be a shootout. It looks like Baldi doesn't have that World Drifter buff like we're like I was talking about, and it's like this. It's going to cost them a little bit of time. They they do have um, the Wraith Walk and their their Night Face Soul Shape, so they're able to get out of here a little bit faster. But it's certainly slower than that World Drifter buff. Well, Mega Lull has engaged Moizala. I'm just interested to look at what offensive CDs they have available. You see Jay here, he's already pro uh, popped his Combustion. They do have the Erdus Mantler up for them. So assuming that they're going to be able to get that killed off, it should be fine. Ricky committed his Infernal though, which I think is the most concerning part here. He's he's certainly not able to kill the Moizala ad on a 24 Tyrion without Infernal, right? Let me, let me look at his armory and our MDI comparison tool really quick. Ricky is running for Trinket's first sigil. So if he has first sigil plus a four set proc, yes, he probably can solo it, but it will be very close. They also have power infusion Wait, available to give to somebody what? as well. Is it, is so... It He's got a minute 24. Okay, so probably not. No, it's not. No way. So Baldi is going to be engaging Wizala a full minute after Will Mega Lull here. Difference is they don't have to do extra trash after the fact. LePan almost proc'd his Purgatory there, but able to hold on to it. Didn't have to use that cheat death. And they're going to be engaging oh, Wizala. Will Mega Lull's going for two-phase. Okay, so this, okay, this is actually a spot for Baldi to be able to catch up. So with what, what, what Will Mega Lull is doing, they, they're basically saying 24 Tyrant is too much for us. We would have to commit too many offensive CDs. We do not think this is worth. We saw... Both Donuts and Despair and Monka earlier today, they committed enough offensive CDs that they were able to one phase the boss. So we know it's doable. This leaves the spot for Baldi if they're able to one phase the boss to be able to catch up. Lapan almost died. He proc did he proc his per? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he proc his purgatory, even though he's an anti perg kind of person. It looks like Baldi's gonna have their cooldowns back up though for the mirrors phase. And I think it's gonna come down to whether or not they're able to one phase this boss, Zyro. 
it's going to be really, really close. And I mean, the fact of the matter is, I'm not too sure that it's going to end up being that big of a difference, right? Because while well, Megalol's going to get into their second intermission phase, probably 30 seconds or so after Baldi. So it's really going to come down yeah. to how much pure DPS Baldi can pump out here. And remember, Baldi also has to get 5% of trash. So they're not done even when the boss just dies. They have to find trash somewhere. Is that where they're going to bring in the Warlords plus the skeletons that they didn't end up bringing? I think but so, yeah. Disaster! JB oh. goes down at the start of the intermission here. Can Le Pen even solo a phase without JB? I don't think there's any way. Unless there's he no unless way. he like literally has his gavel cooldown up, there's no way. I mean, J JB had his PI available too, so I was I assume that he's gonna he was gonna drop that on Le Pen. Maybe maybe yeah, yeah. So we we have the POV and the picture and picture of Le Pen, but I, I just don't see that there's gonna be any way that he's gonna be able to solo that. Um, I mean, if he gets bleed gavel, he can solo. Gavel is so uh, broken for damage, but. I'm not sure. They have literally seconds left on this intermission phase, and he was unable to do it. There was 10% oh, left. Man. They don't have JB here for this trash pull. How are they going to live through this trash? They have to do it. This is the last chance they have to stay in this tournament. All eyes right now are on LePan to stay alive and keep Baldi in, and it's not going to happen. LePan goes down. That's going to be a full team wipe for Baldi, and all Will Megalol has to do is finish off these last two Shattered Visages deal with the last 4% of Wazala's HP that will be left after those last two channels from Bone Zombie going to the boss. Baldi's going to be out of our tournament in 7th and 8th place settles. Wow. I mean, well, well, Megalol still has to deal with the final couple percentage of points of the boss, but yeah, it's... Oh man, that that's so tough. I, I wonder what happened. Because maybe JB just didn't get to his portal fast enough because we saw Fired Up had front left. And it looked like LePan and, and JB were running like back left, so maybe he didn't make it in time? It's really hard to tell. I mean, we can go over that. Maybe Dratnos has something to look at for us later today. But what we need to be focused on is when Wizala gets to 10.5% HP, that is going to be the end of the dungeon for Womegalol. In a time that's faster than both of the previous times we saw in DOS earlier today, it wasn't a clean dungeon. They had a death, but it looked pretty dang good, man. Omega Lil is going to be moving on in the lower bracket here, securing themselves at the very least a fifth, sixth place finish, and they're knocking out one of the better teams in the bracket, we thought, in Baldi. Dr. J cues up his mic one time and says, Well, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there you go. Well, Megalol with the 2 0, and yeah, kind of a shocking exit for uh, Baldi after getting a uh, surprise 2 1 by Donuts and Despair yesterday to now Will Megalol looking resurgent better than ever after their run through the last Dan tournament coming in. And although they went down to the lower bracket, getting the 2 0 in their first match there, so they will move on to play against Perplexed. And uh, already the results today have been uh, pretty surprising. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, definitely nobody. Well, I guess some people thought that Baldi would be going out 7th and 8th. I certainly wasn't among them, though. This was a team that we've seen do so well. You know, the back uh, in the day, taking out Echo in Sydney a few years ago. So, a uh, shame to see them go, for sure. But very well played by Womegalol to get it done. You could see with that Woe skip that they got out of Hakkar, the, the CC setup so that you have the Woe coming in later. And then just getting to run on out of here. Very speedy thing to do. On the other hand, the way that Baldi did this first part of the dungeon, you know, it looked like it cost them some time, but I'm increasingly, I quite like the way that it, it set them up for later in the dungeon, uh, the the packs that it left for them to do with Moizala at the end. I think that had we seen that done cleanly, that may have actually been a time where they would have recouped this time that it looks like they lost on Hakkar, right? Because obviously it doesn't feel good to be just walk speed exiting here when you know you could have a woe buff and, and just be, you know, running out the corridor on your on your little dwarf legs right and uh having to go on on move speed on 100 percent instead of you know 250 or whatever the woe brings you to but uh, it's still something that i i do think that had we seen a clean end of this dungeon we may have we may have actually really liked uh the fighting the trash before the mechagon wing with moizala instead of doing it with the other you know the death yeah. speaker poles so right it, that is something that i i'm curious to see how it would have worked out had it been clean up to that point obviously the run was already very in trouble for them. One thing they almost, they flirted with disaster on, as you guys were calling out during the uh, during the cast, was this. Pushing Millhouse before you're ready to kill Maleficent is a very scary thing to do. They have it very perfectly timed, and this seems like a theme <laughs> for uh, Baldi, right? When you think about the Postmaster wipe they had last game, right? They 
check and they know when they have enough damage to do things and they get themselves in these positions where if they're missing like five or ten percent of the damage that they know they can have all of a sudden they are dead because there's a phase push that they they just weren't planning to get right and that's something that is definitely worrying but it does belie a team that is ready to win right they're playing to win and they are playing for fast as possible times that they can find in these dungeons this was the impressive Omega lol uh, survival against Zyxa here with a lot of mobs in here. That Vi Interceptor. It's so scary to have that just shooting people during these yeah. boss encounters as well when you're pulling a bunch of trash onto a boss. I love having Vi when you're single target on a boss and you can just kind of take care of it, not worry too much about it. But when you're doing a big trash pull and that Vi Interceptor gets involved, very scary. Look at this as well from uh, from Omega Lol, getting unbelievable value out of the urn here by I think snapping some of the Arden World Wing on into the uh, into this pull right, and you can see so much count was secured from that. I am confused about the decision to, to not go for the one phase on the intermission. I I also wasn't able to identify whether it was an adaptation to say not having Infernal ready unexpectedly, something like that, making a call that like oh. I'm not going to have enough damage, let's just two-phase, or if this was the plan all along, because I think that you're going to lose something like a minute every time you have to do this instead of being able to do the the one phase, right? So that's something that I am curious, because we, we know this composition can do it. We've seen a lot of other teams able to do that one phase. Uh, even Baldi, very close to that one phase, had J.B. Not, not fallen earlier uh, there, they would have, I think, been able to get the one phase and then get onto this platform. And with JB alive, I think they could have done this as well. That trash looked like a really good set of trash to fight with the last little bit of Moizala. But unfortunately, because of the death, they weren't able to get that done and uh, ended up wiping and dying there. So tragedy, sure, at the end for Baldi. A close dungeon, though, one that I was surprised, actually. I think Baldi were closer than it looked for most of that dungeon based off mm. of which trash they'd left alive for the end of their Moizala. Yeah, it was uh, it was by the slimmest of margins, which, uh, you know, like you said, that's kind of how Baldi likes to run it. But you run the risk, too, right, of something. Uh, the more you kind of push the limits, the more something can go kind of catastrophically wrong. So you can definitely look at what Baldi was doing and, and see it going right. And I feel like we did see it go right a lot when they played in their group, obviously. But for whatever reason, this weekend just not quite hitting everything perfectly. And that's enough to get them knocked out. Uh, right away, loss in the upper bracket, loss in the lower bracket. They are out of the global finals, and well, Megalol moves on. So they'll go on to face Perplex a little bit later today. But um, yeah, it's any any. Uh, so after after watching that, do you feel like well, Megalol have a, have a shot against Perplex? I think everybody has a shot against everybody, but Perplex did look extremely good earlier. So today, despite the loss. So perplexed yesterday, they looked concerning and then perplexed today looked like they were on echo's level which was way less concerning and so yeah. that's a question of like which perplexed are we going to see are we going to see the one that the, the the perplex that's like forfeiting a couple of deaths per run and looking like they have some um pretty big mistakes that they will make or are we going to see the perplex that we saw today versus echo where it was like okay they just got beaten by slightly better routes which i mean it is what it is but perplexed look very, very strong. And so th then it's a question of which perplex are we going to see? For Will Megalol, this is a much stronger team than I expected to see coming into the weekend. I, I think I would give it, I, I think I would uh, make this a little bit perplex favored, but it's just due to historical precedence. I think that it could seriously go either way, and I would not be overly surprised. Yeah, I don't think you can let that O2 against Echo fool you. I mean, that was extremely close and perplex for putting together times that would have rivaled if not beaten a lot of the other ones we've seen this weekend against uh, a lot of other teams so we'll, we'll see how they do but uh, our very next match though we've got uh it's going to be sloth versus donuts and despair so another battle for survival here donuts and despair moving on they got knocked down but they got up again we'll see if sloth can keep them down but uh and sloth too you know they they looked good against Longning, but they looked a little bit sloppier than I think we saw from them yesterday. So they have a little bit of like uh, catching up to do too. I think if they want to be able to take down uh, Donuts and Despair, so I, I it feels like a toss up. Anyone want to give mean, a quick prediction before we go to break? Anyone brave enough? It's a it's sure. a cupsy it's a cupsy finals rematch. I mean, I think it's Donuts and Despair favored, right? It's Donuts and Despair, yeah, all the way. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah, Sloth Sloth is a good team. But I don't think they've looked particularly like insane this weekend. 
unless they pull out something that we haven't seen from them, it's going to be, it, it's a tough ask to think that they're going to be Donuts of Despair. Yeah, it's uh, today especially, they've looked a little bit rougher, but we'll see. You never know. Any given MDI is what they, you know, that's what they always said. That's what my mom always said way back in the day. Don't go anywhere. When we come back, our second, our third, rather, elimination match of the day, it's going to be Donuts and Despair taking on Sloth right here on the MDI Global Finals. We'll see you in just a bit.
And we are back here at the Mythic Dungeon International Global Finals. Doe, your host here, along with Zyronic, Nagura, and Makes, to get ready for our next match, our second to last match, our penultimate match of day two of the Global Finals. It's going to be Donuts in Despair taking on Sloth. Donuts in Despair uh, still alive a bit longer than people kind of expected. Meanwhile, Sloth, a little bit sloppy in their first game today. We'll see if they can pick it up a little bit and make this one competitive. But uh, I don't know. It seems like uh, more and more people are uh, getting on the Donuts in Despair uh, hype train. What do you think, Zyronic? Are, are you on the train of hype? Man, you know what? I think that they're a good, in a good spot oh, to go. easily make top four here. I think they're a favorite in this series. I did have them losing to Baldi and placing lower than them, but clearly I was very wrong there. Happens. I think they're playing pretty well, too. I mean, remember, this is a team that at the end of their bracket literally called out Echo and said, listen, man, you guys <laughs> look good, but we actually had to do hard keys on our bracket and we're coming for you in the global finals. <laughs> yeah. They've been playing pretty well. I mean, I, I could see them playing, you know, if they step their level up just a little bit more, they could definitely be on that competitive level with Echo and perplexed the way they've been playing this weekend. All right, so mix then. Uh, would you? I, I would assume you would agree. I think you were saying you you thought Donuts and Despair had the edge here. Would you? Would you say it goes as far as a two zero edge, or do you think well, it's going to be a two one? So in my pickings, I did think that Sloth were going to get eliminated in this series with a two one series, so a best of three, uh, uh -huh. where they get one game in. Uh, it wasn't against Donuts and Despair in my hat, uh, so. Maybe I'm way off base, but I could definitely see this go to the third map. All right, Nagura, what do you think? Uh, so I think Donuts and Despair are going to 2-0, but in Ooh, my pickems, right. I said Sloth is going to win this series, so I'm kind of torn because <laughs> I do want pickems points. <laughs> I mean, my my pickems for this one are Munka 2-1 over Perplex, so I'm I'm not getting anything out of this. As far as I know, but it looks like we're getting right into it. All right, Donuts and Despair, Sloth, we'll see who takes game number one. Yeah, and Here we're we right go. in. Seems like both teams decide to just skip on through. We have seen teams deploy a technique where they pull trash in the first area of this dungeon, but not Donuts and Despair and Sloth. They're going to move on and get these little mushrooms and the bow breakers pulled into this pack here. Both teams making their way. And uh, the big question is going to be, it's 24 fortified. Will they be able to one face the boss? Yeah, they definitely will. But I do think there's something very interesting going on here because both of these teams have already played Mists yesterday. Donuts and Despair had played a Rogue. They switched out the Rogue for the Windwalker. And Sloth also made a change to their strategy here because yesterday they actually played a Villager pack before they went to this second pool. And this time around they skipped it. But there we go, two deaths on Sloth's side, a full team wipe actually going Tragedy. on for Sloth, unfortunately. This is a huge time loss for them because now look at the gateway cooldown, they can't actually easily get back. Oh, yeah, okay, so we are restarting the key. Uh, looks like there were some issues, uh, technical issues. Maybe that's why they wiped, yeah, now it explains a lot. They, they wiped <laughs> on purpose, we're just getting the information. Yeah. So there it's not go. that yeah. we're restarting the key after they wiped, they wiped because we're restarting the key. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Specifically, no tragedy unfolded, it's all good. <laughs> When they configure the uh, the mists of Tyrannus Scythe key, they have to make sure that they're both in the same world state so that they get the same maze route, and that didn't happen here, mm -hmm. so that's why there's a restart. Ah, uh, makes sense. All right. Zyro with the big brain info. Comes yep. dropping the knowledge. So, yeah. Obviously, we, see, we need the same maze for both teams, otherwise it does change things significantly. So we're doing that. Yeah, but I mean, we already got some really interesting information, right? That thing that I talked about with the rope being switched out for a Windwalker hmm. or a Donuts in Despair. And then Sloth also not pulling that Villager pack, which mm -hmm. caused some issues last time they pulled it because of bolstering, right? Having the Villager with so much more HP than the rest of the mobs. Yeah. So yeah, slight adjustments for both of the teams. I'm really excited to see this dungeon play out. The fastest time that we did see was Echo with the 13 minutes and 16 seconds. And then the second fastest time was actually Donuts and Despair with 14.24. So Sloth know what it needs to do to beat Donuts and Despair, right? Um, 
Now the question is, can they do it? Did they practice enough? Did they find a route where they can actually shave something off? And Donuts and Despair will look at Echo's route and be like, they were quicker than us. Maybe there is something else we can do. And for them, apparently it was switching out the rope, like you said, Nagura. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I do well. think the Windwalker has a lot of value, especially in uh, like the maze area. Um... Because I think the rogue was a good idea when he wanted funnel damage because of bolstering, but overall, just having so much AOE damage uh, really just works out in mists, I think, because of all of those huge pulls you can do in the maze when you pull lots of uh, mobs through the wall, and then also the pulls that you do after the second boss, after Mist Caller. It's just such insane pulls, and having the extra damage from the Windwalker just, I guess, makes you be slightly faster. Could be. I mean, they already had a fast time anyway, like you mentioned. I mean, they were, came in second behind Echo as far as uh, miss we've seen this weekend. So we know they can already put up a good time. So I'm curious what sort of like uh, practice went on last night that uh, made them decide to kind of optimize it that way. We'll see if it pays off, but it's an interesting sign. Yeah. Especially when you see a team that already did well say, you know what, we're going to change something that's pretty major, honestly, and then count on that to work even better. One of the things yeah, that was interesting as well, right? They did Sorry, win, ahead, but one they of the things that, that was interesting yeah. in that in that key, I mean, Balta didn't particularly play it very well, and the thing that the rogue was supposed to do actually seemed worse than the monk doing it. So it makes sense that they would swap mm -hmm. to what they saw being better mm -hmm. than what the rogue was supposed to be doing, right? Like, sure. I don't think the rogue really gives too much. The one spot in the dungeon where I'd be like, okay, rogue is really cool here, is when you're just chain pulling trash packs into the final boss, right? That's the only spot where I'd be like, okay, a rogue is sick here. Everything else, unless you're like abusing Vanish to get through the mist walls quickly, I'd say you just want to play Monk over Rogue almost always in this dungeon. There All was right, something so in the mist runs that we did see, though, where Echo pulled the Gorge Gullet through the wall and bolstered it up. And we were all discussing whether or not they did that on purpose, like if they only wanted the relic pack and it didn't work out, or if that was actually the play. And their time was so fast, so we kind of were unsure if that just wasn't the fastest thing to do since bolstering um, yeah. runs out now that it's been like adapted a little bit. So after a while, these bolstering stacks will just run out and the mob will go back to its normal state. So how do you guys feel about that now that we've kind of had a night over and seen some more mists. I don't know. I, I'm still not <laughs> sure what the purpose of it would be, right? Because if you, because they pulled it through the well, right? It's because they they have to kill the guard gala to get through the maze, so they have to kill it eventually. But pulling it through the maze to the previous pack just to bolster it up and then pull even more trash on top of it, I like I just don't see the value in that. But then at the same time, maybe. It's because certain cooldowns are already there, so it makes sense to just get the damage onto it. And then afterwards, when it's bolstered, they just like kind of leave it there as they kill the other trash and wait until the bolstering like disappeared, the buff, and then they kill it off. Like maybe it is more efficient this way. Uh, I never thought of doing a pull like that. Uh, or never <laughs> thought it would be worth it to bolster a mop up. But now with the new bolstering with the duration, it is very possible that it's worth it if you pull around your cooldowns. Something I mean, I, I guess you can't can't argue with results either, right? Mm -hmm. So well, yeah, something else I want to focus on here as well is I already thought. I mean, I think most of us already thought that Donuts and Despair were a favorite, but this map pool seems really good for them too, right? They we already saw they had a decent run in mists yesterday, but remember, like way back in our time trials, they were one and two in streets and gambit in our time trials, like way too back two months ago. So like this right. particular map set to fight against them when they're already favorites. I mean, I think they're probably like 80 or 90% favorites to win this series just because of that. Well, you know, it's funny because they, I believe in time trials, like you're saying, they actually beat Echo in Gambit time. Yeah. But but mm -hmm. then they lost mm -hmm. Gambit versus Baldi yesterday. That was the only map they lost against them. Sure. So it's it seems like uh, there are ups and downs there as well. But uh, if they bring their A game, yeah, they can definitely be one of the fastest teams in the world on those maps. And they lost streets as well against Monka, but Monka did yeah, have the true. fastest time we've seen in the whole tournament, so yeah. uh, I guess there's that. Yeah, that I mean, I, I'd be very careful comparing teams to Monka in this tournament, yeah. <laughs> just based on what we've seen from them. 
but All right. we are back after the keys have been fixed. There was a technical issue for anyone that is wondering why the key is starting again. And once again, teams are making their way for the bosses. And we were speaking a little bit about like the first boss and one phasing it. And you were like, yeah, definitely they are. They are going <laughs> to one phase it. Uh, but we, we did see teams not make it, right? It, it happened before, no, I think not every ideally. Team... At least uh, with these affixes, like in the global finals, everyone won face the boss, I think. If I remember. I think there was one where it was like really close, but uh, yeah. Yeah, or it they like finish be... it off um, yeah, after exactly. like the drone and respond. Yeah. That definitely happened. And of course, you're gonna like lose a few seconds if you don't finish it during the damage amp phase. But as long as you don't get like a whole new phase and you don't. As long as you don't have to finish off the Droman again, yeah. uh, I think it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but looks like Donuts and Despair dropping pretty low as both of those uh, bow breakers are casting that AoE. And uh, they did do a really good job to make sure they proc it at the same time. Because uh, you don't really want to stagger it, because otherwise the AoE damage is just um, lasting for longer, which is just harder for the priest to heal. So really good job by Donuts and Despair. And then Sloth, on the other hand, Using the... is it physical damage? I guess it is, right? Because they use the Dwarf Racials to... Because the Dwarf Racial removes your debuff, but also gives you a physical damage reduction Malik, for a few seconds. Malik in so much trouble, rocking that Purgatory. Marky now also going down, so is Javier. They are having trouble with these interrupts. The Harvesters are just casting through, and this is going to be a full wide. This time, there is no reset plan. They're not going to get a reset of this key so definitely not planned of a wipe here well donuts and despair are using their bloodlust getting that ur down and slowly but surely making their way through the dromen sloth have to now play the villager again this is really really unfortunate for them yeah this is a huge time loss for sloth unfortunately they do have the bloodlust still for the boss so they can still get the one phase done there but yeah now they have to finish off the woe drifter pack here to be able to skip to the boss again and this is just a huge time loss for them donuts and despair though they are now on the damage amp phase on ingra and you can see just how fast the boss is melting with the pi and uh, the herb that they had earlier as well uh, on cryptics just insane damage they didn't quite manage to finish off the boss all the way during the amp phase Thought they will be able to finish. Actually, are they going onto? Oh no, it's just havoc. I think it's what? just a cleave damage that's going onto the drone, and I think most of the target damage is going onto Ingra as they're now moving towards the uh, not entrance yeah. but exit of the platform. And Sloth also have managed to kill Wo and are making their way towards the bowbreakers, but they only managed to kill off one of these six mobs of the first bowl. So they are really, really behind from here on out, plus the 30 seconds penalty that they have ramped up on their side. So uh, it, it is Donut and Despair's game to lose, to be honest. Yeah, the bowbreaker not going down as well means they have to basically solo this mob because of this bolstering. There's no point to pull the rest of the trash on top just yet. So yeah, just unfortunate timeless for Sloth. That also means the boss didn't spawn yet because you have to finish off that map uh, for the boss to even get engaged. So yeah, very unfortunate. As Donuts and Despair now goes into that maze, did pull the right side trash through the wall, and they are now it's all about bolstering management really in that maze area for them. Yeah, for sure. I'm so excited to see what they do with the mini boss, because <laughs> that's yeah. really the one thing I'm looking at for. Are they going to bolster it? What are they going to do? I like in my head, it makes the most sense to just play it solo until it's like decently low and then pull trash into it. But uh, yeah, I don't know what Echo did seemed really quick. So maybe I'm way off base. Donut and Despair are now adding some more trash through the wall here, making sure they get big, beautiful pulls using CCs to group everything up here. One of the defenders is coming a little bit low, will probably get bolstered just a tiny bit, but they will do a great job of just trying to even out these HP bars and not kill anything too early so they have bolstering under control. 
Yeah, looking pretty good. The defenders, as you said, are the mobs with the highest HP, so usually they get bolstered a little bit because you cannot control your damage that much, so it's inevitable to get some bolstering stacks on them. But uh, it is fine, SJ just finished him off. Of course, you cannot stand in the front, although, Ooh. as those bolstered up defenders just do a lot of damage. <laughs> Every other class would have died there. Crit oh, picks, probably. of course, yes. Warlock being able to survive. Um, but yeah, Sloth now also on the damage amp phase on Ingra, melting this faster. Damage is looking really, really well, but. I'm so sad <laughs> that they had this <laughs> unfortunate mishap at the start of the dungeon that has just thrown him way, way back. And uh, here we go, Donuts in Despair doing the echo thing. The girl yeah. they did pull the relics and with them came the Gorge Gullet, which is going to get bolstered up, but they don't seem to mind that. Yeah, I guess when you look at the cooldowns, right, Cryptics did have uh, Inferno already. So popping Infernal means you're definitely going to get a lot of um, damage onto the Gorge Gallet before the rest of the mobs die. So now in just a second, the Gorge Gallet is going to get bolstered up, but the damage that you did to the Gorge Gallet is still going to be very effective, right? So mm -hmm. they might pull more trash onto the Gorge Gallet in just a second, and then they'll just wait, right, until the bolster stacks like go away i guess or do they not pull more trash I, I so think... echo pulled more trash so they killed yeah they what, did for sure. what donut and despair are playing right now they just killed that off and then pulled some more into the gorge gullet mm -hmm. but I, I think i'm seeing the same thing as you're seeing which is the gorge gullet for donut and despair was like pretty low already before it got these bolstering stacks here so i think they might actually just leave it at that and we'll go with the frog to the... Did it, did yeah. they kill it? So it looked like it had a like... lot more HP. For a second I was like, did it <laughs> reset? <laughs> but no, they killed yeah, it. Just Everything's so... good. So they definitely didn't do the same thing as Echo did, but um, still felt like they pulled the Gorge Gold immediately. Maybe they thought they had a little bit more um, focus target damage, and they didn't lose too much time, honestly, because as you said, it was pretty low HP once the mobs died, so it, was, it wasn't too bad. As they're now moving on, pulling two trash mobs, uh, trash groups again um, through the wall here, uh, having Survival Hunter plus Windwalker cooldowns available as you look at the damage meter. Um, now the Infernal is being used as well, so it should be finishing off this really quickly, but the defenders again um, bolstered up pretty highly, so they have to watch out for those frontals. Yeah, definitely, but they aren't too much of a problem for Donut and Despair as they move on through the maze here, and this should be and is the boss platform. They will add some more trash from one of the other areas. The Fell Hunter is already running as they engage Mistcaller, and I kind of love and hate this boss. I really like that they are pulling trash onto it, just because, you know, you're gonna be here a while, you can't really melt it due to the forced intermissions you kind of need to play, but uh, it definitely adds some increased difficulty to keep those interrupts coming in together with the Vulpin that is just menacing about. Yeah, and uh, the hunter helping out the warlock here with the binding shot, making sure Cryptix doesn't have to run around. Even though you can cast Rain of Fire while running, honestly, so it's not too big of a damage loss for that <laughs> uh, warlock. <laughs> but the mobs are going lower and lower, but now the mobs are still alive and they have to deal with the intermission. This is usually the most difficult part because the mobs need to be moved to the um, symbol that you have to kill, to, the, to that clone. Uh, looks like he's not even moving there. Maybe for safety reasons, yeah. so you not have you don't have the frontals yes. on yeah. the phone. Yeah, pretty that sure sense. that is it. So for a second, I was like, oh, maybe Yip thought it was a different one. But these frontals, now that the defenders are bolstered up, are just deadly. So you want to try your very best to stand away from them. And since the melees need to DPS down uh, the correct symbol, or there's going to be a lot of group damage. It makes sense for Yip to just move these defenders away, making sure to not uh, inflict any additional damage onto the group, because he doesn't necessarily need to be there. It's a little bit of loss on uh, boss DPS, but I feel like it makes sense here. Yeah, I definitely like it for safety reasons, especially um, since they know that they're ahead of dungeon. Presumably they, they watch the stream. It is on a delay, but at this mm -hmm. point, they definitely know that Sloth had wiped at the very start. So if there's like 
s- small things they can do for safety, they should yeah. definitely do that. It's not that they can slow down their whole route now and just pull pack by pack or something, <laughs> but small things here and there are definitely worth it to slow down a little bit. That's so funny that you say that because often when when people or like people in chat sometimes read or uh, hear that the teams know when the better team wipes after the delay is over, they're like, so why are they not pulling pack by pack? And uh, <laughs> it, it, I understand that this is the first impulse that you get, but it makes the dungeon so much harder when you planned out like a bloodlust or all of your cooldowns for a big pull and suddenly you're dealing with all of that one by one, it's just going to make it so much harder for you and the healer as well uh, to, to get through these packs. So they will keep with their route, yeah. but like you said, um, where they can, they are going to shave off some of the damage and some of the risk if they can. Yeah, especially if you're running a Destro Warlock and if the Destro Warlock does so much of your group's damage, I think that is also something that uh, people sometimes ask me. It's like, why do Warlocks do so much damage, but um, Warlocks in my group don't do as much damage? <laughs> and it's just because Warlocks scale so well with big pulls. So yeah. the more you pull, the more damage your Warlock's going to do. And it just scales kind of exponentially because you get your Infernal back faster, you generate more shards. So if you always just pull three mobs, your Warlock is going to do very little damage. Well, if you pull six mobs at a time or ten, your Warlock is just going to scale infinitely upwards. So doing smaller pulls is actually really bad if you have a Destro Warlock. How to make a Warlock cry. <laughs> pull three yeah, mobs exactly. at a time. <laughs> but yeah. speaking of big pulls, Yip is just rounding up these mobs here. And uh, we're actually seeing the blood DK damage once again at the start of the pull just shooting up there. But here comes Anarchy. And I really like bringing the monk just for these packs here. They are so big. Also, the next pull that will probably go into the boss. The monk is just so fantastic on that. Gonna do so much damage. Obviously a little bit proc dependent, but yeah, I, I like this a lot better than the rogue that they had before. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, we're gonna be comparing the time afterwards. Of course, um, the times are always uh, a little bit weird to compare in mists because the maze um, is different. So between teams, it's really hard to compare times because uh, certain mazes are just quicker to clear through than others. Uh, but we can still compare it a little bit to Echo's time and maybe also to the time that Donuts and Despair had last time, which was mm -hmm. a 1424. They're definitely on track to possibly beat their own time. Not going to beat, beat uh, Echo's time, but maybe improving their own as they now engage Shredova. And there definitely is a lot of trash coming in as well there at the back that Yip did gather up. So they want to make sure they wait until everything is gathered because of bolstering uh, before they start AoE. Yeah, Bloodlust has been popped though, as only the relics kind of slowly range and they are blasting everything that they can. There's a lot of trash still in the area of the boss, a lot of the larva are getting killed right now. The Ur should probably die soon just to help a little bit with the additional damage that's coming in as Ur provides a healing buff as well. So that's just gonna make it easier for Timber to do DPS and the group to stay alive. But so far it looks as if most of the trash is dying pretty much around the same time. There's one stack horn that we can see that is, well, close enough to the size of Tredova now, but... <laughs> Uh, they will finish that off, and Trudova is down to 35%. Beautiful. Yeah, and I mean, look at that Warlock damage. Good job, Cryptics, pressing that Reign of Fire. Really well done. Uh, <laughs> and you can see 3% <laughs> trash left only, so they can either pull that into the boss at the end if they want to, or they can just play it safe and do it after the boss. As I said, they probably know they're a little bit ahead now, so they can just uh, finish off this boss cleanly, Make sure there's no things going wrong, especially because uh, that 3% uh, is nuked down pretty quickly on that last trash pull there. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I just feel like I have to explain it one more time. Uh, <laughs> be before chat gets all riled up, the maze is the same for both teams competing at the same time, but it yeah. differs between the series. So Echo might have gotten a different route 
than Donuts and Despair and Sloth at, but Sloth and Donuts and Despair have the same route. I know it's a little bit confusing, so just making sure we, we got that sorted. But I do think Echo had Gorge Gullet as well, and so had Donuts and Despair. True. So yes. the route should be similar to, to what we can expect, I think. Yeah, I think if you have the Gorge Gullet, it actually was the exact same route. So we can compare it. So we have a 1505 for Donuts and Despair as they win the first game against Sloth, and Echo had a 13. 16. So definitely a bit quicker, mm. but still really well done by Donuts in Despair. Very clean mistrun. Yeah, Donuts in Despair jumping out to a pretty strong start here in uh, their lower bracket match. Looking pretty good. A uh, little bit slower than their miss was on day one. So was it really an improvement, Zyronic? What do you think? Well, I think it's hard to take too much from this particular dungeon for a number of different reasons. And Nagura and Mix are covering this at the end of this uh, this last dungeon here. Yeah, maze. Mists just, just kind of has different mazes in the MDI and on live, and it's hard to tell which one's the good one, which one's the bad one. So is that 15 minute, four second a fair representation of how good they are? It's hard to say. And also, you have the fact that Sloth literally wiped in the first 30 seconds of the dungeon. They could be watching this stream at home. They, it has a one minute delay. You can see, oh, the other team wiped. Let's play safe, finish this, get our victory. We're in the lower bracket. Sure. We don't want to take any major chances here. They could have gone a little slower because of that because they were just playing clean. You know, it, it's hard to take into account. The fact that they were able to take a zero death dungeon was really impressive. And I think the even more impressive thing is the fact that this is a completely different strategy and comp than they ran yesterday. Remember yesterday, Anarchy was playing the rogue in this dungeon, right? Instead of doing anything they went yesterday, they saw Echoes run in this dungeon. And then you're like, you know what? We're taking your comp. We're taking your route and we're doing exactly that and they must have practiced this last night because it looked really good today they swapped the rogue to the monk they went for the same skips they didn't do the trash back at the start of the dungeon that means they had to pull more trash later on and they executed everything cleanly and perfectly so this is a team that has the capacity to try to make improvements and updates to their route mid-tournament in order to try to gain that much of an advantage over their opponents and this is the kind of thing you need to see from teams that want to go all the way and i'm loving it from donuts and despair here yeah, it is uh, looking like they are on track to make it through to the next round in the lower bracket. But, you know, we're not quite done yet, right? I mean, obviously their opponents have more tricks up their sleeves. We're not going to get to go to Theater Pain, which is kind of sloth's bread and butter, but we are going to Tazvesh Streets. Now, what we mentioned, though, as we look at some of the graphs here, is that uh, Streets, Gambit, both, uh, you know, those were the time trial dungeons. Those were the dungeons that Donuts and Despair excelled on. So, you know, we'll, we'll see if Sloth can hang. <laughs> anyway, looking at the damage done. It's a bit of a different there. That's a bit of a bit of a peak a bit of there a, around uh, 1330 well, it's not or so. really comparable since <laughs> Sloth yeah, like, wiped yeah. everything yeah. got of yeah. stuff. So. That's okay. Oh, dude, we do get to see that 400k, <laughs> or sorry, 450k group DPS peak at the final that is boss a lot there of damage. Pull, like 20 <laughs> trash mobs on top of the boss. Yeah. It's pretty pretty fun to see. That is an enormous amount of damage anyway, slices. Yeah, you can't really compare, but uh, in an in a individual sense, that's a, a huge amount of DPS being put out, for sure. So, looking ahead. Uh, Sloth, any any hope here? I mean, I think they have a bit, of course. And we, I think going into today, maybe some of us were over uh, overestimating Sloth a little bit. Because uh, they played well yesterday. They did look pretty good yesterday, aside from being, you know, knocked down to the lower bracket. Overall, they put on a mm. solid show versus Echo, right? But... I think as time goes on, we are seeing that they might not be like a top, you know, half team, a top four team per se in the tournament. Well, let's be honest. I do they, think, um, go ahead, say, They kind of got more dugged. They had to play against Echo in the first round. What can you do? It happens, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little bit of a low roll, yeah. Uh, I did want to say that um, I think Streets is also a dungeon where... We haven't really seen like the perfect route yet. I think there's definitely things uh, that you can come up with, improve on. And Sloth, again, is that team that has done that before, especially in the theater of pain. Other teams have been copying their strategies. So that is, in my opinion, a dungeon where they can show something new and possibly surprise us with a really fast strategy, especially because uh, Donuts and Despair had banned this map against the Baldi and when they played it against Monka, they lost as well. So it is possible that uh, Sloth somehow has like a really cool strategy up their sleeves. Or I watched um, Monka play this dungeon yesterday, who had a really, really fast run. Not only that, we just saw 
Baldy in the streets and that looked really fun as well i i wish they would have executed it um without the the oopsies that happened because playing the core hounds and the cats like i, I really want to see where this route is going i'm here for it maybe uh sloth has you know a trick up their their sleeve and it is a core hound or something i'd, I'd kind of be here for it I mean, they're going to have something, right? They're, they're going to have to have some sort of very solid plan because we know that it seems like Donuts and Despair are going to play things pretty cleanly. So if you don't have anything like that planned, then you might run into a little bit of trouble. So we'll see. We'll see. So right. do you guys expect Sloth to take the streets? Or I, Nagura, you said 2-0. Do you stand by that? Or... Yeah, I think I stand by it <laughs> yeah. unless they have something crazy for streets, right? Which I think it's possible, but we know that Donuts and Despair are able to adapt their strategy because they did that for Mists. And we saw Monka have a really fast streets, and I think uh, Donuts and Despair is capable to maybe replicate that or get close to it. Uh, so then it's going to be hard for Sloth to beat them, I think. Yeah, I mean, you just looking so? at the... I'm looking at the times yesterday when Donuts and Despair played against Monka on streets, and it's like, boss one, that, that phase was uh, 338 to 247, so that one, Donuts and Despair, considerably slower, but then the second part, they were only one second... They were one second ahead, actually, of Monka on the second part. Third part, they were less than 30 seconds different, so they played it pretty close. Now, though Monka beat them, Donuts and Despair was on track to set a pretty good time themselves, so I, I think if I were Sloth, I would be, I would be uh, very concerned. Yeah. I, I agree with what, there's, what you guys are all saying as well. I think Donuts Despair is a favorite here. I think they're going to very easily go back and be like, okay, our streets was not that great. We didn't play poorly. We had zero deaths, but the Demon Hunter pick was just not it. Mm -hmm. just, just, to point, just to throw this out there, Donuts Despair has played seven maps in this tournament, right? Seven maps in this tournament. Anarchy's played four classes. He's played Rogue, <laughs> wow. Monk, Warlock, and Demon Hunter. I'm pretty sure wow. they could easily have him play Warlock and have Cryptics flex to, ma flex to Mage just like they do in a couple other dungeons. Mm. And they'll probably just be faster in this dungeon as long as they've gotten a few practice runs in. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's what we see here. Because that definitely is yeah. a better comp to run here. It is impressive. I mean, the flexibility definitely helps a lot in a situation like this because then you can kind of min-max, right? You know, there's a lot of compositions that can work, but when you can really do the optimal comp every single time, that's obviously going to get you the better time at the end of the day, so cool to see. Yeah, there's some things you can do with mage in streets, right, Sarah? What exactly can you, like, spell steal or do there are mage? some There are some spell stealable buffs at the start of the dungeon, but they're not, like, too significant. If I remember properly, I'm pretty sure it's just, like, a haste amplification. Uh, okay. It does help a little bit, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's anything that you, like, craft your dungeon route around. I think it's just a very, very solid single target option for most of these bosses. And mm -hmm. while I don't particularly agree with the idea of it being really good in this dungeon, I think it's just an okay tyrannical thing. Like, Mage really, really excels on pure single target damage. Most of the bosses in here you pull trash on top of, so that kind of like takes away from the Mage a little bit. But I think it's still okay. Well, I am... So, uh, I'm... Uh, oh, go ahead. So why do you feel like the Demon Hunter is such a bad choice in comparison? Because Demon Hunter does like good single target damage not mage single target damage but like good single target damage and decent aoe so why why do you feel like that's such a bad you just answered Sarah? your own question not as much as mage <laughs> but they do literally good aoe go. in comparison <laughs> and like basically every poll except for solia and even solia we have seen teams pull a lot on i feel like it's not that bad as a choice to be honest it might be my demon hunter bias but I wouldn't be mad to see the Demon Hunter again, and here oh, we go, and yeah. it's actually doing hey, it. Hey, called it. Okay. See? All right. See, see if Dodes and Despair can get the 2-0 with the DH. <laughs> Hopefully. So, uh, Sloth on the other side deciding to go with the Monk instead. How, how do you feel about that, Nagura? I think it's fine. Like, I actually think um, in streets there's a lot of different comps you can run, um, and it's all kind of fine. I think the route is so much more important, and it just depends who can execute it. There's a lot of trash you pull on bosses. Uh, there's a lot of, um, like you know, like snapping of enforcers and so on. So if you can play around that properly, I think any class can do well somewhat. 
Uh, but there we go, Sloth actually doing a pretty significant pull on the right side of the screen, also using their Bloodlust for this pull as well. Yeah, and uh, that is actually something we have seen from teams before, but when we've seen that, they had already gotten the Portal Mancer, uh, which is the mob you have to kill before the boss actually spawns, a little lower than that. So I think Donuts and Despair will pull that Bloodlust once uh, Sofax is actually there. They pull Trash into that as well. Seems like, yeah, so here we go. Yip is actually grabbing stuff from the back, then the pack on the left, and then Sofax, and this will be the Bloodlust for Donuts and Despair. And I actually like that a little bit more. I feel like the first Bloodlust was really, really early here, and the only, the only justification I have for using it this early is when you feel like you won't get it on Solia unless you commit it this early. But that would mean they have an insane route, right? Yeah, there's no way. Uh, I do like the Bloodlust as well on Donuts and Despair side, as you said, just having more um, last timer on the boss. And then the way they pulled the trash, because they had the same amount of trash pulls when you think about it, as Sloth did a bigger pull at the start, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're faster, because Donuts and Despair just deals with the trash while fighting the boss, so therefore <laughs> they're not actually losing time or anything. So I do like that strategy of Donuts and Despair more. Uh, you do see a little bit of a trash advantage for Sloth, 2 extra percent, but Donuts and Despair is now pulling even more trash onto the boss now. have to be a bit careful with all those weapons coming out of the boss and all those interrupts that need to be done on this trash pack. Yeah, for sure. So this is the route that we did see before, where you kind of uh, drag the boss along and, and add some more trash every time. But it seems like, did they also pull the securities on the door? Or are they still there? I can't see right now because Timber's looking in the other direction. But I thought I just saw a door without moths on it. And if they did that, that's actually new. So before teams had left the two securities there, went with Woe and just skipped past them since the securities are a little bit annoying. But Donuts and Despair deciding to pull one of the two. Huh. Yeah, so... Those mobs, they actually put these beams, the slicers, onto the floor. And if you pull both of them, the full room is just going to be full of slicers and it's really annoying. So usually teams end up pulling one of them because uh, some of the slicers are fine. You just don't want to have multiple ones. But there we go. Sloth is already on their way as they did finish off that boss. Half the Woe Drifter buff as well. You can see Malik just walking all the way through, starting the event. And now pulling the Peacekeeper into Sorry. the mail room, possibly? Oh, I think they might be doing something similar that um, Balti did. Yeah? Hmm. I mean, I really See, all like the this. Members are here. Seeing the bloody cage just run, I don't know, a marathon and then grab some trash around the corner seems fun. Marky is coming in the back. There's a Warlock portal and he just came in the room assumedly also pulled something yeah so he pulled a relic pack and put a woe drifter oh, yeah. down using that uh shadow melt so hmm. they they have that woe drifter up and ready when they're finished with this post boss but right now they're dealing with the trash and we'll do the boss first right so yeah. that is the plan and i kind of really like it but is everyone here yeah everyone's here i didn't see simpkins for a while but but he's in the group I like this as well this is pretty risky though and this is a strategy they have to do i like it a lot by sloth as they now finish off the male elemental to get the haste bubble they do have another one vanish around the corner if they want another bubble and now they have double woe drifter so they have one woe drifter here in the boss and then the other one that um, you mentioned before marky did uh, spawn and use Shadow Melt to just have it stay there. So we'll see what they use those two Woe Drifters for. But there we go, another Haste Bubble has spawned, and you can see the last Elemental is banished in the corner, so they can use it as well in just a second once they um, deal with these bombs that are all over, uh, scattered all over the floor. Yeah, I mean, Mickey is already there waiting for the briefcases to get thrown into his face and the team is happily obliging, happy that they can keep on DPSing and it's now only the healer's job to dunk them into this little vent. But Donuts and Despair is having some trouble as Snack goes down 
while fighting this postmaster they do have a battle rest available and will use it but they need to be careful here that is a very scary pull that they're doing right now timber using that guardian angel making sure he survives here and arnak is dropping so low but it looks like they can manage to live here yeah, that was scary. Thankfully, Smack didn't use um, their cooldowns yet. Um, so once the rest came up, it managed to use all of those cooldowns. Also got use of the Ur buff as well, plus that Haze bubble. So didn't lose too much time, honestly, on their side. And look at the track percentage. They actually dealt with some extra trash in comparison to Sloth. So even though they pulled the boss quite a bit later, they dealt with everything really quickly, as the boss was already on 28%. That was just a lot of damage coming out of Donuts and Despair there. Maybe because of that Havoc uh, Demon Hunter doing so a lot of damage as well. Um, but Sloth now having that Woe buff and it looks oh, like oh, uh, yes. Malik is doing some interesting route here. Pulling the Diagorn plus the so Cats happy. as well. <laughs> and moving it all the way to the Menagerie while the Priest in the meantime is doing um, the event with the trade goods. This doing means they do healer. not have a healer, but they're getting the Night Claws, and these jump around and do significant damage, so the team has to survive now, and here comes the Direhorn also charging in on Malik. This pull is really, really crazy without that Priest, so this team is just surviving, no healer. Mickey is still not here, they need to get him back with the group, I would assume he's in range soon-ish now, and it looks like I think they're just doing a fantastic job of that. The Night Claws are dying. Javier is taking a lot of damage there for a second, but it is all okay as Alcross does its little slam and the rest of the group kills the Night Claws. Mickey is back with them. Simkin's getting significant damage from that Dire so for a second. Though. But uh, they should be fine here. They still have Vi to kill I mean... whenever they go to Gold Fuse. This is really crazy. They just crazy. barely managed to finish off that mob because it was so highly bolstered and it was just about to charge to a person. And I think that might actually just kill you if, if it says like 50 bolster stacks from these uh, night claws. But yeah. thankfully they did manage to finish it off. And they even have another peacekeeper that snapped to them somehow. Uh, or more. I wonder <laughs> yeah, if that two was... peacekeepers. Where did they come yeah. from? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder Maybe if it was Mickey their priest. Yeah, yeah, that's possible. This is so smart. I really like this by Sloth. This is so much efficient trash they're getting while just fighting bosses. Yeah, I mean, I I'm a little bit sorry uh, that we kind of neglected Donuts and Despair, who are also on Alcrux, have made their way here after uh, an unfortunate death on the Postmaster boss. But it's just, we've never seen this routing from any team before. We did see Baldi today play some of that trash, but not together with the Menagerie bosses. And I'm just really excited for it. Uh, we did see that bolster charge on Simkins, who is a warlock, mind you. And he nearly died from it um, before it had the final bolstering stacks. So I'm with you. I think that would have killed whoever got hit by it. And I'm happy they were able to, to kill it off first. And now they're going to finish off Acolyte and are on to Venza. So right now a little bit in the lead. Although trash count is pretty even. 1% less than Donuts and Despair. Yeah, Sloth definitely a little bit in the lead here. Um, because they managed to get the trash so efficiently, being able to waste less time dealing with trash and fighting bosses more, while Donuts and Despair is, I would say, only slightly behind, just a couple of seconds, so this is still incredibly close between those two teams. But after this, there's really not much trash left for either of the teams. I think um, a lot of trash is going to get pulled onto the Oasis. We did see uh, the mini boss, for example, being snapped onto that boss, which I do think both Donuts and Despair and Sloth might uh, do as well. And then they're also going to pull an Enforcer onto the last boss. So I think it's just going to be back-to-back -back bosses now with Trash, which is going to be hard to execute. And Sloth did just now get that Woe Drifter as well that they pulled into the boss room at the very end. Yeah, so they have super speed to get out of here. Also, a Warlock portal still being down, so they can move on to the Oasis like you just said, and I would expect them to take the mini boss with them. Now, Simkins is waiting here, and it seems like that's what they're setting up for. Okay, I'm confused. Here's Malik, yeah. 
So Malak is pulling this both. pack. And so far. Okay, that is actually ooh. Wrath walk into <laughs> into <laughs> running. <laughs> oh, I really like this routing. I think it's so fun. There are some lackeys that they need to take with them as well, but Malik is on its way, and this is really, really good. It's going to snap the mobs back here. Healer needs to look out for this blood decay, as there's a lot of damage coming in now, but having the enforce area makes it a little bit easier to kill everything off, as it provides an additional AoE uh, debuff. This means they are also going to take a little bit more damage, but so are the mobs. So, really, really smart technique from Sloth here. We've seen this by added teams as well. Donuts and Despair now also on their way. Let's see what they take with them. Yeah, that mini mobs can be dangerous, though, especially because we have bolstering, right? And the Enforcer and the other trash that they pulled definitely have less HP. And you can see the mini boss bolstering up quite highly. Uh, look at Scary. that. This is going to be very oh. dangerous to finish off for them. Um, as Donuts and Despair did something very similar on their side. I'm not sure if they only pulled the miniboss or also an enforcer. I don't see an enforcer. So maybe they only pulled the miniboss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they only pulled the miniboss. Um, but a Sloth managed to kill theirs. So they're now waiting for the remaining trash on this boss fight. As Donuts and Despair is right behind them. Sloth now on 92%, which is enough. They can just take whatever is missing up to Susolia. And now it's all kind of how quick can they get there, how much damage do they have, and does Donut and Despair have more damage? Both of the teams are going to keep their Bloodlust, I would assume. But I'm, you know, looking at the timer, 12 minutes 30. I'm still not happy with the first Bloodlust timing from Sloth. I feel like they could have delayed this a little bit and would have been even faster. I agree. I still think the first part of the dungeon was played a bit better by Donuts and Despair, but then Sloth just made up so much time by uh, that creative strategy that they came up with in this dungeon. And this is exactly what we talked about whenever we say that Sloth is so good with coming up uh, with new strategies. This is exactly what they did in this dungeon, and it's really working out for them so far, as uh, they are ahead to Donuts and Despair a couple of seconds, engaging the boss now in that oasis, and then the only thing that is left between them and moving on uh, into the third game is uh, doing the last boss with an enforcer. So they still need 8% trash, which um, I guess they're going to be getting by snapping it up onto last boss. And if it's an enforcer, as you said earlier, it's actually a buff, so a debuff that gets applied to all the mobs around the enforcer, making them take more damage. And since they also have Bloodlust available, the last boss is just going to be absolutely melting. Yeah, I'm actually thinking if it was uh, Donuts and Despair uh, who took two enforcers up to Celia in their early yeah, run today. Did, yeah. I think it was them, right? So we mm -hmm. have seen them do this and I really like that as well. They unfortunately didn't win because Monka was just a little bit quicker, but I think if they do this again, they might, they might actually uh, catch up to Sloth. They're now, well, the full Sokroth boss fight behind. I'm like running past the portal. Does it stack? Then, like, I'm not, does the Enforcer debuff stack? Is it I mean, gonna get applied uh, twice? Uh, 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 <laughs> you're asking the stupid Melly. How would I know? I just saw Donut and Despair is doing it, so I'd assume that it must stack, but. I mean, somebody's Maybe they gonna just correct want me more on trash this anyway. Percentage. I don't know. <laughs> We'll see though, as the Sloth is now on the last uh, boss's platform. Um, you do see the circle is already set up, so I assume Simkins has already pulled the enforcers. There we go. They did snap up to the boss room. Um, do they have an enforcer? I only see peacekeepers. Oh, there it is. All right. Here it is. Uh, so now they just want to pull the boss on top, use the bloodlust, and just kill it as fast as possible. I have to be a bit careful with bolstering onto the enforcer to make sure it doesn't become too huge. Oh, Mickey. But, uh, yeah, Mickey let's... taking so much damage. The guardian angel has been used on Simkins to make sure Simkins doesn't get melee when everything snaps up. So desperate prayer now being used. Uh, this holy priest doesn't have any defensive left. So uh, need to be very careful now, but should be all fine as they're porting around trying to get to this boss here. So Asmi on the double technique. They're gonna kick this really late to make sure they get the most out of their 
uptime on this boss. Donuts and Despair are on their way, but I don't think it will be enough. Cryptic's placing that demonic circle, and once more, we're not getting to see how much damage they can actually get out of this enforcer snapping that we saw them do earlier, but it seems like they're only getting one now. Maybe the second one was accidental earlier? No, I think they got two, because they need 11%, and it looks like they were pulling two. Either oh, yeah, way, I do think, on. as okay, you said, okay. it's too little too late, probably, yeah. because Sloth is already on 20% of the boss, so they don't need much more to finish this off. And they also have zero deaths on the board. This was such a clean run by Sloth, I really, really like their strategy. Um, and now they're just outrunning the circle here, uh, which actually could cause some problems if they don't finish off the boss quickly, uh, because that dog <laughs> might just damage. kill them. There we they go, it's coming damage. closer. So close. Three percent, two percent. The warlock's gonna live anyway, so <laughs> karma being go. used. That's the one to one for sloth. Yeah. All right, sloth gets it done. Uh, <laughs> Mark the celebration, the angel activation at the end there, of course, doesn't count against them. The map is already over, but uh, sloth does it. And honestly, whether they win or lose this series, they will go down as like one of the best innovative teams we've seen in MDI, I think. Uh, that that route was pretty wild, wasn't it, uh, Zai? Yeah, that was pretty cool. And we'll, cover, we'll, we'll cover it with a couple of clips later on, but yeah, this Sloth team, even if they might not end up going further on in this competition because of how good Donuts and Despair is, they're definitely one of the teams that have left their mark on the MDI this season overall. That theater route that we saw both Echo and Perplex take elements of and fit them into their comp earlier this weekend, this route that I'm sure teams are going to take a look at and figure out what they can do to make it even better as well, these guys are really great at coming up with really cool, innovative strategies, and I just love to see it. But let's take a look at what they ended up doing there. After they killed the first boss, they got their World Drifter buff, like most teams tend to do. But their Priest and their Warlock ended up going towards the left side of the dungeon for a couple different reasons. Number one, the Priest has to mind suit the mini boss so they can get by, and the Warlock sits behind and makes sure that he actually starts the RP for this dinosaur to spawn as well. That allows them to pull that trash mob later on in the dungeon. The Priest will go on to do RP on the right side, opening up the Oasis. And also the other reason they come to this left side of the dungeon is they start the RP for the Menagerie as well. So they're unlocking every single set of RP in the dungeon so they don't have to wait for anything later on in the dungeon. At the same time, the Windwalker Monk, the Blood Decay, and the Hunter are over here on the right side of the dungeon, setting up their big Postmaster pole on the right side, getting some Relic Packs ready to go so they can really get beefed up and do a bunch of damage to this boss. Now. It's not all positives. The one negative here is that you're not really pulling trash on top of the Postmaster, but in the end, what this route allows you to do is actually skip one major trash pack throughout the entire dungeon. And one less trash pack can be a big deal in the grand scheme of things in the MDI. It's all about consolidating your pulls together and being as efficient as possible and getting free trash count like this Dire Horn plus the Nightclaws on top of the Menagerie, which is a long boss. It's pretty nice. It's pretty efficient. And you can see by the end of the dungeon, this netted them about a one-minute advantage over what we saw from Donuts and Despair. I mean, this was a very clean strategy. Didn't really seem that dangerous, and I like the fact that you open up the dungeon, set up all the RP, get it out of the way early, and you don't really end up losing that much time. If they could just find a way to get the trash on top of Postmaster, that would be like the icing on the cake here. That would make this so much faster. This would be faster than like what we've seen from Monka as well this weekend. They'll get them one step closer to the, the perfect Zyronic route, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> But every team aspires to, yeah. But uh, it was it was pretty great, and we have a series on our hands. It is a 1-1 one, one tie between Don'ts and Despair and Sloth. And I guess the question going into the next one makes is, like, does Sloth have something equally cool, equally innovative for our next map, which is going to be Gambit? That one, you know, do you feel like there's as much room to do things like what we see on street? I feel like Gambit can be a bit more straightforward at times. I'm not sure. I mean, it's such a short dungeon with so many quick hits, right? It all comes down to yeah. trash on bosses, right? Yeah, I exactly. mean, uh, to be honest, I was just looking at the bracket, and so far, <laughs> Donuts and Despair's games have always gone to the third one. And uh, they did go to one in the first one, and then one, two in the second one. So maybe this is where they go to one again, just doing some, you know, quick maths. I do think you can do something with Gambit, depending on how risque you want to be. We did see some strange techniques where trash was being pulled onto Solia, and uh, that was very scary. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know who's going to make this. 
I think it's definitely an interesting uh, third dungeon because we have seen Sloth um, lose to Echo and have like a full team wipe. And then at the other hand, they also had a zero death run against uh, Long Ming. And then Donuts and Despair, I think they had a very unique strategy where they pulled a lot of Murlocs onto the Guardians. And we haven't seen any other team do that. But then they actually lost to Baldi with this strategy because they uh, also pulled a lot of trash onto the second boss and ended up healing that boss a lot. So I wonder if they changed up their strategy or if they stick to that strategy and just thought, oh, we didn't execute it properly. It's actually really fast. I mean, at any rate, it, it does seem like Dungeons and Despair is, is uh, still comfortable with these dungeons, even if they did lose that last one, but they still were putting together something pretty decent either way. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's really tough to call. I think coming into this one, a lot of people saying Dungeons and Despair, the fan vote definitely went that way in the, the pickums. But now I think it comes down to, you know, what has Sloth got to show us on, uh, on Gambit? So I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for this next one. Was it... Was it Sloth that did the, the second boss with Trash Lust, if I remember properly? I feel like they did something weird in this dungeon back in the in their cup as well. So I maybe feel like they... if you remember a team doing something weird in a dungeon, it might have been Sloth. Yeah, that's it's probably <laughs> yeah, a that pretty is, good that is chance. True. That is true. <laughs> Which, if credit to them, so far it has mostly worked out, so I really like it. Um, I do think it was them, where they held on to that Bloodlust to really go big on Time Captain Hooktail, but I feel like with Sanguine that's not really practical. So they I might think they're doing this pool, normally. both of the teams actually, without Lust. Yeah. Like I think yeah, they, yeah, they don't exactly. even need the Lust for it. But yeah, hmm. we'll see I mean, if it works out. When, uh, when these teams played Gambit against each other in the finals of Group C, that was a map win for Donuts and Despair. So historically, oh. they've got the lead in, the, in, uh, in this series, but uh, and, and that's something that we mentioned earlier, but I'll mention it again, that this is a rematch of our finals from Group C, but it's also a rematch of our semifinals in the upper bracket from Group C as well. So these teams have played each other twice before in MDI this season already. So they're very familiar with each other. They know they need to kind of get crazy with that. Um, so now, you know, Sloth, can they win a map that they lost to Donuts and Despair way back when in Group C? Seems so long ago, doesn't it? Well, which will it be? That's the thing. Production has given us the perfect line to, oh, we'll to start say off this three with. All right. Will it be donuts? <laughs> well, or will it be despair? It. <laughs> you know, oh, man. we got I both believe combined. You said it. We got both combined. <laughs> Terrible. Get out. We can reign supreme. <laughs> there you go. Whose cuisine reigns supreme? Donuts and despair. Sloth. Let's see who takes it. Let's see who moves on. Yeah, and we're in the game. So far, it looks pretty equal. I didn't expect anything less in terms of classes. I think, Nagura, you can agree with me on this one, that that's pretty much the classes that you would want to bring to this gambit. Yeah, for sure. It looks like Donuts and Despair is the team that is holding on to their bloodlust, though, as Sloth is committing this on their first pull here. Uh, looks like a little bit of sanguine healing going on for Donuts and Despair, as Sloth dealing with it a little bit better. As uh, ah. Donuts has that cast of the Goliath go off. Good mass grip, good Ooh. mass grip. And the Shining Force following up. Uh, they did, did have some Sanguine healing, as the healing meter now correctly is showing. Uh, they had the uh, Warlock stun on everything, as some of them have died. So 1.15 million healing on Sloth's side. Not ideal, but 34% already, and uh, the... Icy pass from the DK coming in, helpful here, as they move on Donuts to the Relic despair. pack. They yeah. are still doing it, but their healer actually goes down. Timber goes oh. down. They do have a Battle Rush available. They need to get him up really quickly. But yeah, this is the, the Donuts and Despair pool. This is what they saved Bloodlust for. They pulled mm. a lot of Murloc packs, plus all of these Guardians around the corner here. And look at all the crackling bolts lines coming out of these mobs. And uh, with the healer death, uh, not costing them too much, honestly, because, I mean, as long as the damage dealers and the tanks are alive, you're fine, right? Uh, there's not too much damage going out in the group as long as you dodge everything. But now honest, all of the Murlocs are running away, and they have to be careful with Sanguine. 
I severely hate this pull for the bloodlust from Donuts and Despair. And it's not because I think it's a bad idea or it's not efficient, but I just feel the pain from Anarchy and Smacked going into this. Because <laughs> they're barely going to get melee uptime with these crackling boys in there. And having that bloodlust committed here with two melee classes, it just ooh, it feels a little bit bad for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm honestly also not the biggest fan of this Pool. Just because, uh, as you can see, Sloth, for example, they're pulling the Guardians onto the boss. And I still think that is like the most efficient way to deal with this trash. And yeah, it's annoying to have uh, to dodge. But I think the Hunter, for example, uh, can do a lot of stuff from range anyway. And the Monk has a lot of defensive to just stay in. So I do think as long as you uh, don't have the boss heal with Sanguine, it's much more efficient to deal with the Guardians on the boss. But as it looks, both of them do have the same percentage on, of, the, of the trash, and the boss is pretty similar HP as well. And starting the intermission phase at approximately the same time, so this is incredibly what? close. Is it really the same time though? Donuts and Despair is like 8 boss percentages behind Sloth in terms of phasing, and we did have teams not being able to one face this boss. Now, Donut and Despair already pulled Hillbrand way to the side before the first uh, intermission here to make sure they get the most uptime. Sloth didn't even do that, so I kind of feel like they have a really good chance of one phasing it, whereas with Donuts and Despair, I'm not sure. It could become very tight. Yeah, it's weird because they didn't actually pull any trash on top of the boss. So they should have technically been able to focus everything onto boss. But I guess because they did this big pull before, maybe mm. a lot of the cooldowns were just not ready for them. But let's see, both of them are actually looking really good. There's still a lot of Here energy um, that Hilbrun has to recover for that second uh, intermission to start. And I think both of them should be fine. Maybe yeah. for Sloth it's going to be a bit close. Yeah, so like you said, they must have used all of their cooldowns, of course, in the Bloodlust pull which then meant they didn't have cooldowns for the boss pull, but they got them now, so they're gonna make it, Ooh. hopefully, 3%, 2%. Don't Sloth did it! No, oh. they didn't make it! Oh. <gasps> this is such a big time loss for Donuts and Despair, because now they have to finish off those purifiers that they actually just hard to see. No. They had them seceded in the corner, now they have to finish them off, which is gonna take a long time, and then put those runes into the area as well oh my god sloth has a huge opportunity to catch up here or to just run ahead really because they also have more trash nine percent more trash percentage on sloth's side because they did more murloc pulls earlier which means that they can skip something later on we do know they're skipping that star seer which is not something you like to see <laughs> i um, hate it so hopefully that works <laughs> the worst this time. <laughs> maybe maybe they heard me and they were like okay yeah she's right let's just play it I, I'd be here for that, honestly. Hopefully. <laughs> you can give credit to me later on Twitter. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they definitely have a lead in right now as they're dealing with these deckhands. Going to go down and then we'll do the big pull into Time Captain Hotel that we just spoke about before these matches here started. And uh, it, I'm really looking out for Sanguine. That's, that's the one thing that can take so much time here. So they need to be very careful with that. They did have significant Sanguine healing on the first pull. So this time around, Sloth better be very careful with what they're doing with their CCs. Here we go. Now let's take a look at Sloth as they're pulling everything on top of the boss. Did finish off that Ur Relic as well. They probably want to focus it to get a little bit of a breather for the Ooh, tank, as there's just so much Ooh, tank damage. Mass nice mass grip coming in Let's from Malik there to make sure oh, everything is out of that Sanguine. And there is definitely some healing going on, as you can see in the healing meter. But as long but as it's not okay. the boss, then it's fine, honestly. Yeah, as long as the boss is not healing, we're good. It, it, it seems a lot, because suddenly it's becoming a lot. I think it's the brutes that are getting healed up in it, which is making it like stack up even more. But uh, they had like 500k or something. Like it wasn't too bad. And uh, on the left side of the screen, we can actually see Donuts and Despair, who are now also on that pull, and they have a little bit more even, and uh, now trying to DPS down this boss, but the Brutes are on to smack, they're not going to get this breath, so this is really unfortunate. Timber in a little bit of a pickle back there, but has managed to get rid of the Brutes that were looking for him, 
So yeah, looking a little bit messy on Donuts and Despair side. Yeah, thankfully all the trash is done though, other than those boss mobs. So that's something at least. We don't see any more sanguine pools on the floor. They all just despawned. So no more... They're not afraid anymore of healing the boss, which is the most important thing. So good for them. But yeah, still, a little bit of trash difference uh, in favor of Sloth. Meaning they have to deal with less trash in the last boss room. And they're of course ahead on the boss DPS as well, because they did do all of this a little bit quicker because of the extra advantage they got, the 20, 24 seconds advantage they got on the first boss. Yeah, for sure. So 7% to go. And then it really comes down to how are they going to execute the Solia stuff? Because mm. I, I, I'm a little bit scared, Nagura. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah. lie. Um, I, I wish they would just play it a little bit safer, but I don't think that's in the cards for Sloth today. Yeah, and the thing is as well, because the last time they did manage to execute it, with that Star Seer being there, but they... It took them so long to get the boss out of the intermission phase because they didn't manage to hit all of those relics. And even that is a time loss, right? So Donuts and Despair not being that far behind, if that happens again and they don't manage to get um, the boss out of the intermission quickly, that might just make Donuts and Despair catch up to them again. So they have to be careful with this strategy. But there we go, Sloth did engage Solia now with one of those star seers. Yeah, one of the Star Seers is in, and the other one is Mind Sooth in the back, just making sure they're not having any problems with that one. There is a Pulsar that's now dying, and here we go, the trash will get added into this pull soon enough. The Star Seer needs to die, and then they're gonna pull some more what's behind them to add up their trash count. Ur should die before that, so they get a little bit of extra healing. And now we need to look out where the collapsing stars are going. Seems like it's fine. Mickey is already running in there. He cannot see it right now, but it's close enough that he doesn't have to get into aggro range with the other stars here. So good for Sloth. And Donuts and Despair are now oh. also on Solia. And it looks like they're doing the same thing just on the other side with additional difficulty as they pulled all of the trash onto it. Yeah, this might help them to catch up. But this is so difficult to execute, especially because it's uh, sanguine, right? They have to watch out so much to not heal Solia. And we definitely have some healing going off already, as you can see in the healing meter. And that star seer is dropping really low, though. There's so many casts they have to watch out for with the trash pack. And now the second star seer is being engaged as well. They're really... Uh, oh no, some heals going off there. As they didn't have any more AoE stuns or interrupts left. So definitely some heals that went off there. Yeah, so Sloth at the same time is playing their relic packs and they managed to do just that without pulling the stars here. But there's also a, a little bit of Sanguine on the floor that's now healing up some of these accomplices here. And we want to get rid of these quickly as possible. Malik fighting for his life. Donuts and Despair, they had two deaths and they don't have a battle rest left. So they rest Anarchy back up, they don't have a rest for their healer. And I don't think they can finish this boss without Timber, honestly. I think they can survive for a little bit, but there's just so much trash Here left. You can see Solia healing. Look at Solia just healed up to 61% there as well. It's just not looking good at all for Donuts and Despair, unfortunately. Yeah, they, they are getting the collapsing star damage coming in now and you can see it in the party frames. It's just brutal out here for them as they tick to their deaths. Timber not available. They don't have that battle rest. They don't have bloodlust. They can't do anything for themselves here. Cryptic's propping that seed. And now it's all eyes on Sloth, who still have that Starseer Mindsooth in the background. We're gonna get another set of relics, and there's one right next to that Starseer. And you can see Mickey running close, trying to get in line to play this. And this time around, he's far back he didn't get and it. didn't get it. Why not? <laughs> Why did he get it? <laughs> this time he got it though. Two stack for Sloth. I, I don't know why the first one didn't hit. But uh, yeah, he will be able to heal that. I don't think that's a problem. Bloodlust being popped here. They waited until that very moment to make sure they can full send it. And here comes the additional trash that they were still missing. They're going to get another relic. Uh, it's a woe drifter. Yeah, I don't think that was intentional. Maybe for safety, the damage reduction? Or yeah. the Sanguine? <gasps> They're healing the boss! No! No, move it out! No! Move it out! What? Oh no! 
Oh. <laughs> I mean, good for them that Donuts and Despair had the trouble happening, but that was really... Oh, Javier, going down! They do have a battle rest, though. They can pick him up, and they did. Malik staying in this area here, trying to reduce movement, making sure there is no further sanguine shenanigans going on. But the team is looking pretty desperate. Everybody is dropping so, so low, and we're going to go into the relic phase. And if this one is like all the others, they need to play two rounds. Mickey positioning in a way where he hopes he can get this relic here. And it looks like they did hit everything this time. So very, very good for them. 11% to go with uh, not a very clean run, but a clean run that will give them uh, the, the win here with a 2-1. Wow. All right. That got a little bit scary at the end. That got a little bit, a little bit concerning, but uh, they got it done. Sloth manages to take the win, two-one, over Donuts and Despair. In the end, sadly, it was just Despair. But uh, either way, they put on a good showing. But Sloth moves on to face the winner of uh, Perplexed and Omega Law, which is the next series we'll see. So, how about it, Sloth? I mean, innovative, uh, clean for the most part. Uh, got a little bit crazy at the end there, but. Uh, playing much better, I would say, in their second match today than we saw in uh, match number one from them. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This is the innovative slot that we've been looking forward to ever since they showed us what they can do in their cup bracket rounds over a month ago. They come out when they need it the most against our one seed. Remember, Donuts and Despair, they were our number one seed from the third week of our cup bracket, and they are out wow. in the lower bracket against Sloth. I mean, fantastic performance from them. I doubted them. I think a lot of us doubted them. But the great thing about predictions is even if you say somebody's an 80% favorite to win, there's always that 20%. And Sloth <laughs> took a hold of that and milked it for all it's worth. And they're into the top four now. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And I mean, it's it's cool because uh, it's it's it was done in a way that wasn't just regular old solid dungeon running, right? They brought something new to the table, which at this stage in the expansion, like we've talked about before, it's unlikely to see, but let's check out a couple moments from that map. Yeah, just ma mainly things that went wrong here for Donuts and Despair. I mean, getting the second intermission, Ugh. this is the worst, right? You're instantly just losing 15, 20 seconds right off the bat. Slots execution throughout the dungeon, all of their pulls, and even their routing was just slightly better. I like the trash coming on the first boss, which Donuts and Despair didn't get to do. Even the best RNG in the world wasn't enough to help Donuts and Despair here. Look at the beginning of this pull for Smack here. <laughs> Almost 500k wow. DPS getting all of the cluster bomb procs in the world, and it's not enough to help. All the trash just instantly melts, and they can do all the single target damage they want, but it just wasn't meant to be. Sloth was able to pull off this final Celia pull, which, by the way, if you remember yesterday when they were in this dungeon, this is what this was the nail in the coffin for them. Their Celia healed by like 50%, so we were all watching, just honed in on this pull. But they were able to make it work this time around. No deaths until the very end on Javier. Played it perfectly. Again, into the lower semifinals. They must be on Cloud9 right now. I mean, this is, this is great for them. They're playing really well. Yeah, and I mean, even playing it uh, risky with the Adoran Star Seer still up during the Celia fight. We've been talking about how that, that seems... A little bit, uh, maybe too risky at times. We've seen it be a little bit shaky, but, uh, you know, I mean, when you see it like that, when it works, it works, right? So you can't really argue with the result in the end. <laughs> hey, re I'm results are results. I'm not going to reply to this bait. <laughs> they, I don't think they're going to beat Echo, but, I mean, it got them to top four, so it's at least good enough for that. It is definitely very good, and uh, I do want to say, I mean, Sloth have been participating in the MDI for a long time, uh, and I feel like finally it clicked for them. Finally, they have found an angle where they know what they're really good at, which is these innovative strategies that they have been showing for all of this season. And I really love that for them. Um, for anybody that's not familiar, they are a Spanish team. And the Spanish WoW community is pretty big, so I just know they have, like, a whole group rooting for them, which is really, really great. Yep. A shout out to Bloodlust.io over there in uh, Spain. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that pretty much will uh, do it for that match. And that means we only have one more to go here today to find out who's eliminated, who moves on. As we've just seen, Sloth moves on with the 2 in victory over Donuts and Despair. And that leaves just Perplexed versus Will Megalol, which is going to be a great series. Because, 
Like we said earlier, even though Perplex went down 0-2 to Echo, they look so good in that series that, you know, you expect them to play extremely well. You expect them to put up really good times. Well, Megalul, uh, you know, looking much better than we saw them uh, look previously. Uh, so they are going to be competitors. It should be a pretty close match. Anyone dare to, to make any predictions at this one? I mean, this is a tough one. Hmm. in my pick I said Perplex were going to win Global Finals, so I kind of have to be bold on this one and say Day 2-0. All right. Okay. Hmm. All right. Nagura, what, what do you think? I'm also going to say 2-0, but I wouldn't, for Perplex, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a 2-1 or Perplex. Okay. For a okay. second, I thought you were going to go, I'm also going to say 2-0, but the other team. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta think so about it for a sec because both of these teams are like such titans of our of our esport, right? Like Doctor mm -hmm. J has been part of pretty much one of the best three teams for the better part of the past three years. Perplex has been there, right, with Echo for the same amount of time. And the fact that one of them's not going to be here on our final day in our top four, it's kind of wild to me. I think I'm going to agree with you guys. I think Perplex is getting through, but I'm going to say two one, not two zero. All right. Okay. Well, my bracket in this spot had Wilmegalol moving on, so I gotta go with them. Wilmegalol 2-0. Okay. Just for no other reason than my bracket, I just need, I just want to hit 10 points. It's my goal. It's my goal for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, but it's not much, it's not much to ask, right? You have to right? stay humble and real. I appreciate it. That's, that's right. If you can't be true to yourself, what, what can you be, you know? We're gonna take a quick break while Wait, we mull just... over philosophy and the meaning of life and all that but when we come back our final match of the day it's gonna be perplexed versus omega lol see you in just a few on the mythic dungeon international global finals
Welcome back, everybody. Here we are one more time. Oh, ha come on. Why do you got to start with that? That's just mean. That's it. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm your host down at the bottom of the pick'em scores. Seven points. That's why you're the host. Yeah, yeah. we have our... Hey, our two you know. co-leaders and our two <laughs> co losers here. <laughs> co-losers. Rounding out our desk for, uh, for now. We were talking about this a little bit earlier, Travis. I'm pretty sure my bracket, just because the bottom half of it's giga bricked, so I'm kind of hoping that yours also gets bricked down at the I, bottom. So. If Perplex wins this one, I got some. I got a lot of points coming for me. So I got that's... really hey. bad equity down here at the yeah. bottom. If, if well, Mega yeah, Law wins, me I at least get a point, I think. That, I hey, can't that get points, like, I doubles think, your from this or one. Something. Yeah, yeah well, like, I think I have point. the wrong teams and the wrong scores. But yeah, here we go, Malik. Just Yay. moving on to um, day three. Very, so, very nice. So proud of them. I, I can actually uh, read Spanish, so I can translate this. Top four, we <laughs> moved on to Sunday in our first globals. I'm screaming. <laughs> I didn't really hear those six exclam or those eight exclamation points why? in your. Yeah. Uh... But why is the uh, those, I'm screaming those aren't part Spanish. not capitalized? The, uh, and the, top the, the is. Spanish, the Spanish uh, exclamation mark is actually upside down. Ah, I see. Okay, that's so that's those are why is Estoy Cutando capitalized and I'm screaming not capitalized though. That's a good question. Yeah, well, what's going on here, Google? They just assume that yeah. I'm screaming is is oh, not sorry. capitalized. I, I, that's I'm, the I'm part you need to capitalize the most. It's the screaming part. You're like, ah, oh, we did this, ah, oh. I'm screaming. I'm screaming. <laughs> yeah. Yes, wow. that's, uh, I didn't know Tettle spoke Spanish all. and encrypted as well. He can do the, the <laughs> Lehubum voice. He can do it all. Uh -huh. I already works for the jailer. That's yeah. why. <laughs> jailer? He's been working Wait. for him all along. <laughs> if he does all of that, I think he cheated in the pickums. That's true, oh. yeah. Tettles, what do you have to say for yourself? I don't really know cheat how he harder. cheated. I'm just, I'm, I'm happy <laughs> See, to pile on here. See, that's what a cheater would say. See, because his lower bracket's not working out very well, so cheat harder, I guess, is the answer. Because it didn't, it didn't work out great. I never cheated in what? my life. <laughs> He's trying to cheat realistically, <laughs> so he has to get some wrong. Oh, that, oh, so you say it's like a, it's, it's a mental game <laughs> to try to make people think it's a, it's an honest pick'em, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Ah, I see. That's later tattles. Wait, what was that? <laughs> Well, here's our bands. Uh, well, okay. Mega banned Theater Pain, and hmm. uh, we got Perplex banning Tazavesh Streets. Okay, so okay. Sanguine is where we'll start. Then maybe, then we'll definitely go to Gambit. But then maybe Miss. We'll see. Hmm. You guys hmm. think we're going to see Miss? Will this go to third map? I think no, because we'll Mega Low's going to 2-0. Okay, I I, I was saying oh, that. Okay. I think for the Sanguine depths, if I had to guess, this this feels to me like the kind of dungeon. For reasons that are kind of hard to put into words, but it it feels to me like this is kind of a perplexed type dungeon, right? It's a very technically intensive. It's the one that I think their longer history of playing together as a team will serve them best in. So I feel like perplexed are pretty likely to take the sanguine depth. So I think well, Megalol's best shot here is probably going to it's... involve the old reverse sweep. Is that true? I mean, well, Megalol looked so good in the last stand in this dun in this dungeon, that's right? True. But that's yeah. also a completely different format. That's yeah, the the high the high key pushing nature of that. Also, this dungeon has changed a lot since last stand. The nerfs uh, that the second and third boss in particular have received have dramatically altered the texture of this one, especially on the lower key level. Uh, and I think the fortified affix that we have going on here. So it's a very different skill set that it tests than like the twenty eight tyrannical or whatever. Well, we don't have to wait anymore. The map has begun. Let's see who takes the early lead. All right, we're seeing a rogue right us. Ooh, okay. Dr. J not playing the Windwalker here, opting instead for the Rogue. Couple nice spots in this dungeon to Shroud, although you can generally get Woe Skips uh, or an Invis Pot and a Pinch for those. So I have to imagine that this is a decision about single target damage and about priority uh, funnel damage as well. But we'll have to see where it ends up uh, seeing the most use. Actually, wow, look over on the side of Perplex. Look at a Shine's damage on that Windwalker. Doing some crazy numbers, doing some Warlock damage there until the Warlock mm -hmm. is ramped up a little bit. Un until Wolf was like, oh yeah, I'm here too. Okay. Like, so, let me press those buttons. <laughs> one other nice thing about the Rogue is that they are a natural Venthyr, and they are a Venthyr that can activate the Lanterns, you know, without complaining as much as a Warlock would if you make the Warlock mm. play Venthyr, which I'm sure is what Perplexed are doing. So that is a, a nice little hidden benefit for the same reason that, like, Having an extra Night Fae in DOS is nice to have them open the urns, right? Having a Venthyr in here and not making your Warlock play that Covenant and do that job 
uh, is really nice. Yeah, I'm just checking and definitely Wolf is the only one in Team Perplex that is meant here. So the, I agree with you that it's nicer to have someone else than the Warlock who is your main AoE damage dealer um, to, to click those lanterns because that can get really annoying. However, I'm not sure if I like the Rogue as much or the damage profile they bring. We are on a 22 fortified, so assumedly we're going to see biggish pulls throughout the dungeon and rogue is just decent on aoe and a lot better on single target yeah you can see on the damage meter right here on crixus but on the other hand crixus is dead right that's <laughs> ultimately True. like damage True. meters are one thing but rogue always does better than it looks like on the damage meters because of those factors we were talking about and because of the fact that you're providing often this utility or the single target on whichever mob actually needs to die so even if you're pulling a bunch of trash onto a boss Depending on what your rogue is choosing to do, they can be contributing much more to the timer than it looks like. And we actually have Womegalol now setting up a fairly large pull here, using that woe relic to get this done. So are perplexed. You can see the line of sights and a bunch of mobs coming in here. Actually, two teams, slightly different set of enemies that are going to be coming in here, but both of them using a very similar combination of line of sight to get the mobs exactly where they want them to go. Yeah, and that's just so, so nice if you can stack them up like that. It'll allow you to deal the most efficient with these threat bindings so you don't get too much trouble with them. And uh, you can just perfectly AOE everything down and get your lantern stack extended, which you can see on the party frames for both of the teams, just getting more and more stacks as the lanterns should run out soonish. Two overseers remain on the side of Perplexed, mm. and Womegalol is just... Wow, Killing look at that gateway boy. Nice for Omega portal. Pretty cool like little that. movement there. Perplexed, on the other hand, had brought in a relic pack, actually the one that Womegalol are currently, uh, or not that one, but a different one, uh, and got the world relic during that lantern pull, which they're going to carry forward as they move into this ring area. They're actually going very far around to the right-hand side here. They are not doing a lantern pull right now because they have so long on their lantern buff. Perplexed are like, you know what? We can get another pull done before we have to go back and revisit the lantern. Ooh. So we're going to go swing around to the right and then probably do a U-turn after this and head back over to the left. And they're actually killing another Woe here. So they are going to be keeping pretty full uptime on Woe and this lantern buff for the next several minutes is, I assume, the plan. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. We just saw one of the explosives go up as they started pulling these packs. Of course, with all of these big pulls, they need to be a little bit careful with that. But it might be that Risen just sat, you know, leave it through, I got this. And now they should probably be looking to get a new lantern. Here we go, Wolf Disco trying to open this one. But there is a stone being thrown in his way as he now gets the cast out. And the buff is slowly but surely running out. But they managed to kill another one and extend that buff as the Wardens in the back were already very, very low here. But well, Megalol is also in Ooh, the they are now, going right into the boss. Pull Tarvold, yes. That is aggressive as well. You can see the banished manif or remnant of fury as well that they're going to be using just as the lantern is ending, ideally, in order to get another refresh of that buff. But this is a very scary encounter to have all this going on during. They are a bit light on, uh, on curse as well as well, so they really need to make sure that they dodge those spinning tornadoes that cover the room here. A lot of ground effects here, but they have now dealt with most of these enemies, and they just have Tarvald already basically dead. They're going to have full uptime on this Lantern buff during this boss as well because of the way that they've handled this. Meanwhile, over on the left-hand side, Perplexed also looking to get a Lantern extension here, probably opening that thing fairly soon, and maybe also going into the boss in the near future. Well, Megalol already pretty much done with their upstairs here. They just need to get another 15% or so, and they'll be ready to head downstairs. Yeah. I'm actually so impressed by the speed of that 64% and Tarvold down. That is insane from Womegalol and Perplex are looking to match that. They're now finishing off a lot of the trash that is before them, but they still need to do Tarvold. And it is 22 fortified. It shouldn't take them too long to deal with Tarvold, but they need to do it nonetheless. So sooner or later, they should be looking for that. Womegalol now picking up that Whoa and finishing off what I think could be the rest of the trash that they still need. They might need to do a second pack after this. Mm. Not too common confident on how much they're getting from this one. And Perplex actually get to extend their 10 stack here, 
Whereas when Mega Lol lost their Lantern buff during that boss encounter and are going to have to work on rebuilding it, which is a slight efficiency loss in terms of just the amount of total uptime of a 10 stack, Perplexed are going to do better by that metric here. It's just a question of whether that sequencing was worth it for Omega Lol, and the answer definitely might be yes. I like the idea that they are coming into this dungeon with 73% trash count now. I think they still do need a little bit more from up here, but they may be ready to head downstairs. Okay, it does look like, oh, they're tagging some stuff and they're snapping it down with them. Yeah, that's going to be the plan for Womega yeah. I believe. Lovely. So Ricky has put down a demonic circle. Oh, there it is. Just to be ready to port away when necessary. But Lamike has taken the Sentinel and some of the scribes. Now they're actually going to pull all of that into Beryllia, which is not, you know, it, it, it's not super scary, but it is scary. So really, really ballsy pull coming out from Womegalol here as they still need to deal with all of these explosives that are spawning around the room. One of the scribes is in the back line there an explosion going off in the middle of the room but the team has has them and now the sentinel and the scribe need to be going down soonish but Beryllia is just melting in front of her eyes it seems as if she's a trash mob just not anything else and 25 percent i'm stunned yeah, this thing is dying very quickly for Womegalol, and we get a pretty direct comparison of the position of these two teams here, right? Because we do have uh, Womegalol at slightly more count as well. It is worth noting Perplexed are getting to open on this boss with this 10 stack for another 15 or 20 seconds here. That will be potent for them, and they have a bunch of trash coming in here, so they may actually be going up above that 82% uh, that Womegalol are at, and we'll see if that lets them skip anything cool. Womegalol using that woe buff that they got to run past the entire little uh, bridge section there. And are just going to need General Call and the Gauntlet here in order to finish off this dungeon. I mean, Womegalol have looked unbelievably fast in here. I'm going to go check and see what the best Sanguine Depth time we've seen this weekend is, because Echo it's were sitting 13 at 13.10. minutes, 10, yeah. 10 seconds. And they finish off the third boss around 9 minutes. So the, that tells you a lot, right? Well, Megalol is finished with Beryllia at around 8.10. They were a minute quicker, roughly. Yeah, this is crazy. The Womegalol pathing through this dungeon seems extremely, extremely compelling. I'm uh, impressed by what they've come up with here. They do still have to survive this nasty trash gauntlet, and they have to make sure that they are efficient with how they do this getting their 10 stack in the next area and ideally extending it just before it ends. They are also going to grip in a ravenous dread bat here to point, to get a, an extra couple points to count. Meanwhile, over on the left, Perplexed are finishing off Beryllia, but they are about a minute and a half behind Womegalol at this point. That's the kind of advantage that you're at this point, you're kind of looking for Womegalol to wipe if you're a Perplexed fan. Yeah, for sure. I'm not sure how they can catch up here. They do have enough trash to just skip past here but Womegal well, already so far on General Kyle that unless Perplexed is doing insane damage from somewhere I don't know where they should be getting that damage from uh, this is definitely Womegal favored and I think a big part of that is, is going with that additional class that can can do the lanterns and provide just that freedom for the warlock to be honest to do the damage yeah i definitely think that's a very sleeper so strong benefit to the uh, to the rogue for sure is the the fact that it frees up your frees up your warlock to just get to focus purely on damage one thing that perplexed did that's really good that uh, you can uh, use in your own routes if you're ever doing this dungeon when you pull general call right at the start you can hit your shield immediately because it will come up right when she casts her first gloom burst but only if you press it like right on pull at the start of the gauntlet so you may as well press it then it's a free press of that shield uh, if you are ever you know tanking or whoever's holding the shield in this dungeon <laughs> i feel like that's a recipe for this ass just gotta press it right when you pull <laughs> then it's fine as long as it's right when you pull if you forget about it for a couple seconds it's too late do not press it at that point but otherwise you can get a little bit of extra benefit especially on pull where a lot of tanks feel very squishy yeah, I mean, it is true, but it's like... All right. Well, Megalol right. going into boss now, and they're at 97% count. They've got these two Houndmasters, and once they finish these things off, that's going to be 100% count for them. Yeah, they have the there lust we go, actually 100%. not even ready yet. 
They're so fast, See? they don't have their second Bloodlust on pull here on General Call. That is so crazy for Sanguine Depths. This is I, this is going to be a faster run than Echo for sure. This is crazy from Omega Lol. Yeah, I, I wonder if it went that fast in their practice, and I'm really curious to see what was going on there from like the highlights that we're going to get, because I feel like I missed how they made up all of that time. I'm sure Telos will be able to tell us more about that, but Womegalol is coming and in swinging into the series. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it has to come down to the way they manage those trash pulls. There, You have to just like looking at those trash pulls, they have to have found a way to do it in one or two less trash pulls and have such good uptime on that lantern as well during all the important moments of the dungeon. But it is absolutely insane what they've been able to do in this dungeon. And that is going to be a sub 12 minute plus 22 sanguine depths coming in here for Omega. Absolutely incredible. And wow, this is such a good run for them. That is amazing. It's gotta be so shocking for Perplexed to get told right now <laughs> that you've just lost, lost this game yeah. here. Wow. Can't Question believe mark? It. I can't believe lost. it, because Perplexed was on track to either meet or even maybe beat Echo's time too, but like uh well Megalol just was moving Omega fast through that dungeon. That was absolutely nuts. Um, and I mean, hey, I, they they seem to be like they're, they're like Super Saiyans. They seem to be powering up the longer this goes, doesn't it? I uh, we're going to talk about why they were able to do this in a little bit, because it, a lot of it came down to what Dratnus was saying. It was just the sequencing between uh, the boss one and the boss two split. It was That that was the best time in the tournament. That is probably going to be yeah. the best Sanguine Depths that we see all weekend. And we were talking about the, the Dr. J, Wobegalol last stand Sanguine Depths, because that was a dungeon that we saw them do some absolutely bonkers stuff in. Man, they, they, they have the best Sanguine Depths in the tournament. This is going to be bad for teams if they if they're able to beat Perplexed here, if they have to go back into SD, because that's a dungeon that you're just going to always have to ban against them. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I think at this point, if when when a team's putting together a sub-12 minute uh, you know, run, it's, it's time to think about maybe taking what? them on on a different map. I'm not really sure what the rogue does. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I think it's, uh, <laughs> well, it's a, a, a rather there, so. strange... You can, you can always have Warlock go visit my... here. Yeah, but that's like my, my number one reason. It's a Venthyr that's not a Warlock, so yes. that's why Anyways. why Ricky was allowed to do all the damage. So I started with the highlight package and I was like, oh yeah, Perplex is looking pretty good. This pull, it seemed pretty standard uh, relative to what they were doing. And then I'm looking over at Womegal as they pull this Javelin pack. And I didn't fully understand why they were pulling this, but they do something super sick after this pull, and they grab one singular Quill Feather. So, like, their 10 stack is about to expire. They grab one singular Quill Feather, immediately extend their Lantern buff, and they go straight into Tarvald with a massive trash pull, and then they snap a bunch of trash into Beryllia. And that was that allowed them to have a three-minute split in between boss one and boss two, because they're not really waiting around on this Lantern. They're just getting, like, um, they just got, like, a refresh. Oh, actually, it's not even this Lantern. The Lantern was before this. They weren't really waiting around. They just snap refreshed, and that's why you see their 10 stack is so long here. And then they gra grab Tarvald with all of this trash. This is an insane pull. And, and this is one of the biggest reasons that they were able to make up a lot of time is because of this. And then on top of it, they snap the remaining trash into this area that they needed, uh, all the while maintaining. They had to like regain the stacks because they weren't going to extend a 10 stack. So they were able to regain um, their Lantern stacks coming into this area. This is just, just this is a masterclass in this dungeon. Absolutely crazy stuff that uh, this team was able to put on. I'm not going to lie. I thought that their general call lantern management could have been a little bit better. Or maybe they were a bit faster than they anticipated because their lust timing wasn't like perfect with their lantern buff. And I think that there was some room there um, to either to have them line up a bit better one way or the other. I think it's very difficult to be critical of Omega Lil's Sanguine Depth. So this was just a sick, sick run. Look yeah. at the damage spike. It's like two, it's like 700k. That's insane. Yeah, and I mean, you can see good numbers for Perplexed as well. Like, they're not, there are no slouches in this dungeon either, but it's just uh, Megalol see, doing it that much faster. At, at, um,. At five Around, minutes there, you see that massive yeah, spike. That's, that's the that's the pull in the Tarvald, yeah. And so yeah. you 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 wait for perplexed, uh, ends up pulling Tarvald around that like six thirty mark, and, and it's like so far behind. That that is something that well, well Megalol was able to get ahead 
really, really early. And, I mean, they were just able to carry the, that momentum through the remainder of this key. Yeah. I'm so I think... impressed. I did not think Aye. Megalo would come in here <laughs> and do a time that's quicker than Echo's Sanguine Deaths, which was already very quick, and then do it in that way. I'm impressed, really. That was a banger. Yeah. It was. That was a great, a great was start to the series. Very exciting. And I kind of expect more now, right? Like, it, they gave me this. I'm going to hold them to it. I want exactly that level of play in all of the dungeons from Omega Lol now. This was well, so well, cool. I don't know if I'd expect that. Sometimes they're, they're liable to uh, randomly throw a key or two. So the other bad news for Omega Lol, I've looked through the rest of the tournament bracket. There are no more sanguine depths that they can end up in in their matches. There's none in the lower, the rest of the lower bracket <laughs> or in the grand finals. So that's going to be, this This was their ace up their sleeve that they threw once and it has earned them a map win for sure. Very impressively, but they are going to need to replicate that feat in some other dungeons if they want to uh, to keep it going. I mean, if they can use it to get a top four, that's, yeah. that's still a great result a at great, the end of the day. I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely incredible what they've done in this dungeon. Just like it would be really good for them if this was in all the future series as well, which unfortunately <laughs> it is not. They're going to have to get by with uh, Tazavesh Gambit for the next map here. And uh, they have not played that yet this weekend from what I've seen. Wait, uh, they played did Streets. They? they did not play Gambit yet. No. Oh, interesting. Okay, so they were mm -hmm. the they were the team that pioneered the mage and gambit thing during the last stand tournament because Jay wanted to see if they could uh, one phase the boss with that. So I, oh gosh, this is bad for Perplex, isn't this? Uh, the fact that the last time we saw Womegalol, they looked really strong in their gambit runs. Yeah, I mean, oh, I was kind of counting on Perplex to do it this time around after how the last globals went, but. It feels like similar to what Baldi is showcasing that kind of these newer teams coming in with like really crazy innovative strategies and they're not on their level, right? Without sounding too mean, it does feel a little bit like that. I'm just surprised in a, in a pleasant way that like we can be this deep into the expansion having like all of these players have like hundreds and hundreds of runs on these dungeons and we're still seeing like new things, you know? So it's like you're saying where sometimes if you're one of those pros that have been around for a while and you see this in every esport, right? And like a lot of traditional sports as well, like you can get a little bit complacent, not to mention the people that are coming up have more to prove. They have to prove that they, you know, deserve to be there. So you're going to definitely get more innovation in a lot of those cases too. So it's cool to see. Yeah. And we're I'm gonna go to... into that gambit once more. Are, yeah. What what times are you guys expecting? We just saw a gambit with twelve thirty seven from Slav. Oh, here we go. I know. Fatness. I know. Eleven fifty is fast. Uh, I I think that it like an eleven fifty gambit is a time that you may want to. Yeah, that's be looking like out for. around right. Echo's time. Twelve oh four is gonna be the winning time in this uh, in this one. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. Do the Noted. Second, Noted. It. Noted. Yeah. Well, perplexed Writing fighting for their survival. Let's see wow, if, we've got uh, a beautiful sunset alive. here in the uh, in oh, the Tazavesh Gambit skybox. as well. Love Elimination that for Elimination game skybox is the best skybox. Okay, so we do a little sanguine healing coming down on the side here of Perplex over on the left. You can see the attempt by the Ring of Peace to mitigate some of that, but still quite a bit. And they're just going to drag these Murlocs with them. They're going to say, you know what? These mobs are not that important. They should not slow down our plans. We are going to go into the next bull. That does mean they are again going to have to contend with sanguine when some of those mobs die, although it looks like all the mobs that dropped Sanguine have been taken care of already, so they are already in to their next big bull. Yeah, exactly. Bloodlust still running through Womegalol, though, and I am keeping my eyes on them as they go through this dungeon, because I've seen what they do in the Sanguine Depths. I want to see what they do in the Gambit, which is a very quick dungeon, and they are already finished with their trash here, skipping to Hillbrand, and I'm curious if they're going to hmm. pull the Stormforge Guardians, because so I think they kind of have to, to make their count. Yeah, here yeah. we go. They're getting, it looks like, one Stormforged Guardian right now. Tobo is the last person to join the group here as well. He may well, have he ended up pulling murlocs. some Murlocs. Absolutely, he has done just that. And uh, that means that they are going to have an extra bit account here. 
And just the one Guardian is really not that bad to take care of because it's really when you have multiple of them that you can start feeling zoned out of the boss entirely. But if it's just one, it's kind of just a nice target to dump some damage into, especially during the intermission of this boss fight. And Womegalol, so fast here, they're already on this boss while Perplexed still mopping up Murlocs and still executing their woe skip. Womegalol just zooming in here as well. Yeah, I'm just I'm just so impressed. They're already on Hillbrand, and the damage on Hillbrand is looking really good as well. They didn't use Bloodlust as they Bloodlusted the first ball. Dr. J procking that cauterize there. That was not ideal, but slowly and surely these ads are dying here. Make sure none of these die in the boss as Sanguine could become a menace. They are playing that intermission here. There is a Vault Purifier blocking one of the consoles on the other side of the room, but they should be able to deal with that. Yeah, it goes down and over is the first intermission, 66%. We did see teams around that mark have a little bit of trouble with that Hillbrand one phase. So I'm curious if Womegalol will have the damage to just bring it out here. I think they will. Mage. I think, yeah, the, the, when, when we talk about this boss, it's usually the mage that is best at mm -hmm. making that one phase or like one intermission only happen. Uh, so Womega will hopefully have that as part of their plan here at 56% count. They are good here. They don't need to get any more Murlocs or anything like that. Perplexed sitting at 53% also good. Yeah, they're also all set here. So ready to head towards the rest of the dungeon. They will need all the rest of the trash, but that is okay. They are at 61% during their first uh, sanitizing cycle. So a little bit better than Womegalol over on the right-hand side. We are now going to see that race between the health and the energy bars of Hillbrand here. <laughs> Currently, I think Womegalol I are in the lead here. Yeah, it looks, yeah, it looks good for them to get this killed. They have it over to the side here. As long as they can get it to like 5 or 4%, by that time that bar yeah. fills up, they can okay, usually okay, kill it before good. it gets to the middle. Here we go. That should be fine. That should be fine. Three percent. They will get it. 2%. Come on. They will get it. Oof. Yeah, 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 yeah. I believed. I believed. Hands up. And uh, I think Perplex can also do it, given that they were just a little bit lower than Womegalol coming into this phase here. I don't think they should have any problems. It was pretty tight for Womegalol though. Yeah, definitely a little bit scary for them, but they have gotten through, and now they are going to grab. Let's see how they decide to handle the time cap and hooktail trash section. Some groups like to pull this down into the other trash pools. Looks like Womegalol are just going to deal with these mobs by themselves. Igloo ran ahead to start the RP to get the remaining three packs uh, all spawned and ready for them. And they'll probably take those onto boss, if I had to guess, which would be uh, a scary sanguine management moment with a very high upside if they can do it correctly. Oh, Unfortunately for Perplexed, Perplex. on the left-hand oh. side, the intermission skip has not worked out for them. That is very that bad. Is devastating. That is actually what will throw them back so hard, and we have seen this from other teams before. Just the 20 extra seconds that they had to stay in here and play this intermission are so, so painful to these teams. And Bomekalo already finished with these deck ends. We'll move on to the big pull. And the one thing to look out for in what's to come is Sanguine. You really want to keep your eyes open to see if there is any scary Sanguine healing happening, because this pull is big. It's scary, there's a lot going on, and they're going to add a boss on top of it without Bloodlust, so really, really potentially scary. Yeah, this is extremely dangerous. We're going to look as those mobs start dying. One thing Womegalol doesn't have is a Ring of Peace, so they need to be very careful with that. You can see they're not even trying to hit anything with that boss breath. They're saying, you know what, we deal with these mobs first. We don't want to knock them back with the boss breath, which won't kill them. We just want to kill them safely, Shining force. and then the, the Let's groups go. that spawn, we'll deal with those later. That's not a urgent priority. Those aren't going to kill us if we have a few of them hitting people for a little while. Yeah, so like you said, they don't have a Ring of Peace, so they need to use everything else that they have. And we did see that Shining Force from the Priest being committed there to make sure everything gets knocked away, and they're now able to... Uh, deal with the brutes. Ricky in a little bit of a weird position right behind Time Captain Hooktail. Uh, a place I don't like to be in as you can get easily hooked from that hook. So uh, moving away from there seems like a good idea and they have finished off all of the brutes now. Clean boss area. Perplexed doing the same thing on the left side just a little bit later due to the hill brand. 
and first area scenario that we saw from them. Divine Field dropping really low, Turtle being committed oh. by Swag to make sure everyone survives here. It does seem like they're struggling a little bit, just looking at the party frame. Yeah, Sanguine popping onto that healing meter a little bit, but not too bad yet for Perplexed. A lot of mobs are going to be dying soon, though. That Vi Interceptor also does need to die. Has died for them as Wolf Disco actually getting hunted down by the Ur Dismantler as well. Perg! Ooh, this is getting dangerous for Perplexed. They have so many mobs alive. They've sent them all over the room. The boss frontal has been hitting these mobs and kind of just spreading them, scattering them everywhere. And Divine is going to hit pretty much everything with the next boss frontal as well. But it doesn't actually kill the mobs that aren't part of the boss encounter itself. It just knocks them really far away. And so they do need to come back and actually finish those off at some point while also making sure they hit the boss mobs with the breath. Wolf Disco actually ends up getting dispel gripped there by Ryson to make sure that he uh, survives that tank frontal as well. They are going to be able to get this boss dead, but it is going to be something like a minute slower than Womegalol, maybe even a little bit longer than that, as Womegalol are also on more count, so they don't even need all the same stuff that Perplex do from this room. We'll see how they decide to attack this area. If they can do this area cleanly, they will have a 2-0 upset over Perplex on their hand, but... This is one of the more volatile parts of the dungeon. A lot that can go wrong here. Tobo swaps to the Sylvanas bow there and sends the Wailing Arrow in to silence those mobs on pull, get them gripped together, <laughs> and then puts back on Beautiful. a spear. Very nice little piece of technology to get those mobs all in together. And uh, you can see how well that's going to work out for them as they now are free to AoE them and not have all those dangerous casts going off. Yeah, Fury coming in, standing in these mobs. Unfortunately, that's going to give them a little bit of Sanguine healing on to this pack as shiny force comes in spreads them out again they now need to deal with interrupts there is a pulsar that they finish off and the collapsing star that they need to step in but they're doing such a fantastic job of that Celia is being pulled to the side and here's the technique that i have a very complicated relationship with there is a star seer in the background mind tooth and they need to play around it unless they're gonna pull it at so some point. They, they still are need a little bit of trash. Count. Yeah, there are three mobs that they could pull instead as well. I'm not sure what they will decide to fight. It'll be during the Solia push at sub 40%, right? That's a time where you can't do any efficient damage to Solia. May as well pull some trash during that time. Yeah, for sure. So I I'm curious if they're deciding to go with the Sarseer. I don't think they will. I really hope they will, but I don't think they will. Hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, Perplex on the other side is uh, making their way for Solia as well. They are dealing with the trash leg sweep coming in as they try and get this Ur down and finishing off these mobs. But they're behind Omegalol for sure. And I wonder if they had finished off Hillbrand in that one phase, would it be the same? Because it feels like... It could probably be a hat if that uh, hadn't happened. No, the, I think that they are behind by by a little bit more than a minute here. And that one phase okay, was probably 20 seconds, 30 seconds. I don't think it's that whole minute, though. This is looking so unbelievably good here uh, for Womegalol. I mean, uh, the times that we're, the time that we're going to see here, they might be on track for something like an 11-minute gambit. That might be a best-in-tournament gambit, depending on how the rest of this Solia encounter goes for them. They have almost all their trash taken care of here. Three mobs that are under the boss right now. Need to be carefully <gasps> sanguine managed as down. Bryson is going to take that battle res for Perplexed. Not the end of the world. Just a five-second penalty for them, so they are still okay, but they really are relying on a Womegalol wipe at this point. Even though the boss HP looks the same, Perplexed are still in P1, whereas Womegalol are in P2, so they are ahead by a huge amount here, by a little bit more than a minute. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can see Igloo wiggling around that star seer, and I think once and for all we could just see oh, that this coming holds in? the star seer. He did eat that uh, projectile through it, so I think that was mm. that was uh, taken in in purpose. They well, decided they to just count. play it. So it's yeah, hard to imagine the star seer was part of the plan. It. Yeah, it's probably I just like a. You know, just whatever. a safety thing. They know they're ahead at this point, probably. So they decided, okay, just pull it. We're not going to go for the second oh. relic. And uh, is Sanguine yeah. going to heal Solia? No. Okay, they've done a great job with no, Megalol again. They did it. And there's a collapsing star that will explode soon, but not they soon don't enough. Care. Well, Megalol stop the wow. timer here at 11.07. Unbelievably fast time in this dungeon, and they are going to just um, shockingly 2-0 perplexed off of, I believe, two of the best two maps we've seen this weekend. 
out of Omega Lull. That is crazy. Absolutely nuts. I mean, Echo's top time was 11.45 coming into this one. Omega Lull uh, destroyed that time. Uh, you know, that is to say Perplexed was very close as well. I mean, Perplexed played a great couple of maps, but well, Megalog just looked unstoppable this series, and they're moving on. So, you know, the last chance qualifier, like, uh, they, they definitely, the, the, the extra practice has come in very handy, hasn't it? Two seasons in a row, our uh, last stand winner has done kind of crazy things out of nowhere, whether it be upsetting <laughs> uh, teams or making, like, really late runs. The well, Megalog Revenge Tour has begun, and... <laughs> Dranos, uh, I think you were a minute off what yeah. the uh, time in this gambit was going to be. <laughs> well, like I always said, 11 yeah. minutes, 6 seconds, and 460 <laughs> milliseconds was going to be the time That's in this exactly one. That's exactly what he Check said. I can confirm that. Yep. I can confirm that. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty close. It was yeah. not, not bad. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's actually a couple of... There's a lot of really cool stuff that happens in this poll. So first off, will Megalol's ability to get this pack grouped up, they utilize misdirection and... This poll, they were able to get something in the range of 20% enemy forces over where Perplexed were just in this first pull alone. They do, of course, lust it, um, and it is a pretty dangerous pull. And then this is where they gained a lot more time um, over where Perplexed was. They were able to one-phase Hillbrand. It's utilizing that Fire Mage's single target damage and just the triple, like all three of those combusts going straight into the boss, prioritizing that damage is super important. Where Perplexed lost, a pretty steep amount of time um, just not getting that. I I think that this only ended up costing them around 30 seconds, so I think that they were still going to lose even though they had to do this. But it, it was really not great for Perplex. Perplex was going to put up a time that was competitive with maybe even beating Echo. Um, but this is another thing that I wanted to show off. Uh, you actually see Tobo. He's running that Sylvanas. You, so you see the, like, the arrow debuff that's on these... Uh, mobs. He silences this whole entire pack of trash and then swaps back into the pole arm. Um, just being able to get that full AOE silence on that pack and get them grouped up on top of Solia, that's some sick tech. Uh, I'm a big fan. Yeah, yeah. Dratnos catch that as, caught that as well while it was happening. Really, really cool to see, you know, those niche Shadowlands techniques coming out in those dungeons, but I'm just still like, well, Megalol came in from nowhere doing that. They they just did that. They did those two best dungeon runs we have seen up until now, day two of the global finals. What does that mean for tomorrow? I mean, it means that uh, we're going to have an amazing top four is what it means with a, a lot of great storylines in terms of veterans who have been around for a long time. Uh, players who have had to battle back through the last chance qualifier as a last stand qualifier rather as well Megalol has. Uh, they get that 2-0, they move into the top four, and uh, tomorrow it's kind of, you know, who can take on Echo? And, and honestly, it's looking like we might have a couple teams that can put up comparable times. Hmm. Wow. First Look at the difference yeah, between doing two oh, medium man. pulls at the start versus one unbelievably massive pull almost a million dps there reached by wow. where megalol at their peak that that is quite a lot of dps uh... legend has it that the fire mage did 40k dps uh, to that pull yeah hmm. <laughs> they they did enough damage to actually change the sidebar from uh tens of thousands to or to uh, points of yeah. millions yeah yeah that is huh. that so they much damage that. they changed the graphic that is impressive oh, wow <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and you got to feel a little bit bad for Perplexed as well because they yeah. put on a, a really great show as well. I mean, that is a, the performances on the maps that they were putting together would have beaten a lot of other teams that we saw this weekend. So, you know, you just happen to run into, well, Megalol at their absolute A++++ best, well, and uh, this is what happens. Uh, well, Megalol got 2 owed by uh, Monka earlier in the weekend. Yeah. And... Yeah, just does, like that mean that, well, that. does that mean that Monka is that cracked? Like, what just happened here? I mean, it's, I mean, who knows? It's, it's just, it seems like it's map by map, right? Because, well, Megalol came in here with the best time in the tournament in those two maps that they just played. So these teams really, it just depends on, like, how are they playing on a given day? And are they landing on one of those maps where they've had these ideas that are just so good and have saved this extra time? Because really, it seems like all three of well, Megalol, uh, Echo, and Monka are capable of putting up these absurd times. We also have Sloth throwing a wrench into the bracket as well, making it through to tomorrow. <laughs> that uh, are, yes. are 
also looking strong, and it looks really, really good. <laughs> Let's go! Well, <laughs> I mean, nice. after that last one, nobody is surprised. There are zero almost perfect brackets remaining, uh, which means nobody has a bracket that has the, uh, the correct teams in the correct places anymore. Um, almost perfect is correct teams, not necessarily correct match scores. We don't even have correct teams anymore. Everyone's bracket is blown up now. I, I, I mean, love yeah, that. They're, per they're perplexed and... Like, will Megalol underdog story and then Sloth beating Donuts in Despair? I think those are the two things that were, uh... Yeah. Those were pretty big contributors. <laughs> I'm Trina, coming Trina's up. Eyes, brackets are kind of stuck here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if any I'm of us are getting any more points you, this weekend. I'm coming up. I got a point. I... I, uh... I can get some from Monka. I have Monka and Echo in the upper finals. Yeah, if Echo wins some series, that'll I be good for me. I can get any points yeah. anymore. Well, because you didn't pick Echo like, to win it, did you, Mix? I did not. Ah, so but I, I may actually be able to pass to you up it. tomorrow. Oh. You might. You might. You yeah. actually might. I don't think I can get any points anymore. Hmm. I think, oh, no. I think my bracket is done for. <laughs> oh, no. Who will be in the Pippi Laugh Zone soon? I mean, I'm not far it's... off. I've, I've basically only got Echo <laughs> still alive in this thing. Sloth, I'm going to need to come through as well with a big win tomorrow. And I, oh, against that one, Megalol is going to be so tough. I mean, I have Echo in the bracket, just not winning. So I might uh -huh. get points if Echo mm. loses somewhere. Mm. <laughs> All guess. right. <laughs> well, you know, important storylines, but the main storyline here is that our semifinals uh, are decided for the upper bracket is Echo versus Monka, which should be epic. And then in the lower bracket, we have Sloth versus Omega Lol, and then the winner of that plays whoever moves down to the lower bracket from the Echo Monka match. A lot of people would say that's uh, going to be Monka, but who knows? I mean, today was a day of upsets. Aside from Echo, everything was kind of uh, kind of surprising. Except from Echo and Monka, rather. Everything was pretty pretty shocking. Yeah. There you go. A huge I amount mean... of maps just not going the way that, that I thought they would going into them. Some teams looking so so strong as we get a quick sneak preview of our map pool tomorrow we've got a little bit of the the dungeons from day one and a little bit of the dungeons from day two all making a uh a showing here i'm actually curious about that sanguine depth in match 11. i wonder if either echo or monka will be able to match that uh and the gambit as well if either of these yeah. teams if we if those aren't banned in that series will be able to put up a time competitive with the omega oh. time Mm -hmm. Oh man, match 13 is a uh, match 13's lower finals. If Omega are, are able to beat Sloth and make it to the lower finals, I want like I think you probably just have to ban <laughs> that Gambit versus them every well, single yeah, uh, dude. Maybe you have to yeah. either oh ban it or yeah. practice it yourself and have an 11 minute time or better. Which uh, oh. I don't know which of those things is easier to do. <laughs> it's Good very luck. tricky. <laughs> we're we're you, just I, getting. I think word. you have to eat the ban. Maybe. We're just All getting right, anyways. word from them, uh, from, from Womegalol, that apparently was said before this weekend started. Uh, I quote, I have never been more comfortable going into a tournament weekend. Other teams facing us should be concerned. Womegalol. Sounds accurate. They got... All right. Oh. From I'm before in. the I'm weekend in. started, too. Yeah. I can't <laughs> wait for the finals. I mean, look they at the just finals. They proved that, I think. I it was just it was just so interesting because whenever I was watching them versus Monka, yeah, sure they got two would but I, I was sitting there watching them. I was like, this is not the same one Megalol we've seen across this whole entire weekend. They yeah. they they play really really consistent and super well this whole entire uh, weekend. And if they can continue to do what we've been seeing from them, ah man, like <laughs> I, I don't even know what's what the finals is going to be anymore. This is a this is a tough one. You know, another finals note, too, is that we actually get that necrotic wake for once in the finals. It's the first map, so no one can ban it. Yeah. So we will get to oh, see it to at some it. point. I think that's the only time we're going to see it this weekend, because nobody wants to play on that 25 necrotic wake. Thank goodness. If we're going to make them Nobody anyway, wants though. to leak strats on that 25 <laughs> True. necrotic it's wake. It's the unbannable it grand finals dungeon. one. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Could be. Need to and keep like... it a secret. Yeah, fortified, inspiring Grievous. Uh, pretty, pretty nasty uh, FX combination for that. And key level as well, so uh, it'll be it'll be uh, pretty pretty crazy. I think. Curious to see what teams get there. Do you think? Be very you upset. laughing? I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Why Twenty-five inspiring, anymore. fortified necrotic wake is, is a dungeon. There's a reason that we've seen it well, perma ban. I, I think yeah. the best yeah. reason. I think there's just good tournament reasons. Like if you know it's unbannable in the grand finals, you should exactly. always be banning that. Or you you should have 
at least be, be banning it or like guess the other team's going to ban it, right? Because you don't mm. want to leak that. If you're planning to win the tournament, right? You know you're going to have to play that against the best team at the end, right? And that's uh, yeah, that's something you're going to want to keep hidden and you're hoping hoping that they end up showing you it. But yeah, I think that there's good, like even disregarding the fact that it's, yeah, it's a tricky combination of affixes and key level like that because of that position in the, the start of the grand finals is a really good ban everywhere else. The best right. teams normally don't uh, go into a weekend planning on perma banning one specific dungeon anyways. They practice all the dungeons and they try to uh, offensively ban maps against teams where they know that their time is just not the best. And and that happens in global finals more often than not where the teams, I mean, we saw it with Astro, we always see it with Echo, but we see it with just like the best teams. They don't go into the weekend, they're like, oh yeah, we're gonna perma ban this. They're like, all right, we've practiced everything. And if some team rolls up with a minute and a half faster time at a dungeon, we'll just ban <laughs> that, that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well. I think that's going to bring us to the end of the day. And it's been a long day, but a good day at the Mythic Dungeon International. Before we go, I want to get parting thoughts from everyone we've got here at the desk right now. We're going to start with you, Mix. Uh, what did you learn today? What did you enjoy? What what stood out? I learned I'm very bad at Echo Pickums. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, well, Mega Lil came in really strong, and I'm very impressed by what we've seen so far. Personally, I'm super happy that Sloth made it. It's a team that I've liked for a long time, so just on a very personal level, I'm super happy that they made it, and I am so excited for, for tomorrow and the four teams that came through. Should be great. Dratnos, uh, what, what words do you have for us? Or, or well, Tettles. You know, no, Tettles really wants to talk. I think, talk I, I think the, this one goes to me. In fact, I'm preparing a five-minute monologue now to delay the uh, Tettles' thoughts and really just leave him on ice for a while up there. <laughs> oh, he's, he's done. All right, bye. Yeah, I think the big thing for me was don't expect teams to perform the exact same on Saturday as they did on Friday. A lot of teams looked so much better than they did on Friday coming into today. So especially going into Sunday, I think, again, we got to make sure that we reset a little bit and we think, okay, you know, just because the uh, series yesterday, they looked at a certain strength, you got, you know, the map pool in the next series, the opponent, the amount of practice they might have had for this one, and just how they're playing on any given day seem to be variables that uh, I've underestimated how much variation there is in those things. Very true. Tettles, go ahead. The floor is Tettles. yours. I think that I learned that Echo morning. is not as much of a favorite as I initially suspected coming into the weekend. Ooh. I, hmm. I think that both will Mega Lola and Monka, like more often than not, I feel like the, um, whenever we see the global finals, it'll still be like, Echo has the best time in it, at least like 75, 80% of the dungeons. And right now they do not have, that. and it, that's something hmm. that's like, oh, okay, wait, maybe, maybe there's going to be more to this weekend than we initially thought coming into it. You know, that team is going to be practicing like crazy though tonight. They are not going to rest and relax before the final day of the global finals. I've got a feeling they're going to try to come into uh, tomorrow with, with absolutely everything they've got. But that's going to do it for us here at the Mythic Dungeon International. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks to the crew behind the scenes for putting everything together. Uh, until tomorrow, go uh, play some dungeons, uh, pet your pets, uh, have some healthy food, stay safe, be excellent to each other, and we will see you tomorrow for the thrilling conclusion of the MDI Global Finals for Shadowlands Season 3. We'll see you then.